Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Takedown by Evelyn Sola. Narrated by Jair Bush and Troy Duran. 1. Melly. The down pillow contours my head, shielding me from the cool air coming from above. The temperature in the room is not only due to the ceiling fan, but to the extremely efficient central air. I sigh happily and cover myself with the white down comforter, basking between sleep and reality. I don't remember ever being in a bed so comfortable. I smile and reach for another pillow to hug, but my hand hits something else. Skin. I think I'm touching a stomach, a very hard and toned stomach, which I think belongs to a man. I touch it again, and whoever the stomach belongs to moans softly. I quickly pull my hand away and wait for things to come into focus. I might not know where I am, but I know where I'm not. I don't have a ceiling fan in my room, and the air conditioning in my bedroom at home works well, but not as efficiently as this one. Besides, I live in Boston, and if there's one thing I don't need in Boston in January, it's air conditioning. I'm not in my bedroom at my brother's two-family house in the first-floor apartment where we live, the one I share with him and his family. I'm in Sin City celebrating my friend's wedding. One of my best friends got married yesterday. It was a big group, full of her family and friends. It wasn't the typical Vegas wedding with Elvis officiating the vows. It was a beautiful, formal affair held in the ballroom of the Bellagio Hotel. I cried when I watched her father walk her down the aisle. The epitome of happiness with her wide smile and inner glow. I'd wiped my wet cheeks with a tissue I had in my purse, and when I had looked up, it was to find familiar, piercing blue eyes watching me from across the aisle. I normally look away from his stares, but that time I held it, and even in the big room, the electricity between us sizzled. My phone buzzes from across the room. Despite not having a headache, I know I must have had some drinks if the dryness in my mouth is any indication. It's so bad it feels like something died in there days ago. My bedmate moans again, turns over in the bed, and wraps an arm around me, forcing a loud gasp out of me by his sudden movement. He takes it a step further and puts a heavy leg across my thighs, keeping me securely in place. He nuzzles the back of my neck and sighs in contentment. I stop breathing and my body goes completely still. I close my eyes and squeeze, hoping that when I open them again, I'll be at home in my bed and this will have been nothing but a dream. But that doesn't happen and a dooming feeling hits. My stomach drops and I feel my heart start to accelerate. I don't want to do this, but I take a deep breath and I turn my head, refusing to look at him, hoping and praying that it's not who I think it is. But his scent is a dead giveaway. No one else smells like that. And in this instant, I know I did something I can't take back. Images of last night start to surface, but I push them back down, refusing to acknowledge the reality of the situation. It's been a long time since I've been intimate with a man, and I squeeze between my legs. When I feel no soreness, I expel a breath of relief. I know whatever happened in this room does not extend beyond sleeping. Unless whoever that is has a small package, I shouldn't have doubted it. He never would have done something like that. Besides, he's wanted me for such a long time that I know he'd want me to remember. Or maybe it's not him. The altitude is not the same in Vegas as it is in Boston, and I'm sure more than one man uses this cologne. Maybe I went out and decided to let loose. Leaving behind the January northeastern weather will do that to any girl. I remember telling my sister-in-law about my plans to find a man for the night. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I had winked at her and nudged her shoulder with mine. She laughed and told me to have fun. My bedmate lets out a snore and I push his leg off. Making as little noise as possible, 
I take a deep breath and turn to face him. The cover is now askew, leaving exposed a long, muscular leg filled with dark hair. I close my eyes and say a short prayer. Yeah, now you pray, Melly, you heathen. God ain't about to listen to you now. He's in black boxer briefs, and his morning wood is saluting the ceiling. I swallow involuntarily and do everything in my power to stop myself from wrapping my hand around the steel pipe of a dick that's just inches away, but I chase the thought out of my dirty mind. Yeah, no way was that thing inside me. It would have ripped me in half. It's not this particular dick that's got my mouth watering. It's the lack of dick in my life that's making me yearn for this one. His ribbed white T-shirt has ridden up, and a perfect six-pack is on full display, just inches away from my greedy hand. I let out a whimper, knowing for sure that the Lord did not, in fact, hear my prayers. Or maybe he did and decided to ignore me. It would serve my heathen ass right. I exhale and continue to look past the broad chest. I see the familiar gold chain around his neck with the signature cross, and I know that God has indeed forsaken me. Again, my hand itches to touch the chiseled chin with about three days' worth of stubble, just like it does every time I see him. But I can't confirm my worst nightmare. He has a pillow covering his face. I've come too far to stop now, though. I gently pull the pillow and close my eyes in resignation. I count to ten, and like I'm pulling off a Band-Aid, I open my eyes and learn my fate. The bottom falls out from under me. It's my worst nightmare. It's him, Adam Flynn, lying in bed next to me in nothing but a T-shirt and boxer briefs with his eyes closed, looking like a Greek god. But he's Irish, Melly, not Greek. He's gorgeous. Always has been. There is no denying it. Perfect skin with just a tinge of pink. He has full lips, and I yearn to run my tongue along them. His thick, dark hair is a mess and sticking out from all sides, and that only makes him look sexier. I jump off the bed as if I'm on fire and look down at my bare legs. I'm in nothing but my underwear and a white tank top, the one I had on underneath my sheer kimono top. I look around the room like a cornered animal, relieved only when I see my clothes perfectly folded next to the big screen TV. I quickly put on my jeans. Adam moans again, and when I look at him, he shivers, and goosebumps spread over his body. I tiptoe to the bed, careful enough not to wake him, Gently lift the comforter and cover that perfect body of his. This room is much more extravagant than mine, a suite with a couch and a mini bar. There are two bottles of champagne on the table, one of them still sitting in an ice bucket. I walk over there and pick one up, some French name I can't pronounce. I find my phone and do a quick search of that champagne. The price ranges from three hundred to five hundred dollars, and I can only imagine the upcharge the Bellagio adds. And he got two. What an idiot! I know he can't afford this on a middle school vice principal salary. I refuse to give in to my guilt since I didn't make him buy it. I'm pretty sure I tried to talk him out of it. I don't even remember any of it. Liar. Needing to make my escape before he wakes up. I look around the room for my shoes. I see the black pito wedges underneath the bed, and I get on my knees to reach for them. When I do, something catches the light, a sliver of sun coming through the blinds. I follow the flash, and I blink twice to erase what I'm seeing. I hold up my hand, and right there on my left ring finger is a fat, round, and crystal clear diamond ring. It's so clear that it must be fake. It's bigger than the one my brother gave his wife. I could be mistaken, but I think it's even bigger than the pink diamond ring one of my friends have. And right next to it is a platinum wedding band with small diamonds all around it. It can't be real, I whisper. I pull the ring off my finger and examine it, unsure of what to look for. 
A memory from last night hits, drinks at a bar, grabbing him and pulling him out of that bar and away from a tall, skinny bitch. There was a dare, but I chased the memory away. He would do this. He would put a wedding ring on my finger as a joke. I put both rings on the nightstand, but there's an official-looking form already there. Curious, I pick it up. My stomach drops to the floor, and the food I ate last night threatens to come up. Party one, Flynn, Adam Finnegan. Party two, Dupree, Melanie Elise. Another memory hits, but I refuse to dwell on it. I do something much worse instead. I look back at the document in my hand. My mouth has gotten drier and my heart is beating so fast, I'm afraid it's going to wake my sleeping. I can't even think of the word to describe him. My eyes finally land at the top of the form, but I close them before they can focus on the words. I inhale, say another prayer, convinced this time that I will be delivered. And once again, I'm forsaken. Right there, in bold black letters, Clark County, Nevada, Certificate of Marriage. A hand flies to my mouth, and a sound of despair escapes. The piece of paper slips from my hand, floating in the air-conditioned breeze until it lands on the floor. Without a second thought, I grab my shoes and purse and run out of the room, not even sure where I am. But when I step outside the door, I know I'm still in my same hotel, so I sprint to the elevator in my bare feet. When I get to my room on the twelfth floor, I run to the bathroom, drop to my knees, and empty the contents of my stomach. My eyes water and my throat burns. There's no bitter taste of rancid alcohol or the putrid smell of last night's dinner. Hardly anything comes up, and I end up gagging for what seems like forever. My body is like a rag doll's, hunched over the toilet, as I have no spine to support me. A loud sound escapes, and I realize I'm crying. I don't remember the last time I cried, but in my Vegas hotel room, with no one there to witness it, I give in and weep. What the hell have you done now, Melanie? I finally lift my head and run a shaky hand through my hair. Yesterday was our fourth day in Vegas. Most of the wedding guests had already flown back home, leaving behind only me, Ananda, her new husband, her sister, and two of his friends, one of them being Adam. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I lay my head on the toilet, past the point of caring about germs, and think about how, once again, I've fucked up. Classic Melanie Elise Dupree, one fuck up after another, so much for starting a new life when I left New Jersey and moved in with my brother. Oh, well, I went two years without nearly ruining my life. I think that's a record for me. I finally get up, strip myself bare, and run back to the closet. Like a woman possessed, I pick up the clothes and shoes I had on and put them in a plastic bag, having no intention of taking them home with me. If I get rid of them, maybe that will somehow undo what I did last night— I return to the bathroom, turn the water to scalding, and do my best to wash away the last 12 hours. I stick my head under the spray, knowing my hair will pay the price for using the cheap hotel shampoo, but I don't care. I need to wash it all off, erase and purge everything that's happened. I stay in the shower so long my skin wrinkles. My stomach growls, but I know there is no way I can tolerate any food right now. Just the thought makes me want to gag all over again. The water starts to cool, and I step out, wrapping myself in a large white towel. Once I wrap my hair in another, I leave the bathroom and grab my phone. It only takes a few minutes for me to change my flight to this morning instead of this afternoon. For once, I don't care about the extra cost. Me. Hey, girl. Changed to an earlier flight. Jason and Alex need me. Ananda doesn't reply. I know she'll probably sleep until noon, which is around the time my plane takes off, and by the time she sees my text, I will be in the air, headed east. I find a comfortable pair of skinny jeans and a long sleeve cotton tee. Flip-flops will do for now, but I put a pair of boots in my carry-on for when I arrive in Boston. By the time I do a half-assed job of blow-drying my hair and putting it in a tight bun, it's time to leave.
I don't know why I do it, but I stick my head out of the room and look down to each end of the hallway. Once I've determined it's clear, I practically run to the elevator. When I arrive in the lobby, I sprint out of the front door and into a waiting cab. I don't think I breathe until the wheels of the plane leave the ground and we're soaring through the air, away from the biggest fuck-up of my life. But as I look out of my window, I know I'm only delaying the inevitable. He'll come. He'll find me. There's no way he'll keep this a secret. I shake my head and tell myself I don't care. It's not up to him. He'll realize he's made a mistake, too. We'll talk to Tina. She's the sister of my brother's wife, a former lawyer-turned-restaurant owner. She'll walk us through the annulment process. It will happen quickly, and things will return to normal. Yes, that's exactly what will happen. But when I close my eyes, all I see are blue eyes looking down at me, while a man dressed as Elvis tells us to repeat after him. I have no desire to remember my vows— but I remember his. I can practically hear him now, his voice deep and sincere, as he promised to love, honor, and cherish until death do us part. The wheels of the aircraft hit the ground just before his lips touch mine, at least in my memory. The bouncing of the plane on the runway jolts me out of my daydream, and I shake my head clear of all things related to Adam Flynn. Things will be fine, I'm being dramatic as usual. My mind is playing tricks on me. Maybe I went to one of those shows and got hypnotized. There's no way that gigantic diamond is real. I bet it's as fake as that marriage license. Everyone was probably in on it, just pulling a prank on me because that's what my friends do, especially when it comes to me and Adam. Ananda's been telling me for two years that I'm going to end up with him. You'll have a bunch of his giant babies, she always jokes. I lay a hand on my beating heart and laugh out loud, relieved for the first time in hours. It's pitch black outside, and I know the harsh January weather awaits. Exhausted from the long flight and my lack of food, I eagerly wait to exit the plane, desperate to eat and find my comfortable bed. At least I feel a sense of relief at having talked myself off the ledge. Me, Melanie Elise Dupree, married, that is something that will not happen for a long time, if ever. By the time I walk off the plane and get my bags, it's well past nine in the evening, and despite the pep talk I gave myself, I'm so tense I feel like I'm going to snap. My phone starts to ding with text messages and waiting voicemails the instant I take it off airplane mode, but I'm not eager to check any of them. I find the Uber app and request a car home. The harsh wind bites when I finally step outside. I grab my knit hat and scarf out of my purse, but they have little effect against the cold weather. Luckily, the car pulls up. Once again, I pray to a higher power that the driver doesn't feel the need to talk the entire ride. All I want now is quiet, and for the first time ever, my prayer is answered. The driver barely grunts at me when I get in, and the late Saturday evening traffic is light for a change. I-93 is missing the usual cluster of cars, so it only takes 20 minutes for the Uber to turn down our quiet street. The apartment is dark, which is not surprising, since Jason needs to be at the hospital early in the morning. I run to the front door, eager to get away from the bitter cold. Normally, I hate being alone. I hate quiet. I love the sounds of my two-year-old niece and the chatter of my brother and his wife. I especially love when they have friends or Alex's family here, which is often. But tonight, I'm grateful to be alone. I sit on my bed, and when I start to take off my boots, my eyes land on my left hand. I rub my ring finger and shake the thought away. It was a joke, Melly, A horrible, horrible joke. Ananda, her husband, and Adam are probably having a good laugh at my expense right at this very moment. Girl, why do you keep lying to yourself? My phone vibrates, and the sudden sensation almost causes me to slide off the bed. I don't pick it up, but as soon as the vibration stops, it starts again. I slide under the covers without bothering to remove my clothes and close my eyes, 
but the phone continues to vibrate. I've never been a coward, and I'm not going to start now. But by the time I reach for the phone, it stops. The first thing I see is a missed call from Ananda. My phone slips from my hand when I see the name of the next missed call. My husband. The contact says my husband, and there's a picture of me and Adam in the background. I close my eyes and shake my head as if that would erase what I just saw. I'm in the clothes I was wearing last night. I'm on my tippy toes and my lips are on his cheek. He's smiling happily while he takes the picture. I open my text messages and there are about a dozen messages from my husband and a few from Ananda. I text her back, letting her know I'm home safe. As soon as I hit send, he calls again. 2. Adam just as I expected. I tossed the phone on the other side of the bed, more irritated now than when I first woke up and realized I was alone in the king-sized bed. I've always been able to fall asleep quickly and stay asleep under any circumstances. My mother always jokes that I could sleep standing up if I had to. She said I was the best baby and slept through the night from the time I was two months old. Getting me down for a nap was never a battle, but now I wish I had suffered from insomnia. I should have known she'd run. She's a runner. She has no idea, but I've studied her these past two years since we've been neighbors. She runs whenever I get too close. She ran from me after what happened between us on New Year's Eve. She runs whenever her mother comes to visit. And as much as I knows around, I can never get any details about the rift between them. Now, instead of waking up with my new wife in my arms... I woke up holding a pillow and sporting a hard-on so stiff it was painful. I've never been considered naive, but I wouldn't let myself believe she just left, especially after she promised she wouldn't. A quick search around the room proved otherwise, and when I saw her rings on the nightstand and the marriage certificate on the floor, I knew I had been abandoned. I punch the pillow and call her phone again, just like before it goes right to voicemail. As much as I want to smash my phone against the wall, I make another phone call. Hey, man, Dennis mumbles. Dennis is a math teacher at my school, and while he was visiting me one day, he met Ananda. That was less than a year ago, and now they're married. And since I'm responsible for introducing them, I was part of the wedding party. Has Ananda heard from Melly? I ask. I hear a loud yawn, followed by talking in the background. She got a text from her earlier. She took an early flight home. I guess her brother and sister-in-law need her. Let's meet in the lobby in one hour. I want to hit one more buffet since today's our last day. He ends the call and I lie back on the bed, still cursing my ability to sleep like the dead. As happy as I am for my friend, I was even happier for myself. My friend being involved with one of Melanie's best friends meant we got to spend lots of time together and I soon learned that my new wife has no idea how beautiful and captivating she is. Her beautiful face and body are the least of it. I almost lost my ability to think when I first saw her. At only two inches short of six feet, she's taller than most women. That was the first thing I noticed. I envisioned those long legs wrapped around me. Her smile was the second. It can light up the darkest room. When she lets herself go and smiles, it's wide and shows off perfectly straight teeth. Sometimes she blushes and bats her long eyelashes. She could grace the cover of any magazine with her perfect cheekbones and straight little nose. She must be the only one who doesn't realize how beautiful she is. I've had to threaten half the men in Boston, but it's a good thing I'm taller and broader than most men. All I have to do is stand up and they go running. Unfortunately, Melanie doesn't appreciate my penchant for scaring men away. Too fucking bad. And she might be a runner. She might have left New Jersey for Boston to run away from something. She might leave whenever her mother comes for a visit. She can flee from this hotel room and hop the next flight back home. But she can't run from me. I'll be home tomorrow, in my apartment right above hers. And she's going to have to deal with me. 
There is nowhere she can go where I won't find her and put these rings back where they belong. I hold my left hand up and admire the platinum band around my own ring finger, and for the first time since I woke up this morning and realized I was abandoned, I smile. Yeah, Melly's days of running are about to come to an abrupt end. I call her phone again, and since I know she's on a plane right now flying across the country, I decide to leave a message. Mel, it's your husband. I was hoping to wake up next to my wife on our first full day together as a married couple, but you ran. I should have expected it and planned better. That's on me. Know this. This is the absolute last time you run from me. See you soon, Mrs. Flynn. I press end, satisfied with my message. Having a sudden burst of energy, I hop out of bed and head to the shower. The harsh northeastern wind smacks me around as hard as Mel's abandonment. The streets are as dark as they are bare when I finally drive my car back home. Due to a flight delay, it's past eleven by the time I turn the key into the front door. I know what I need to do. I need to walk up the stairs to my second-floor apartment and deal with my errant wife tomorrow. But I've never been good at waiting. And I sure as fuck am not known for doing what I need to do instead of what I want to do. I give my wife the courtesy of one more phone call. Like it's been doing all day. It rings, but she doesn't pick up, and I don't bother leaving another message. I shove the phone in my pocket and let out a string of curses. I count to five before I wrap my knuckles on the door to the first floor apartment. I knock when I want to bang the door down, but they have a toddler, and I'm not a complete Neanderthal. When I don't hear footsteps, I knock again, only harder this time. I've reached the end of my patience, and I didn't have much to begin with. Finally, I hear laughter, but it's not Mel's, and my nerves are still on high alert. The door swings open and Jason stands on the other side. I know I've interrupted something. He's shirtless with a sheen of sweat on his chest. He doesn't offer any pleasantries when he answers the door. He waits for me to speak. So, I get right to the point. Is Mel home? I crane my neck around him to look. He steps aside and ushers me inside, but his usually friendly demeanor is absent today. He takes a step closer, and because I'm not in the mood for whatever he's about to dish out, I step back. He's a tall guy, but I'm taller. And broader. And the fact that he's a surgeon pretty much guarantees that he won't hit me. I can take him easily. But I'm not about to fight my new brother or my landlord. What the hell went on in Vegas? I don't miss the accusation in his voice or the way he takes a threatening step toward me. Melly's been skittish as a cat since she got back. He doesn't say any more, but I know an accusation when I hear one. This isn't the first time he's confronted me about his sister, and I admire that in a man. He's warned me to leave her alone after I chased away a few dates, but other than that, we've always been on good terms. I'm a model tenant who pays on time and can do my own repairs. I do repairs in his apartment, too, since the man is clueless when it comes to fixing things. I even shovel their driveway and clear his wife's car when it snows. Of course, I only do that while I'm clearing Mel's. I don't have time to answer his question, though, because the front door opens and the woman who's dominated my mind since I first heard her voice walks through the door. I lean against the wall and watch her. She doesn't notice me right away, as evidenced by the smile on her face. I smile, too, when I see her. But that doesn't last long because a man follows her inside. She greets Jason, and my wife has the fucking audacity to hold out her hand for this guy. Damien? She says, smiling from ear to ear as she looks at this fucker's face. This is my brother Jason. Jason, this is Damien. The date I told you about. Jason shakes his hand but turns and looks at me. Mel follows his line of vision and visibly gasps when she sees me leaning against the wall. The color drains from her face and she takes a step closer to this Damien asshole. My wife actually takes a step closer to another man, as if it's his right to protect her and not mine. Your date, Mel, I ask. Her eyes dart from me to Jason as if she's silently asking him for help. Jason answers. He steps between us and turns to me. Don't start any shit, Flynn. Good night. He points towards the door, but I don't move. 
Forgive me, but I have a bit of a problem with my wife going out on a date with another man. For the first time, I noticed Mel's holding a single red rose, and it drops to the floor at my announcement. What? Jason says, confused. Cutie, the asshole says. He has the nerve to give my wife a nickname. That's strike one. You're married? Your profile said single. He raises both hands and takes a step back. Then he looks at me again, perusing my body. He bites his bottom lip and looks me directly in the eyes. You into getting cuckolded? He takes a step closer to me, clearly liking what he sees. Do you do more than watch? I hope so. He lowers his voice to a husky whisper. Mel's mouth opens in shock and she takes a step back. That's strike two. I knew you didn't invite me in here just to meet your brother. He drops his voice and inches closer to Mel. The sly grin on his too thin lips make it clear what he's thinking. That's it. That's strike three. I push off the wall and come to my full height. Damien steps back when I slowly approach him. Damien, is it? That's a no to your first question. I smile when I see the fear in his eyes as I get closer to him. He steps away until his back hits the wall. Idiot. Now he has nowhere to run. I step closer, lift him off his feet by his neck and pin him to the wall. Jason rushes over. Then go, Flynn. I ignore him. In fact, I squeeze the fucker's neck just a little bit. Adam, stop! It doesn't help to calm my anger when I see my wife wringing her hands over this useless piece of shit. If you ever so much as breathe the same air as my wife again, I will rip your fucking heart out of your chest. Got that. When he doesn't answer, I squeeze his neck again, lower my voice and say, I asked you a question. Yes, he croaks out. He starts to kick at me but I look into his eyes and arch an eyebrow. He stops immediately. Does that make me sound like a man who will watch as another man fucks his wife? My voice is so low that only he can hear me. He swallows and shakes his head, unable to form a single syllable. Good. I guess that answers your second question. I lower my voice even further. Now... Get the fuck out of here before I snap your neck. His eyes bulge right before I let him go. He starts to cough, but before Jason can reach for him, he runs to the door. I follow and shove him out. After I close and lock the door, I turn back to Jason and my wayward wife. She stands there, mouth and eyes wide open. I make sure to squash the rose given to her by that other man. I hear a shriek before she runs across the room. I grab her wrist before her hand connects with my face, but she pushes out of my hold and starts to pummel my chest with punches. I grab both wrists, turn her around, and hold her back against my chest. Let her go, Jason orders, coming closer. Right now, Flynn. So I do, and as soon as she's able, she turns and attacks me again. You bastard, she yells. You fucking bastard! I'm going to chop you up into pieces and throw your worthless body parts into the Charles. She punches and kicks until Jason grabs her and stands between the two of us. Jason holds a hand towards Mel, a silent gesture to ask her to shut up. She stops talking, but she's like a cornered animal, ready to strike again at any moment. Why do you keep calling Mel your wife? His brown eyes are shrewd as he looks at me and waits for my answer. I pull the marriage certificate out of my pocket and hand it to him. His eyes widen as he looks at it. When he's done, he hands the piece of paper to his sister, not saying a word. He crosses his arms and waits for her to talk. The instant she gets her hands on the marriage certificate, she rips it to pieces, walks over and throws the pieces of paper in my face. I don't know what he's talking about. That's a fake, she says to Jason. Please do what I asked you to do this morning and evict him. He's turned into a full-on stalker. She glares at me before turning back to him. He scares me. I snort so loud it turns into a laugh. <laughs> you attacked me twice, and you're scared of me. Since when? You think a few punches was an attack? Just wait. I'm going to slice your face when you sleep tonight. 
just like I should have done the other night. She lunges for me again, but Jason wraps an arm around her waist, lifts her off her feet, and pulls her away. What the hell's going on in here, Jason? Are you coming back to bed? Jason's wife, Alex, stops short when she sees me. She looks around the room, sighs, and walks towards Mel. Did he chase your date away again? She shakes her head and says, This has got to stop. She is not your property, Adam. Never said that, but she is my wife. I'm sure you'd have stopped it too if Jason brought home another woman. Alex stands still and looks around the room. She turns to Melly, runs a hand through her curly, dark hair. What the hell did he just say? I'm waiting to hear Melly's take on that, Jason says. I already told you he's lying. My wife crosses her arms. I'm not sure if she's defiant or deep in denial. I'm lying, I ask her. Out of the two of us, you're saying I'm the liar. <laughs> As if I would ever marry you, Mel scoffs, and like a petulant child, she turns her head away from me. I'm disappointed in you, wife, I say to Mel. You've always been a pathological liar, but this is low even for you. Just so we're clear, you did not marry Adam in Vegas, Jason asks his sister. As if I would ever, she scoffs. I'm not attracted to him. She doesn't disappoint. I knew she'd fight me. But the outright denial is unexpected. It hurts that someone who promised to love, honor, and cherish is now denying those sacred vows. Well, this marriage certificate says otherwise, and that kiss we shared on New Year's Eve, that wasn't a kiss from someone who isn't attracted to me. I pull out another marriage certificate and hand it to Alex. She puts a hand to her mouth in shock as she reads it. And you put this on my finger. I hold up my left hand and show them the platinum wedding band. She tries to reach for that certificate too, probably to rip it, but Jason holds her back. Go ahead, rip it. I have more but you can rip them all and it won't erase one fact. We're married. I pull out my phone and hand it to Jason. Press play, I tell him. Mel lunges for the phone, so Jason hands it to Alex. She touches the screen and my wife's voice fills the room. I, Melanie Elise Dupree, take you, Adam Finnegan Flynn, to be my lawfully wedded husband. Mel lets out a loud scream and she breaks free of Jason's hold. He tries to grab her arm, but she runs across the room, jumps on me, and goes for my neck. Jason grabs her waist, but she manages to wrap her hands around my throat and squeeze. It takes no effort for me to pull her hands off. Jason lifts her away, but she's like a crazed animal, doing her best to get away from him and come after me again. Her hair is wild, fallen out of her ponytail as she curses. Soon she tires herself out, and Jason puts her down. But I don't miss the tears running down her face before she walks away and sits at the kitchen table. 3. Melly. Ten tears fall for each one I swipe. The dam really breaks when Alex takes me into her arms and I feel a hand on my shoulder. It's okay, Smelly, Jason says. I let out a choked laugh at the childhood nickname the name he used to call me before our relationship turned to shit, before I decided I hated my brother and everything he stood for. I cry until there's nothing left, and my head starts to hurt. My shoulders shrug in despair, and I say, I don't remember it. Even as the words leave my mouth, I know they're another lie. Every memory, every word, and every promise we made is right there in the forefront of my mind, but... There's no way in hell I will ever admit to that. But I guess it's true, what he said. I point a finger toward Adam without looking at him. It's true. Jason sits down across from me and puts both hands to his face. He rubs the back of his neck before he looks at me again. I'll call Tina and see what can be done. I'm sure you can get it annulled, Alex reassures me. Then she gasps and looks over my shoulder to Adam. Did you really sleep with him? She whispers. Jesus, Jason says. No, she didn't, Adam says from behind me. But I am not agreeing to an annulment or a divorce. I am Catholic. Well, it's not only up to you. Having had enough of him, I screamed those words, shocking both Alex and Jason. 
And your religion has absolutely nothing to do with me, so shove it. Flynn, I'll deal with you tomorrow, but you need to leave right now. Jason's chair scrapes against the hardwood, and he walks across the room. I turn in time to see him grab Adam's elbow and lead him away. Adam holds my stare until he turns the corner, and I can no longer see him. I hear the drone of their voices, but they're too far away for me to hear the words. Jason talks first, then Adam. I visibly relax when I hear the front door open and close. Jason returns and stands in front of me, offering me his hand. I take it, and he pulls me into a hug. Alex joins us for a group hug in the kitchen. It's going to be okay. I'm going to evict him. You'll talk to Tina tomorrow, and everything will be fine. Jason pulls back and cups my face. I hug him, relieved and comforted by his words, even though I know, deep down, things won't be that simple. You can't evict him, babe. He pays on time. He hasn't violated the lease, and he's not doing anything illegal in the apartment, Alex shrugs. I looked all of that up before renting my old condo. I sag against Jason, and he holds me tighter. A hiccup escapes, and the tears start to fall all over again. What am I going to do, Jason? I whisper. Just another Melly fuck-up. You were never a fuck-up, Melly. Everything will work out. I let out a sniffle and nod, unsure of what else to say or do. I'm going to go to bed. I already interrupted your night enough. I look at Alex, who's wearing a long silk robe, barely covering her belly. I rub my hand over her, and the baby kicks. My niece is active tonight, I say. She kicks again, and I relax for the first time since I woke up in that hotel room in Vegas. Yeah, she's the reason I couldn't go to Vegas, Alex says. Go to bed, and we'll go see Tina together tomorrow, okay? It will be fine. I hug my brother and sister-in-law one more time, walk to the back of the apartment, and step inside my bedroom. I moved here with Jason only a few months after he bought this house. He met his wife soon after, and even though I've offered to move out, they asked me to stay. And since I love living with them and my niece, I've stayed. Now I realized I should have left. I can afford it, but I love being part of a family and staying allowed me to save money for my own house. Adam has always been in the background, though he's never been more than a nuisance, asking me out and scaring my dates away by intimidating them. I'm not blind or immune to his looks or that body of his. I've spent enough days watching him work out shirtless in the backyard to be completely familiar with his six-pack, but he's not what I'm looking for in a boyfriend. I never miss the lustful glances or the possessive attitude, but what I said to my brother tonight wasn't true. I never felt unsafe or afraid. Not until I woke up yesterday morning and was faced with the consequences of our actions. 4. Adam It took me twice as long to fall asleep last night. I couldn't calm down after the ugly confrontation downstairs. It was a foregone conclusion that she'd fight, but I was not expecting outright denial and blatant lies. Even now I feel the sting of her betrayal for going behind my back to have me evicted. As if that would erase the fact that we're bound together for life now. It was impulsive, but I take marriage seriously. Despite being raised by a single mother, I've always respected the sanctity of marriage. It doesn't matter that I never had my parents as an example. Not even my morning workout can relax me like it normally does. Instead of working out for one hour, I've been going at it for two in the hopes that some of the stress would leave my body. But I'm more wound up now than I was when I woke up two days ago to find her gone. Now she thinks she can hide from me one floor below behind her brother. Yeah, he's her brother, but I'm her husband. My legs feel like lead on the stationary bike, but I pedal fast enough to make this feeling of despair evaporate. But it doesn't work. I stop abruptly, suddenly too overwhelmed to continue. My breath comes out in short pants as I reach for my gallon of water. 
The loud knock on my door finally forces me off the bike. My chest and back are coated with sweat, and my shorts are so damp I pull them up while I jog to the front door. That's not six in the morning yet, which means there could only be one person outside my door. Jason doesn't bother with any pleasantries when he barges inside my apartment. I move out of the way, lean against the wall, and cross my arms. I need to get ready for work, Dupree. I rub a tired hand over my face. I'm not in the mood for a confrontation this early. At least not with him. You think I don't? His tone is sharp today. He's been irritated with me before, but never angry. Get on with it. But just so you know, you can't evict me. I pay rent on time, and I haven't done anything to violate the lease. I can ask you politely to move out, he counters, and I politely refuse. What's your game here, man? Did you get my sister drunk so you could trick her into marrying you? I walk away from him before I do anything I'll regret. I remind myself that Jason and I are family now, but his words are like a slap to my face. I don't have to trick a woman into marrying me, I retort. No, you don't. But I also know my sister has turned you down many times. Yet the second you both end up in Las Vegas, she comes back married to you. I knew something was off the minute I saw her yesterday morning. He walks over to where I am and points a finger to my face. I have about two inches on him, so I take a little pleasure in having to look down at him right before I swipe his finger away. Here's what's going to happen. You're not going to stick your finger in my face or give me orders. I would never take advantage of your sister or anyone else. That's not who I am. And you're not going to come in here and tell me about me and my wife. My voice is sharper than I intend. But I'm tired of being the bad guy in this situation. Then explain how this happened. He's not backing away. In fact, he comes closer. He shoves me against the wall and gets in my face. I wouldn't have to hit him hard to get him to back away, but that's probably what he wants. It's what he would need to evict me, and it would piss off my wife and push her further away from me. I could do that, but I need to speak with your sister first. In fact, scratch that. She's the only one I need to talk to. But I can't do that because she's always hiding behind you. I managed to slide away from him, walk to my coffee maker and pour each of us a cup. I take out the cream and Jason helps himself. Has it ever occurred to you that she's the one who wanted to marry me? I ask. Is that what happened? Jason asks. He shakes his head and says, No, that never occurred to me because it's a load of shit. You planned this, didn't you? Why? Has your sister ever done anything she didn't want to do? He doesn't answer, so I take that as a victory. Exactly. You want me to believe that somehow Melly got to Vegas and decided to marry you, the same guy she's rejected over and over again the last two years. I'm sorry, he says, shaking his head. I just don't see it. You should ask her about that, then. I've said all I'm going to say to you about it. I put my cup down. I need to get ready for work. Jason stands and puts both hands up. Me, too. I came up here for one reason. Whatever happened in Vegas, Melly doesn't want to stay married. Make it easy and end the marriage. We stare at each other, me not responding to his request, and him not saying another word. After what seems like forever, he nods once and leaves my apartment. I stare at the door, my hand up and ready to knock. Before I can, it swings open and Alex stands in front of me, ushering me inside. I heard you coming down the stairs. It's like a herd of elephants. Melly already left for work, she says. She puts a hand on her protruding belly and gestures for me to follow her into the kitchen. I hear tiny little footsteps. Addison, Alex and Jason's two-year-old daughter, comes running into the kitchen. She's a tiny thing with a head full of curly black hair. She smiles and runs to me, wrapping her arms around my legs. Tada, she says after she lets me go. She stands back, puts both fists up, and hits me in the thigh. I take a step back, clutching onto where she just punched. She shuffles to the other side and hits me again. Oh! I take several exaggerated steps back until I stumble and fall. She moves fast and jumps on top of me, using her tiny little fists to rain punches on my chest and chin. 
She jumps off and starts counting to ten. I pretend to try to get up, but I fall back down. When she finally reaches ten, she cheers. I win, Mama! I hop up and she laughs. Yeah, you kicked Adam's butt, but you need to eat your breakfast. She giggles, but runs to the table. I follow behind her, lift her into the high chair, and place her bowl of oatmeal in front of her. I'm sorry if I upset you last night, I say to Alex. She waves a dismissive hand. You didn't upset me as much as surprise me, but that's on you and Melly. She wouldn't talk about it last night, so I don't have much to tell you. She pretty much shut down soon after you left. I still remember the day I first heard Melly's voice. I never laid eyes on her that day, but her voice called to me even then. It was when I was moving into my apartment. I didn't bother with movers. I didn't have much furniture, and I didn't want to pay for the added expense. It was me, Dennis, and his younger brother, Marlo. Dennis is rather nerdy, with glasses as thick as his waist and a mind for numbers. But his younger brother is the opposite. He's tall and spends hours at the gym. In fact, when I first heard Melly, she was flirting with him. Make sure you stay hydrated. Those were the first words I heard, and I stopped on the stairs, eager to hear more. Dennis is helping me bring my couch to the second floor. There's a curve in the middle of the stairwell, and we have the couch leaning against the wall so we can figure out the best way to get it inside my apartment. It's blocking my view of Marlo and the sweet voice downstairs. Yeah, I could use a little something, Marlo says. The flirty lilt of his voice grates on my nerves. Something sweet. Know where I can find that? I try to stick my neck out and look down the stairs, but there's not enough room between the wall and the couch. All I can see is a piece of her hair and what looks like a side ponytail. She must be leaning against the wall with one of her feet propped against it, and I get a glimpse of her pink Nike sneakers. Maybe you can ask your fiancé about that, Marlo, I interject. Their interaction is annoying me, and I want to let her know that he isn't available. You're engaged, the sexy voice asks. I hear some shuffling and Marlo's loud groan. Yeah, there's bro code, and there's being a serial cheater when you're engaged. Not going to happen on my watch. What the fuck, Flynn? Marlo says, annoyed with me. Yeah, I cock-blocked him last week when he hit on a waitress. His brother can't understand why he's engaged, but I think it's because his fiance has her own place and he needs a roof over his head. It's not serious, baby, Marlo says, and I roll my eyes. Does she know that, asshole? I let out a loud laugh. Unlike Marlo, she has a moral compass. I hear a door open and another set of footsteps. Let's go pick up the pizza. Alex needs to do some emotional eating, another female voice says. I didn't hear Melly's voice again that day, but the loud slam of the door told me she was through with Marlowe. That was good enough for me. I didn't force her, and I didn't get her drunk, I say to Alex, who has put a hand on my arm to get my attention. Pfft, I know that. Who can force Melly to do anything? I believe you, but like I said, she went to bed last night and left before Jason this morning. In other words, she wanted to make sure she left before I could come find her. Can you text me when she gets home tonight? Okay, she says, lowering her voice as if the only other person present isn't a toddler. But you better make sure nobody finds out. Jason is on full Big Brother protective mode. It's kind of sexy, she says as she bites her bottom lip. I roll my eyes and look toward the ceiling. What? she asks. It is sexy, but I'm still going to help you. She lowers her voice again and says... You should know that we're seeing Tina today. I'll never agree to an annulment or a divorce, I say, adamant. If I wasn't in front of my friend and her toddler daughter, I'd punch a wall at the very idea. We're interrupted by a loud knock, and when I open the door, Addison's nanny, Sylvie, walks in. She's a stout woman, probably in her fifties, with skin the color of midnight, a long face and bushy eyebrows. I have to get ready for work. I'll text you tonight. Alex says. I thank her and walk out of her apartment. 5. Melly Alex's breathing heavy and holding her belly by the time we get to the Beantown Cafe, which is owned by her half-sister, Tina, 
a former family attorney turned restaurant owner, but she's still licensed to practice law in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. It's the lunch rush, and when Tina sees us, she points to a nearby booth. After a few minutes, she slides in next to Alex. Hey, baby, she says to Alex's belly. Your Auntie Tina can't wait to spoil you. She lowers her head and kisses Alex's stomach three times. So, what is going on? Your text sounded really ominous, Alex. I clear my throat, and when Tina finally looks at me, her smile drops. Oh, God, what happened? She immediately reaches across the table and grabs my hand. Melly got herself into a bit of a situation in Vegas, Alex says on my behalf. You didn't get married, did you? Tina throws her head back and starts to laugh. She sobers up when she realizes she's the only one at the table laughing. No, she says, gasping loudly. Melanie Dupree. I don't remember it. He must have drugged me. Alex looks at me, narrows her eyes, and purses her lips. I cut my eyes at her and turn back to Tina. Oh, my God. Please say you didn't marry Adam. He went to Vegas, too, right? Neither one of us responds, and Tina puts both hands to her mouth and looks from me to Alex. I finally nod slowly, acknowledging the fact that I married for the first time today. Okay, Tina says, taking a deep breath. She rubs her temples before looking back up at me. You want my help getting a divorce? An annulment, I clarify. I want to erase the fact that we were ever married. I can picture the hurt look on his face when I tell him I'm not going to continue with this farce. A memory from the other night tries to rise to the surface. I see his face. He's smiling, and his blue eyes are locked on my brown. I remember the soft skin of his cheek under my hand when I reach to stroke his face. Someone at the table clears their throat, and I force the memory away. A waitress comes by and places food in front of us. We come here so much, she already knows our lunch order. A chef salad for me and grilled chicken and veggies for Alex. You can get an annulment for several reasons in Massachusetts. If the person you married had a living spouse at the time of your marriage, if one party was defrauded, impotency, coercion, if he had a fatal disease from you or if one of you was underage, or you can file a no-fault divorce. There are two options there. One where you both agree that the marriage is not salvageable. She takes a deep breath and says, but I have a feeling Adam won't agree to that so easily. You can still file it even if the spouse doesn't cooperate, but it's a little bit more complicated. You'll have to file a written complaint with the court and then serve Adam with it. He'll have to file a response. I lay my head in my hands, feeling the weight of the world on my shoulders. I refuse to succumb to tears again, though. I did that all last night, and the only thing it got me was a splitting headache. No, tears won't fix this. Only action will. Tina reaches across the table and holds one of my hands. How did this happen? I mean, we all know he's crazy about you. The first thing he does when he walks into a room is find you. I've watched him. He doesn't take a breath until he knows you're there. It's kind of sweet. I pull my hands away, unwilling to hear this. He is not sweet, I hiss. He's just not used to being told no. He's only been interested this long because I keep turning him down. If he knew the real me, he would have run by now. Melly, what the hell are you talking about? Alex says. You are fucking amazing, and everybody knows it. Stop with that shit. Tears fill my eyes, and I reach out and grab my sister-in-law's hand. That's because we're besties. You have to say that. No, I don't. But seriously, stop talking shit about one of my best friends. Listen, she says, looking around the place. Why don't you just talk to Adam? Having a conversation before you decide on what to do. Tina's not going anywhere. She's right. I'm not. 
I'm here, or you can always call me or stop by my house. But, Melly, she reaches for my hand again, her tone now turning serious. Are you sure you were drunk? They wouldn't have married you if you were too drunk to know what was going on. I take a deep breath, but another scene from that night flashes through my mind. This time, I'm leaning closer to him. His scent fills me when I rub my nose against his strong jaw. I push the thought away, deep, deep into the recesses of my mind. And because I'm surrounded by friends, I do manage to keep those memories at bay, unlike last night. Of course I was drunk, I insist. The alcohol hits differently on the West Coast. I widen my eyes and look around the table to show my outrage to prove my point. You think I would choose this? I break eye contact with Tina, but in my peripheral vision, I watch as she looks at Alex and they have a conversation with just their eyes. Okay, Tina says, holding both hands up in surrender. Talk to your husband. I groan at the mention of that title. And let's talk afterwards. Lunch is on me today, she says before getting up. My stomach grumbles, and I immediately regret my salad. I look longingly at the cheeseburger and fries a couple is having at the next table over. I pick at my food, but I can feel Alex's eyes on me. What? I ask. I look up, and Alex hasn't so much as touched her food. Please eat before I text Jason. She rolls her eyes and picks up her fork. We both laugh at my threat, and some of the tension in my shoulders lessens. Right on time, Alex says, holding up her phone. Jason's name flashes across the screen. My mind goes back to seeing my husband on my phone a few days ago. Hey, Jay, Alex says. I listen to their one-sided conversation, and as usual, Alex is listing everything she's eaten today. Is that good enough for you, Jason? She laughs at whatever he says. Then she puts the phone on her belly. Okay, the baby loves you. She laughs again and says, yeah, I guess I do too. She blows him a kiss and ends the call. We eat in silence, but I don't miss Alex's wayward glances. Once we're done, I push my plate back and lean in my chair I barely tasted the food while I ate, and despite the food in my stomach, I feel empty. You know how Adam's eyes follow you wherever you go whenever you're in the same room? Alex asks. Tina returns with a warm chocolate chip cookie for each of us and slides back into the booth. Well, I've noticed that your eyes follow him too, she says softly. She turns to me and brushes a wayward piece of hair off my cheek. That's only because I need to make sure he's not going to attack me, I grumble. And remember that time we saw him going to his apartment with a woman? Not really, I lie. You were pissed about it for days until he introduced her to us. As soon as you learned she was his cousin visiting from Dublin, your attitude vanished. Alex says, and Tina nods. I reach for my cookie and take a small bite. Normally, I'd devour this, but I'm too stressed to eat today. I don't remember it that way. I had a stressful week at work, so that's probably why I was in a bad mood. It had nothing to do with his cousin. I take another bite of the cookie and add, We had that audit. Alex and Tina look at each other again, and neither one of them seemed convinced by my answer. So you weren't jealous of the thought of him dating someone? I roll my eyes at Alex's question, but inside I want to scream. The very idea of Adam and another woman makes my blood boil, but only because he's ruined so many of my dates, not because I want him for myself. Hell no, I wasn't jealous. Maybe if he had someone, he'd leave me alone. I shove the other half of the cookie in my mouth and pray they change the subject. But once again, my prayer goes unanswered. Then why do you look out the window whenever you hear him going out or coming in? And what about that time you thought you heard high heels on the stairs? What about it? I don't remember that. 
I clear my throat loudly and look away. You ran up there and barged into his apartment. You had egg on your face when it was his mother. Alex and Tina both stare at me. The look in Alex's eye tells me she's not going to let me get away with pretending not to remember. Oh, that. Yeah. An uncomfortable throat clearing later, I say. I was only trying to get back at him. I can feel the color creeping up my neck and face. I barged into his apartment without the courtesy of a knock, ready to confront the woman. When I saw his mother, I turned on my heels and walked out, but not before I saw Adam's eyes light up at my sudden appearance. Alex and Tina exchanged looks again, but I clear my throat and cross my arms, almost daring them to say another word. Melly, is there any part of you that wanted to marry him? You guys have this gravitational pull. I don't know why you've turned him down so many times. Alex holds a hand up before I can deny it. Don't answer now. I already know what you're going to say. Listen, talk to Adam tonight, okay? Stop running from him. You two did a grown-up thing, so sit down and talk about it like adults. 6. Adam. New Year's Eve. Only ten minutes until the new year. I knock loud enough to be heard over the loud music on the other side of the door. A smiling face opens the door, but it's not the one I've been obsessed with for the past two years. No, this is a friend of her brother's, and her very protective husband comes and stands right behind her. His eyes narrow at me, and he puts an arm across her shoulders. He pulls her closer and kisses her temple. Jake and Sandy, right? I ask. And she smiles warmly, but he only stares at me. Jake is Jason's best friend since college, and Sandy is his wife. They step away, and I walk inside. Hey, Adam, Jake says. Everyone's in the kitchen. I follow them, holding the bottle of champagne I've been saving. My eyes find her immediately. She's at the kitchen island, pouring drinks. I go and stand next to her, and she freezes. She knows who it is just like I always know when she's nearby. Happy New Year, love, I whisper. She nods curtly but won't look at me. Alex, your mocktail, Mel says. She hands Alex a pink drink. And something else for the rest of us. She gives everyone else a glass. Then she pours another and hands it to me. I take a sip. Whatever it is, it's much too sweet for my taste, but I manage to finish it. Everyone else files out of the kitchen to go wait for the ball to drop. What are you doing here? Her words slur, and for the first time tonight she looks at me. She's beautiful, like always. Unlike every other time, she's not wearing makeup tonight. Her hair is down, framing her long face. She licks her plump lips, and I will myself not to moan. Didn't want to ring in the New Year alone. I move closer, reach around her, and grab the corkscrew. Once I open my bottle of champagne, I pour each of us a glass. Five more minutes until the ball drops, someone shouts from the other room. Music is turned on, and I can no longer hear what they are saying. Where's your family? I know you spent Christmas with your mother, she says. I look down and notice she's in a black jumpsuit with a sheer long top. If she were mine, I'd pull her close and never let her go. Ma went to a neighbor's house. She nods and slowly sips her champagne. I lift my glass and we clink. I stand next to her, my body touching hers. I don't know if it's the lulling effects of the alcohol, but she puts her head on my shoulder. When we finish, I pour each of us another glass. When everyone starts to count down, I face her. Our eyes remain locked while we count down to one. Before she can say Happy New Year, I lean down and capture her lips in a kiss. She doesn't fight me or pull away like I thought she would. She slides a hand into my hair and kisses me as if she's been craving me for years. She tastes better than I thought, and her warm lips are pliant under mine. I put my hands on her waist and lift her on the island. She wraps her long legs around me and deepens the kiss. Her hands slide underneath my shirt as she strokes the muscles in my back 
moaning into my mouth, and I pull close enough to grind my erection on her. She moans again and grabs my ass, pressing me closer. I've been waiting forever to do that. It's better than I ever imagined. Come upstairs with me, I whisper against her mouth. She pulls away and the haunted look in her eyes guts me. <laughs> I'm not the one-night stand type. She lets out a humorless laugh. You should know better than that. I want all the nights with you, not just one. Right. Of course you do. She rolls her eyes heavenward and lets out a strained laugh. <laughs> Until I give you what you want, right? I look into her brown eyes and push a piece of hair off her forehead. She doesn't look away like she always does. When I lay my forehead against hers, she wraps an arm around me. If only, Adam, if only I could believe this would last. I pull away and note the empty look in her eyes. It almost breaks me. Someone in the other room laughs and Mel sighs. <sighs> I'm surrounded by people in love all the time. What can I do to prove to you that I want you? And not just for one night. I can't get hurt. I would never hurt you. You would unless I come up with a way to keep you. How can you want me when... When what, love? I caress her cheeks and wait for her to speak. But all she does is breathe. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Don't put ideas in my head, Adam. Bend your knees, Dunbar! Chad Brown, owner of Combat, a small gym on the south side of Boston, yells, pulling me out of my daydream. We're in the middle of the boxing ring, and Dunbar is doing his best to knock me out. The problem is I can anticipate all his moves. He jabs, I move a fraction, and he misses. We've been doing this song and dance for way too long, but the sparring is the only thing keeping me from losing my mind. All the calls to my wife today have gone to voicemail, and my texts have been ignored, even though I can see she's read them. I've been a tight coil of emotion all day. The teachers at the school didn't know what to do with me. I've never been so short-tempered with them before. Hell, I haven't lost my temper since the lawyer's visit after my father's death. But here I am, so angry that I'm about to erupt. Mel's denial of our marriage last night comes to mind, and I lose focus. Dunbar manages to land a jab to my ribs. Having had enough of him, I take a few steps back, then I walk forward, jab him in the same spot three times and surprise the fuck out of him with a left hook. He lands flat on his back, and I don't bother to check on him. I yank off the gloves and climb out of the ring. The fuck, Flynn? Chad asks, but I walk away without so much as a backwards glance. I've had enough of this fucking day. The instant I get in the locker room, I check my phone. Alex. Come downstairs now. I let out a string of curses when I see the text Alex sent over 30 minutes ago. The time got away from me, and instead of going home two hours ago like I intended, I stayed at the gym, hoping the physical activity would take my mind off my personal problems. It didn't. Boxing has always been my escape. It's what saved me as a troubled teenager, until a fractured elbow ended my hopes of going professional. Well... That, and my mother crying and begging me to stop the madness. If there's one thing I can't take, it's a crying woman. Especially one I love. Now, I'm across town, sweating and still frustrated over my runaway bride. My phone vibrates, and for some reason I get a sense of hope. Maybe Alex told me to come downstairs for a reason. Maybe that reason is calling my phone right now, ready to talk. But my hopes are dashed when I see the familiar New York phone number flash across my screen. I hit decline and slide the phone back into my pocket. As soon as I do, it starts to vibrate again. But all I can focus on now is getting inside my truck and driving home. Traffic is light for a Monday evening, and I get to our quiet street in under 15 minutes. The gray skies threaten snow, and a few flurries start to fall by the time I pull into my parking spot behind the detached garage. There's a strange car with New Jersey license plates parked behind Melly's Honda Civic, but I don't give it any more thought than noticing it's there. Mel and Jason are from New Jersey, and they get visitors often. I grab my gym bag and nearly trip out of the truck. I cross the backyard and unlock the back door. I check my phone again, and there are no missed calls from my wife, but three from the New York number. 
Get a fucking clue, I say under my breath right before I wrap my knuckles against the back door. Alex opens, her eyes wide and cheeks pink. Little Addison walks behind her and wraps her arms around her mother's legs. Hi, Ada, she says, smiling up at me. I hold my hands out to her and she practically jumps into my arms. I tickle her ribs and she giggles. What took you so long? Alex asks, her voice hushed. She gestures for me to come in. Look who stopped by! Alex's voice is high when she addresses the room. Mel's back is to me while she looks through the fridge, but her body stiffens at Alex's announcement. Jason's smile drops, and he automatically takes a step closer to me, putting himself between me and Mel. I don't think we can take any more surprise visitors, Mel says, but she turns and for the first time since we said our vows. She looks at me, and nod with murderous intent. She looks tired, and part of me feels responsible for that. But there's something there, too. She's on guard more than usual. Even now, she's standing behind the open fridge door, almost as if it would provide her with some sort of shield. Do you want to join us for dinner, Adam? Jason turns to his wife, and I can feel the irritation oozing out of him by her invitation. But she doesn't back down. We're all family now, she whispers. The smell of home cooking makes my stomach grumble. Jason looks at Mel, as if to confirm Alex's invitation is fine with her, but a door opens and footsteps approach. Mel's body goes completely rigid when her mother walks into the kitchen, and she instinctively steps as far away from the woman as possible while remaining in the same room. Gemma, Addison announces, pointing at the woman. I've met her briefly before. Diana Dupree resembles both of her children, from their light brown skin to their high cheekbones. The only differences are a few crow's feet around her eyes and mouth, and her salt and pepper hair, which she keeps in a stylish bob. The only thing they inherited from their father is his height. Their mom barely reaches Jason's shoulder. Flynn, you remember my mother, Jason says. Mom, this is Adam Flynn. He lives upstairs. She smiles at me and shakes my hand. Even the smile is the same as Mel's. What brings you over tonight, Adam? She asks, but she turns and opens the oven door without giving me time to respond. Mel lets out a sound, and when I turn to look at her, she gives me a firm head shake while mouthing for me to shut up. Just here to get my wife, I announce. The room goes deathly silent for about a split second, right before Mel gasps, and Alex covers her shock with a series of coughs. Jason runs over to his wife to make sure she's okay, and Mel turns her glare on me. Shut up! She hisses. Just shut the hell up for once in your life, please. I'd do anything for her, but keeping quiet about our marriage is not one of them. Who is your wife, dear? Mrs. Dupree asks. She puts down her oven mitts, turns, and smiles at me again. Your daughter. Her smile vanishes so fast it was as if it was never there. She turns her shocked eyes on Mel, who walks around her mother, comes to stand by me and grabs my hand. The minute she intertwines our fingers, I feel a twinge inside my chest. This is what she did the night we got married. She fell asleep in my arms with our fingers linked. What? What are you up to now, Melanie? Mrs. Dupree says. You never told me you were dating anyone. Then, instead of turning to Mel for confirmation, she turns to Jason. Jason? Is this true? Mel is right here, I say. Why are you looking at Jason? Jason, is this true? She asks again, her voice rising this time. I'm right here, mother, Mel informs her. Jason doesn't give their mother an answer, so she turns her gaze on my wife. She looks down at our joined hands and back to her daughter's face. And yes, I got married. Is that a crime? Millions of people get married every day. What's really the issue? You'll miss out on your chance to call me a spinster? She puts her hands on her hips and waits for Jason to answer. But when Addison starts to fuss in my arms, Jason comes and takes her from me. It's Millie's announcement, Mom. It wasn't my place to tell you. Surprise! I'm married. It just happened over the weekend, and I was only down here to get my clothes, but I'll just come back down later, preferably after you go to sleep or go back to Jersey or whatever. 
Mel waves a dismissive hand in her mother's direction, turns to me, lays a hand on my chest and says, Let's go home, honey. She coughs after calling me honey. Then she gets on her tippy toes and drops the quickest kiss on my lips. I've missed you, she whispers. So I do the only thing I can do. I grab the back of her head and give her a kiss too indecent for company. By the time I pull away, she can't meet anyone's gaze. Alex is smiling, and Jason is looking at me with an unreadable expression on his face. Mrs. Dupree looks around the room, her mouth hanging open while looking for confirmation of the information she just learned. When no one answers her, she throws her hands in the air before turning back to Mel. She crosses the room and grabs her left hand. Very funny, Melanie. Did he marry you without a ring? She drops her daughter's hand, scoffs, and goes back to the oven. It was a little too big, so we got it resized. It's upstairs, Mel. No one calls her Mel, her mother says. Her husband does, I announce. As stimulating as this conversation is, we're going to go. Mel walks out of the kitchen, but instead of going to the front door, she goes to the back of the apartment and into her bedroom. I follow, and when I get there, she's shoving clothes inside a suitcase. I walk to her closet and grab a handful of clothes still on the hangers. Let's go. I turn and nearly collide with Jason. He steps into the room and closes the door behind him. Melly, you don't have to leave. My wife walks to Jason and points a finger in his chest. If you think I'm staying under the same roof as our mother, you're nuts. Feel free to give yourself brain surgery. And did you know she was coming? She asks, lowering her voice. This is what I get, she yells. I knew I should have moved out last month, but you and Alex convinced me to stay, and now look, my entire life has gone to hell. She runs a hand over her face and walks to the door, but the door opens and her mother walks in, with Alex waddling behind her, holding Addison's hand. Hi, Ada, she runs to me, holding up both hands. I drop the pile of clothes and pick her up. She kisses my cheek before she lays her head on my shoulder. Why don't we all have dinner? Mrs. Dupree says. She looks at me and smiles, but the smile never reaches her eyes. I want to talk to all my kids, she says, looking at Jason, Alex, and Mel. But when she looks at me, her fake smile slips. I was thinking that with the baby coming soon, maybe I can stay for a few months. The suitcase falls from Mel's hand, landing with a loud thud against the hardwood floor. What about the house? Aren't you due to close on it in two weeks? Jason asks. His mother shrugs and says, That fell through. I'll tell you all about it over dinner. Come on. She starts to walk away, but looks at Mel before saying, I'd like to get to know your, uh, your Adam, she says. Although, Melanie, I'm surprised by the news. Not just this so-called marriage, but the groom. He's not exactly the kind of man you've always talked about. Couldn't you find your type in this city, or did you scare them all away? You've always been so headstrong. She laughs and turns to me. <laughs> and she has expensive taste, so be warned. Champagne taste on a beer budget. What is it that you do again? Whatever it is, you'd better get a second job. Mom, enough, Jason yells. Melanie steals her spine and walks to her mother. Jason goes to stand right next to her, and I stand on her other side and throw my free hand across her shoulders. For the first time ever, she doesn't shrug away. And what do you know about my type, mother? When was the last time we had a heart-to-heart? -heart? Worry about your own type since Daddy left you. Alex gasps loudly, and Addison mimics her mother's actions and giggles at her own cleverness. For that much younger woman, too. I wonder why. All color leaves her mother's face. Jason closes his eyes and rubs his forehead. Let's go, Adam. Some things never change, Melanie. Diane Dupree closes her eyes as if she's pained. Wrong. A lot has changed. For instance, if you want to dish it out now, you better be ready to take it. Jason takes Addison from me, and I grab the stack of clothes on Mel's bed. Without another word, I follow my wife out of the bedroom and out of the apartment. 7. Adam 
She tosses the suitcase in the middle of my living room and it crashes into my coffee table. The mug of coffee I left there this morning falls over and spills. She starts to pace, cursing like a sailor with each angry step. After hanging her clothes in my closet, I wipe down the spilled coffee all while Mel's pacing continues. For the first time tonight, I look at what she's wearing. She's in purple and gray yoga pants and a matching hoodie. The hoodie hugs her narrow waist, showing off her hips and thick ass. All I can think about is walking over there, putting my hands on her hips and kissing her until she calms down. Okay. She takes several deep breaths before coming to stand in front of me. I'm going to need a little time to find my own place, but in the meantime, I need a small favor from you. I arch my eyebrows at her declaration. I need you to let me stay here, at least until Alex has that baby. I sit on the couch and put my hands behind my head. I school my features so she won't see how happy I am by her announcement. Is that right? I ask. Yes. Do you know why, Adam? Because it's the least you can do after what you did to me in Vegas. Besides, Jason always folds where our mother is concerned. She drops this bombshell and he's too much of a nice guy to tell her to GTFO. <sighs> so, she says, sighing deeply, I guess I can sleep on the couch. But it would be nice if you would let me have the bed. The bed is yours? I quickly agree to her demand. She stops her pacing, turns to me, and narrows her eyes. But let's get one thing straight. I didn't do anything to you in Vegas, so you can stop that lie right the hell now. I'll pay rent, of course, she says, ignoring my last comment. Name your price. I stand and approach her. She backs away and ends up stuck between my body and the wall. I'd go and stay with Ananda, but she just got married, and I don't want to be a nuisance to her right now and a hotel would cost too much money and would set me back. Damn it. And you hate being alone, so I'm your next best choice. How do you know I hate being alone? She crosses her arms and stares. You live with your brother and his family? I shrug. I bet you never had any intentions of moving out. You only offered to move, knowing they would ask you to stay. She scoffs and moves away from me. I watch her tight ass pace across my living room and I will my body not to have its natural reaction. I reach out, touch her arm, and she stops walking. When she looks at me again, I see the uncertainty in her eyes. The fire from minutes ago is gone, and the only things left are the vulnerability and unease emanating from her. It's the same look she had on New Year's Eve. I've noticed it before, and I've always wondered why. Why someone so beautiful, smart, and loved by so many people would always have this air of loneliness. But I think I finally got my answer tonight. Don't act like I don't see you, Mel. Since the first time I laid eyes on you, I saw you. Not just the beautiful face, but what's underneath. The stuff you try to hide from the rest of the world. I see it all. And I want it all. She clears her throat grabbing the strings of her hoodie. She looks away without responding to me. You can stay here. You can stay forever. But nothing in life is free. She sighs, but she straightens her spine, and I watch, transfixed as her fire returns. <sighs> of course, she says, almost as if she's disappointed by my words. How much... And remember, I know how much your rent is, so don't try and take advantage of me. A laugh escapes, but my wife doesn't laugh along with me. <laughs> no amount of money can buy it. Her eyes narrow. Can't buy what, exactly? Everyone has their price, Adam. Name yours. I want you to be my wife. She opens her mouth to argue, but I put my fingers to her soft lips. And I don't mean only when your mother is around. I want you to give being married to me a real chance. Because let's face it, despite what you told your brother and Alex, the two of us know the truth about what really happened in Las Vegas. She puts a palm in my face and gives me her back, but she doesn't deny my words. Here's what I want, I tell her. I want you to wear your ring. You will move in here fully. 
you will contact the post office and have your address changed. And yes, Mel, I know the only change is the apartment number, but I don't care. And last but not least, you will take my last name. She stops breathing when I finish talking. She turns around slowly, shoves at my chest, and when I don't budge, she does it again and again. Of course you take advantage. No way. She grabs her suitcase and starts to walk away. I'll go stay in a hotel until I get a place. Fine. I take a dramatic seat on my sofa. She eyes me warily. When are you going to tell your mother you got drunk, married me, and flew back to Boston before I woke up? You were drunk, right? Isn't that the story you're telling everyone? That stops her in her tracks. She drops the suitcase again, and I expel a breath of relief. Or you can piss her off by being married to the guy she obviously dislikes. The guy that's not your type, according to her. One year, Mel. I'm asking you to be my wife for one year. She assesses me, but she doesn't make any more attempts to leave. In fact, she unzips the hoodie, revealing a body-hugging crop top that shows just a sliver of brown, smooth skin. I hold my breath while I wait for her next move. Or, she says, we can fight for it. Trial by combat. She raises both hands and starts to stretch. Her top rides up and I get a view of her bare stomach. Trial by combat. Like in the Game of Thrones, I ask, just a little bit confused by the rapid change of subject. Just like that, except not to the death. We fight it out. When I win, you let me stay here. You get the couch and play the doting husband only when my mother is around, until I move out of here and annul this sham of a marriage. What about if I win? I cross my arms over my chest, amused by the very idea. You won't. You know I was training to be a professional boxer a few years ago, right? She shrugs and waves me off as if my years in the boxing ring mean absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah. Boxing is fake, and you probably weren't that good since you're obviously not a professional boxer. Before I can remind her that she must be thinking about wrestling, she speaks again. That crap is all choreographed. I'm talking about more of a cage match where anything goes... And Adam, I hope you agree, because I really want to kick your ass for the hell you put me through in Vegas. I'm going to gouge out your eyes and scratch your face. You won't be so pretty when I leave a few scars on that mug of yours. She cracks her knuckles and starts to squat before doing a series of high knee jumps. Okay, then. Tell you what. If you can land a single hit, you win. But you have to land that hit before I can grab you. She starts to do some high kicks. When she does the boxer shuffle, I arch my eyebrows and hold my tongue. No need to tell her that her form is wrong or that she's locking her elbows when she punches. Not necessary, but I want to add one more thing. You don't have to wait for the year to be up when you decide you want out. Just give me enough time to find a place. Done, I tell her as soon as the words are out of her mouth. Come on, she says. I've been in a lot of fights in my life. I bet you've only ever fought in the ring. This boy groped me in the tenth grade, and I kicked his ass. I know I can take you. Yeah, of course you can. Tenth graders and professional boxers are virtually the same. She snorts, takes a fighting stance, and starts throwing punches, locking her elbows again. Aren't you going to stretch? Now. It's my turn to snort. <laughs> I think I'll be okay. So, do you agree to my terms? I agree to yours. You land just one hit, and you can run this apartment. I'll even make you breakfast every morning. And my laundry. I hate doing it. Deal. But remember what I want. Whatever. I'm not worried about it. 8. Melly. I throw a few more air punches before I start to do my boxer shuffle. He's standing there, smugly smirking at me. I knew all along he'd make a ridiculous offer, and no way would he ever hurt me. I know that for a fact, but if I can hide out here while my mother's in town, that won't be too bad. All I have to do is land one kick or punch. Hell, all I need is to touch him before he can grab me. 
To distract him, I start to do a series of fake coughs and wait for him to approach and play hero. Right on cue, he walks towards me, probably to make sure I'm not choking. I lunge at him, but before my fist can make contact, he snatches my arm and twists me around. In just the blink of an eye, I'm being cradled in his arms, my back to his broad chest. He's holding both of my arms, and as much as I try, I can't seem to move an inch. I take a deep breath, and with all the strength I have, I try to break his hold, but Adam manages to restrain me with hardly any effort. I try to kick behind me, but he presses himself closer, rendering me completely immobile. I'd have to be dead not to feel his hard expanse of a chest on my back or what feels like a semi-hard dick pressed on my ass. Fight's over, Mel. The feel of his breath so close to my ear is like a switch. I stop all attempts of freeing myself. Oi, win, he says. He pulls me further into his broad body. Two out of three, I pant. That wasn't the agreement. Negotiations are over. You had to hit me before I could grab you, and despite your very blatant attempt at cheating, I still won, and you are going to be my wife in every way. He finally releases my hands, and I stumble before turning around to face him. We both stand there, chests heaving, and my feet rooted to my spot. His hands return, but they travel down my sides until he reaches my hips and grabs them, spins me around, and pushes me back into him, right on his very hard dick. For two years, Melanie, two fucking years, I've been walking around with a hard-on for you. The words are low, husky. Goosebumps spread throughout my body, and I feel the flushing of my skin, my nipples pebble, and when he grinds into me just a tiny bit, I let out a soft moan at the warm sensation that spreads across my entire body. Those same large hands finally leave my hips, but they find their way underneath the hem of my crop top and slowly caress my skin. His hands are rough, a complete contrast to my soft skin. Is that why you took advantage of me when you did? Because of your heart on? I ask him in an attempt to break the spell he's just cast on me. My plan backfires. He moves closer. He lowers his head and traces his lips against my neck. My body betrays me, and I move my head, giving him more access. You drive me fucking crazy. Do you know that? Despite your delusions. I still want you. You want to be my victim, Mel? If being my victim is the only way I can have you, I'll gladly let you play the part. He wraps an arm around my waist, keeping me in place, but his other hand continues its journey north. When he reaches my bra, he traces a finger underneath it, but makes no move to cut my breast. Tell me to stop, and I will. His mouth lands on my ear, and I shudder. I tell myself that it's because my ears are sensitive, not because of anything else, but the dampness between my legs says otherwise. Tell me to stop. His words are like a challenge. It's as if he knows I don't want him to stop. No words leave my mouth, and that hand finds its way underneath my bra, cupping my small breasts. He kisses the side of my neck, sucking on the skin right above my shoulder blade. I throw my head back, losing myself completely to the sweet sensations. The hand leaves my breast, and I let out a groan in protest, but it travels south this time, cupping my pussy over my yoga pants. He rubs me, and I open my legs wider for him, screaming in my mind for him to really touch me there with no barrier. Turn around, he roughly commands, right as he removes his hand from my greedy pussy. He also drops the possessive arm he had around my waist. I turn and look right into his blue eyes. His chest is heaving and his nostrils are flared. 
Even his hair is sticking up on all sides. My eyes travel down his body, and I let out a loud moan at the sight of the bulge in his sweatpants. Your move, he says, his voice strained. He lifts a hand, and my heart rate picks up in anticipation of him touching me, but all he does is run a hand through his hair. Your move, he says again. The words come out croaked, almost as if he has to dig deep to find some kind of control. His breathing is still erratic, and the bulge has gotten bigger. I lick my lips at the thought of touching it, or doing more to it. I can feel my own pulse, and I know if I touch myself right now, I would be slick with need. My nipples are like two little rocks inside my bra, and my heart rate is nowhere near calm. He's your husband, Melly, the little devil on my shoulder says. It's not as if I haven't been thinking about him since the day I laid eyes on him. I was obsessed with him the second I heard his voice that day in the stairwell. That hint of an Irish brogue was so damn sexy. And when I finally saw him working out in the backyard for the first time, I couldn't look away even if I wanted to. Tall, broad, and imposing. I was drawn to him immediately, but there was no way I was going to get involved with my brother's tenant, especially when he only lives one floor up. Besides, I'm positive this won't last. He'll lose interest and move on. That's for another day, though. Tonight, it's just me and him. Me and my husband. My very handsome husband. With a big package. My body is eager for it. For him. It's been too long since I've been with a man, and the last time was so unimpressive that I've regretted it since. He's still standing before me, chest heaving, breath coming in pants, dick still hard. The night of our quick wedding flashes through my mind. We're holding hands and running through the Vegas streets, laughing like a real couple in love. This is real, Mel. I'm never letting you go. The memory from a few nights ago flashes through my mind. I remember not believing him when he said it. So... I do the only thing I can do. I jump into his arms and wrap my legs around him. He catches me and doesn't so much as waver in surprise at my sudden assault. I look down into his eyes, both of us now panting as if we just ran a marathon. Before I can talk myself out of it, I crash my mouth on his and sigh in relief. He kisses me back just as desperately, just as greedily, his hands cut my ass, and he walks backwards to the rear of the apartment. He kicks a door open so hard it hits the wall, and I know there will be damage there, but neither one of us cares about that right now. His mouth never leaves mine. In fact, he devours me, drinking me in as if he can never get enough. He ends the kiss abruptly, and I bounce on his messy bed. I don't give myself time to think— I don't try to talk myself out of this and run out the front door, downstairs and away from this apartment and my new husband. No, instead, I peel off my shirt while he takes off my shoes and throws them to the far corners of the room. My yoga pants and the underwear are off in one swoop. By the time he tosses them somewhere, I've removed my bra. He looms over me, his eyes darker than I've ever seen. He lets out a sound like a growl and a moan. Whatever it is, it makes me feel wanted, powerful, like a goddess who's about to be worshipped. I reach for his shirt and pull it over his head. I've seen him shirtless many times. Every time he works out in the backyard before work, I make it a point to look. From beginning to end, I watch him work this body, but there is nothing like seeing it up close. His skin isn't flawless. He has scars, one ugly one right by his shoulder. Unable to stop myself, I reach for it and run my fingers over the roughened skin. 
He closes his eyes and exhales, as if my touch means more to him than the air he breathes. But I don't stop there. I glide that same hand down his body, across his torso, and marvel at his rock-hard stomach. Looking at it is nothing like the glory of touching it. I reach his waist, and my hands hang right above the elastic waist of his sweatpants. Too far gone, I push them down, and he kicks them off. Holy fuck, I say, when I get a look at what he was hiding in those pants. It's longer and thicker than any dick I've ever been acquainted with. The head is thick, and when I stroke the smooth tip, pre-cum coats my fingertips. He's usually unflappable, but the touch of my hand on his dick makes his entire body shudder. I look into his eyes, and something feral flashes. He pulls me down on the bed, crashes on top of me, and kisses me savagely. He sucks on my lower lip right before he sticks his tongue in my mouth again. I lay back, legs spread, and he covers my body with his. I touch him everywhere, his broad back, his taut ass, his hard, tapered waist. Thoughts of turning us over so I can bite his ass flood my mind. While my hands explore his body, his mouth explores my neck, collarbone, and the top of my breasts. Like a cheap slut, I spread my legs wider, wanting and needing more of him. I can feel the dampness between my legs, and all I want now is to feel his hands or his dick in my pussy. Adam, I whisper, unsure of what I'm asking for. He doesn't answer. Maybe he can't. When his hot mouth finally closes around a nipple, I close my eyes and sink further into the bed. I grind underneath him, needing more, but he's not ready to give me what I want. He laves my nipples, biting, sucking, and pulling them into his mouth. He kisses his way down, past my stomach to my neediest part. He spreads my lips apart, and I hear another groan from him. His hot tongue runs across my clit, and the surprise movement almost makes me jump off the bed. I always knew you would taste this good, he says. He kneels in front of me, and I look down to catch him looking at my spread pussy. But if I do what I've been fantasizing about for two years, and eat your pussy before I sink into you, or it won't last. He offers me his hand. I reach for it, and he roughly lifts me and turns me around to face the headboard. He grabs my hips, those rough hands holding me in place, not giving me the ability to move. Not that I would. Not that I want to. He's gentle when he positions me on all fours. You taste like my downfall. His tongue trails the side of my neck until he glides his big cock along my folds. I can feel how slick we are together. I reach behind me and feel the top of his dick coated with my wetness. When I move my hand, I turn around and catch his eye before I put my fingers in my mouth, tasting our mixture. He smirks at me, as if he can read my mind and knows all my secrets. He's right. This does taste like my downfall, like my point of no return. He swirls his dick around my entrance, but he doesn't give me what I want, at least not yet. I should keep this from you, Mel. He puts the tip inside, and I let out a groan of frustration. I arch my back and try to push back and take him all in, but he anticipates my move. His large hand lands on my lower back and keeps me in place, preventing me from getting what I want. I don't think you deserve this. He lowers his chest to my back. I can feel his dick. It's so close. Just a little bit lower and one push, he'd be home. But he refuses to cooperate. Beg me for it. His warm breath caresses my sensitive ear. Beg me, he commands in a husky whisper. I bite my bottom lip to stop myself from screaming. I reach behind me and grab his cock, preventing him from moving it away, 
but I only have a chance to jerk it twice before he moves away from me. He slaps my ass hard, surprising me. You're a greedy little thing, aren't you, Mel? My greedy little wife. He takes that dick and swirls it at my entrance again. I let out a squeal. He gives me another inch and abruptly pulls out. Please. The one word comes out like a croak, and he slams into me so fast and hard that I almost fall over, but he grabs my hips and pulls me back just in time. He slaps my ass hard again, but he doesn't move his hand after the hit. He holds on to my ass cheek, squeezing it so hard I know I'll have his handprint on me, but I don't have much time to think about that. He pulls out and pushes himself into me again, stretching me. His hand finally leaves my ass and snakes its way to my pussy. I groan like a greedy whore when he strokes my clit with his thick fingers. He plays with my clit and fucks me from behind. I turn to look at his face, and his eyes are closed tight, his teeth bared and his breathing erratic. I throw my head back and give in to the sensation of having my husband inside of me for the first time. His grunts make him sound feral, and the way he's driving into me makes me feel wanted like never before. I close my eyes and softly whisper his name while he fucks me. He slaps my pussy, and the sudden assault pushes me over the edge. I free fall and feel myself floating above, leaving with zero control of my body or the erotic sounds coming out of my mouth. But Adam isn't done, at least not yet. He wraps his arm around my ponytail, pulling my head back, and he drives into me harder with deeper strokes. He pulls me into his chest, lets go of my ponytail, and wraps a muscled arm around me, cupping a breast. The thrusts continue until he fucks me into another mind-blowing orgasm. Sweat coats both our bodies. I can feel his corded muscles on my back. He's so tense. I know he's ready to snap. And it doesn't take long. He growls in my ear. It's a deep rumble in his chest, and I can tell he's baring his teeth. He stills and pumps into me one last time, releasing everything he has inside of me. I take it all, my head thrown back like a greedy, needy slut, eager for everything he gives. I fall on my stomach, and my face lands on a pillow that smells like him. My legs spread, and the evidence of what we just did slides out of me. He lays right next to me and pulls me into his arms, and I let him. While we both do our best to catch our breath, he kisses my temple. I lay on my side and he spoons me, his big body covering all of mine. I'll deal with the consequences of our actions tomorrow. Tonight, I'll push everything aside and enjoy having the warm body of a man next to me. Lord knows it's been a while, but he turns me around and looks into my eyes. I can practically hear your thoughts racing, he says. No, you can't. I'm not dealing with this until tomorrow. My stomach growls, reminding me that I haven't eaten since lunch. If by dealing with this you mean moving the rest of your things up here, I agree. We can both deal with it tomorrow. I freeze at his words. Tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll find a place to go stay and figure out the fastest way to get out of this marriage. Even if Adam fights it, he can't force me to stay married to him. It might take longer, but the marriage will eventually end. My stomach rumbles again, and I do my best to extricate myself from Adam's hold, but that gets me nowhere. Um... I'm going to order myself some dinner. The afterglow of what we've just done starts to wane, and all I want now is space. Instead, he moves closer, kisses my cheek, and strokes my ponytail. The movements are slow and tender, and for some unknown reason, tears fill my eyes. Oil get us something. He makes no moves to get up, but he must hear my stomach again because he finally moves away and the bed creaks under his weight. 
He stands tall and glorious. His presence in the large room makes the room feel small, but it's his naked body I can't get enough of. His large dick is already semi-hard again, and I can't help but lick my lips at the sight of it. His washboard abs are so close that I will myself not to reach out and touch them. When he bends down to grab his pants, I get a clear view of his tight ass. His entire backside is a wall of muscle. He's perfectly shaped, like a Greek statue, but with a huge dick. The phone vibrates in his hand, and he curses and says something under his breath that I don't hear. He opens a food delivery app, and while he places our order, I spend the time staring at his face and wonder how a man so handsome and with the perfect body could possibly think he wants someone like me. Food will be here soon. I look up at the ceiling and shake my head. He didn't even bother to ask me what I want. Great, Melanie. Just great. It's like a bucket of ice water was dropped on me. I get out of the bed, walk out of the room, and grab my suitcase. I don't bother to drag it into the room. I open it and find a comfortable pair of sweatpants and matching t-shirt and throw them on. As soon as I'm clothed, there's a loud knock on the door. I tiptoe and look through the peephole, relieved when I see my brother, not my mother, on the other side of the door. Jason stands there, holding two Tupperware bowls full of food. He steps inside and hands me the bowls. You don't have to stay here, Melly. Come back home, he says. She is home. Adam walks out of the room, still shirtless, but thankfully has put his pants back on. He walks to the laundry room on the other side of the house, and I watch as he rummages through a laundry basket and finds a new shirt. All too soon, his delicious body is covered. Flynn, stay out of this, Jason warns Adam. This is between me and my sister. Your sister happens to be my wife, he reminds us. Except she doesn't want to be, Jason reminds him. Jason, stop, I say to him. I'm not going back downstairs as long as our mother is there. That would not be healthy for me, and I'm all about my mental health. You of all people should understand that. He holds both hands up in surrender and says, I get that. You know I support that, but I don't want you to feel like I'm putting you out of your home. I meant it when I asked you to come and live with me. Adam stands to the side, listening to every word, but thankfully doesn't comment. I grab Jason's hands and we both sit at the table. I know, Jason, you don't ever have to explain. You let me live with you and your wife, for goodness sakes. I know you meant it, okay? But I cannot share the same space as her. Listen, it's time I move out anyway, but just not before Alex has the baby. I can afford it, and I won't go far. I might even be able to afford a small house before this neighborhood gentrifies completely. I've saved a bunch of money in the past two years since I've lived here. He nods, but there's no joy on his face. My brother is usually playful and always extremely loud. I'm not used to the somber person sitting in front of me right now. I have some things to tell you. He lets out a deep breath and runs a hand over his face. Suddenly, he looks tired. What is it? I ask, panicked. Are Alex and the baby okay? For the first time since he got here, he smiles, and I slump in relief. They're fine. The news isn't about them. It's about Mom. What about her? I ask, waving a hand in dismissal. Jason looks around the room and finds Adam leaning against the wall with his arms crossed. Can we have some privacy, Flynn? My apartment and my wife, Adam says. I flare my nostrils and look at him. Our eyes lock and I tilt my head to the side, signaling for him to leave, but he maintains his position against the wall. It's fine, Jason. Just say it, I say, not wanting another confrontation between my brother and Adam right now. Jason takes a resigned breath. So you know how she asked to stay? I nod. 
well, it's more of a need than a want. I raise my eyebrows, totally confused. She's broke, Melly. She needs help. Taken aback by his words, I stand up and look down at him. I can feel my brows furrowing as I try to make sense of what he just said. What do you mean she's broke? She has a pension. Our mother worked as a librarian for the Paramus, New Jersey Public Schools for over 30 years until she was forced to retire due to budget cuts. And Dad let her have the house in the divorce. She'll be fine again when she sells it. That's the thing. The pension is all she has to live on. I don't have all the details yet, but she lost the house. It's gone. She has nowhere to go, Jason says. I shake my head at him, his words not making any sense. Our mother, the most judgmental human being ever when it comes to me, has screwed up her life and is here now asking her son for a handout. I can't help the chuckle that escapes, but I stop at just one. I'd wish her all the financial success if it meant she'd pack her bags and go back to New Jersey or where the fuck ever. Wow, so she's totally fucked. The irony isn't lost on me here, I say to Jason. She can always get herself a job. She's only 58. She is. I'm going to help her. Jake's mother knows a lot of people and serves on a lot of boards. Jake is my brother's best friend from college. He and his wife spend a lot of time with Jason and Alex. I guess that means she's moving here for good. I'm not blind to how selfish that sounds. I know she's in trouble, but I still remember her reaction when I was in trouble three years ago. She made it a point to bring it up every time I saw her until I had enough and told her to shut up. Jason and my father are the ones who were there for me. I don't believe my mother wanted anything bad to happen to me, but when the events took place, her words and reactions still hurt. Now she's here desperate for her son's help. I chuckle again. Jason doesn't answer. The exhausted look in his eyes say everything. I nod and say, I'll come and get the rest of my stuff tomorrow. In the meantime, I don't want her sleeping in my room. He nods, and to show him I have no hard feelings, I lean in and hug him. He hugs me back, and I can feel his relief when he sags against me. I would never, ever put you out. I'm giving her a unit in my new building. It's close by, and it's being renovated. Yeah, but it won't be ready until spring, possibly summer. He sighs sadly again. Don't worry about me. I'm a big girl. She's the one who needs you now. A sudden knock brings me to my feet. I stare at the door and back at Adam. He nods at me and answers it. She went to bed early. Don't worry about her coming up here tonight, Jason says. But I brought you food. He points to the Tupperware. Alex packed some for you too, Flynn. Told her not to bother, but she did it anyway. Jason doesn't look at Adam when he makes that dig. Yeah, thanks, Adam says, after taking a bag of food from the delivery men. We got it from here. He holds the door open and gestures for Jason to get out. Jason walks over, but not through the door. He stands in front of Adam, sizing him up. Adam doesn't flinch. In fact, I think he takes pleasure in looking down at my brother. I own this fucking house, Flynn, and I can't wait to kick you out when your lease is up. Step out of line once, and you're gone. Too bad I have another ten months on my lease. If you will excuse us, Dupree, I want to be alone with my wife. Will you stop with that wife bullshit, Flynn? She doesn't want to be married to you. You get that, right? Melly, Jason says, turning to me. Get a lawyer, and I'll pay for it. You don't have to worry about paying anything for my wife. I've got it from here. Worry about your own wife, and I guess your mommy now. Jason bristles at Adam's retort. On his way out the door, he intentionally bumps into him. Any other man would have taken a step back from the impact, but Adam doesn't budge. Once Jason is gone, he slams the door shut.
Nine. Adam. I'd never hit him, but it would be nice to do it just once and knock him on his ass. I close the door and walk to the kitchen. Melly stands there, her arms wrapped around herself. I've imagined spreading her legs and sinking into her hundreds of times, but my imagination failed in comparison to the reality. I could have never imagined how it felt to be inside of her, or to hold her in my arms. But I have a year to do that, and make sure she doesn't want to ever leave. But the way she grabs the Tupperware bowls and walks to the microwave tells me I have my work cut out for me. I told you I bought you dinner. We can eat that tomorrow. She ignores me, opens the bowl, and smells whatever is inside. She immediately closes it, opens the fridge, and puts it away. She slams the fridge door shut, sits at the table, and reaches inside the plastic bag. I'm only eating whatever this is because I'm hungry. You didn't even have the courtesy to ask me what I wanted. Let me know how much you spent on my meal so I can pay you back. I look to the ceiling and ask God for the patience to deal with my wife. I grab a chair, albeit a little too forcefully, and join her at the table. I see the surprise on her face when she opens the styrofoam box. The food is from a local place I know she loves. I got her favorite meal. Lamb kebabs, rice, and a side salad. She eyeballs my plate and looks into my eyes. I shove a fork full of food in my mouth, but I hold her stare. Thank you, she says almost as if the words hurt. As soon as they're out of her mouth, she stuffs her own mouth with food. I smile, and we eat in complete silence. She eats everything and eyes my plate, which unfortunately for her is empty. I get up and clear the table, shoving the empty food containers down the full trash can. When I look up, Mel's looking around my apartment. At all the time I've lived here, she's only been in here once. Even though the place has high-end appliances, cabinets, and granite countertops, I'm suddenly self-conscious of my furniture and decor. I mentally kick myself for not taking my mother up on her offer to help me make the place decent. The brown couch has seen better days, and so has the scratched and dented coffee table. The only decent furniture I have outside of my bedroom is the kitchen table and chairs. Now that's only because my mother forced me to buy it. Your place is an eyesore, she says. She stands up, walks down the hall, and opens all the doors. I made the second bedroom a gym, and the third is filled with boxes of things I never bother to unpack. There's only one bathroom in this unit, and thankfully, I keep that pretty clean. Can I keep some of my clothes in the room you turned into a gym? The closet is empty, and can I use the gym to work out in? You can do whatever the hell you want. Paint, redecorate, work out. What the fuck ever, as long as you stay. I will. Your taste is horrible. Everything you own is ugly. Except you, I say. Her head snaps up and her eyes immediately darken. She takes slow steps and points a finger at my chest. You don't own me. My only response is a slow smile. She rolls her eyes and mutters something under her breath. Whatever, Adam, she says. It's been a long day and I'm exhausted. I'm going to brush my teeth and go to bed. And I'll deal with this place tomorrow. Thanks again for dinner. She grabs her suitcase and takes it to my bedroom. Seconds later, she goes into the bathroom across the hall. It's barely nine o'clock, but knowing Mel will be alone in my bedroom has me running behind her. The room is still empty when I get there, but she walks in soon after. She looks a little defeated, but she shrugs and makes the bed before getting in. She must find the sheets acceptable because she doesn't say anything after running her hands over them. Once she's situated on the bed, she faces the wall, giving me her back. I remove every stitch of clothing from my body and walk around the room to shut off the light. When I turn back around, she's looking at my dick, which is now pointing directly at her. I climb over her, and when I slide my naked body between the cool sheets, I pull her over. I kiss her into submission before she can offer any protest, as she kisses me right back and throws a leg around me. Soon, I have her naked, her cool skin touching mine. I took her like an animal before. I just couldn't wait to have her. Now, I can take my time, eat her pussy, 
and search every part of her body while I make sweet love to her. 10. Adam Like clockwork, my phone goes off at exactly 6.15, just like it has every morning for the past few months. And that's not because of an alarm. I don't need an alarm. But that New York number serves as one just the same. They must know I'm not going to answer the phone or reply to their messages. Get a fucking clue? I'm not interested. In fact, I don't answer any strange numbers anymore. That's how she got to me the first time. It was a New York number I didn't recognize, but for some reason I answered that day. I'm not going to make that mistake again. I silence the phone just as Millie starts to stir. She ended up collapsing on top of me after making love two more times. She's as insatiable as I am. Even now her nipples are pebbling in the open air, and I ache to reach over and touch them. So I do. She moans, her eyes flutter open, and she stares directly into mine. I reach for her, but she swats my hand away, hops out of bed, and runs out of the room. I groan. Of course, I worried with a harsh light of day she'd regret what happened between us. The shower turns on, signaling she's not coming back to bed. I haul myself from under the covers just as my phone starts to vibrate again. Of course, it's the other New York phone number. It's like they take turns calling me. I hit ignore and look at the weather on my phone instead. Afterwards, I put on a pair of sweatpants and walk into the bathroom. The room is white with steam and the sound of Mel's off-key humming makes me smile. My hair is sticking out on all sides and I'm exhausted from our night together. But I wouldn't change a single thing about last night or how she got here. The water turns off and I hear the scraping of the shower curtain against the metal rod. When she sees me, she lets out a little scream and puts a hand to her chest. What the hell, Adam? I point to the toothbrush in my mouth with one hand and hand her a towel with the other. She wraps herself fully, as if I didn't spend hours exploring her naked body last night. She steps out of the tub and out of the bathroom without another word. I guess I know how today is going to go. I give her a few minutes alone and hop in the shower. By the time I get out, she's dressed in gray dress pants and a purple button-down shirt. What are you doing? I intentionally remove the towel from around my waist, and just as I expected, her eyes immediately find my dick. She visibly swallows at the sight of it getting bigger, then clears her throat and looks away. As she starts to put a hand on her matching gray jacket, she says, Getting ready for work? She runs a hand through her hair, and her rings get caught in the strands. I slid them back on her finger last night after she fell asleep. Is this real? She asks as she inspects the engagement ring. She holds it up to the light before taking it off her finger. She rubs it on her shirt as if that would tell her anything. I'd never give you a fake diamond. And have you checked outside? We got 12 inches of snow last night, and they're predicting another 12. School's canceled. I think you'll be working from home today. She stares at me as if my words don't make sense. I take her hand and slide the ring back on her finger just like I did last night. She snatches her hand from mine and stomps to the window. Just like I told her, it's whiteout conditions outside as the snow continues to fall. A gust of wind hits, pushing flurries against the window. She closes the blinds and lets out a string of curse words. Fuck, fuck, fuckity fuck. My work laptop is downstairs. She pulls out a pair of purple fuzzy slippers from her suitcase and slides them on her feet. I can get it for you, I offer. So you and Jason can get into a fight? No thanks, I'll go. Before I can argue or put on clothes, she's out of the bedroom and out of the apartment. While she's gone, I dress and go to the kitchen to start breakfast. While the bacon is frying, she comes back up with a computer bag slung over her shoulder and a duffel bag stuffed to the brim. She drops the duffel on the floor and arranges her laptop on the table. How can you afford this? I turn to her. Unsure of what she's talking about, but she holds up her left hand and points at the ring. I do have a job, Mel. Yeah, but you're a vice principal at a junior high school. I'm pretty sure I make more money than you, and there's no way I can afford this. Her eyes bore into mine, and it's as if she's trying to read my mind. 
I sigh. This is just another wall. She's been putting them up since she got out of bed this morning. <sighs> you think you make more than me as a claims adjuster, I ask. Claims manager, she clarifies. I got a promotion and a big raise two months ago. I smile at her. Yeah, you sure did. But I'm more than capable of getting my wife a ring. She mumbles something under her breath while she types on her computer. After asking for my Wi-Fi password, she holds up her hand. So it's fake, then, she mumbles. Have it appraised. I'm going to need keys, she tells me. Unless you've changed your mind. I told you I'm not holding you to this for a year. You're free to say enough at any time. I turn off the fire under the bacon and walk out of the kitchen. When I return, I put the key to the apartment in her hand. I pour her a cup of coffee and bring her cream, just as she likes it. I set the cup down with a thud and she jumps in surprise, her big eyes locking with mine. I lean down and kiss her and I'm slightly surprised when she doesn't pull away. She opens her mouth to me and slides her hands in my still damp hair, moaning into my mouth, and I deepen the kiss. When my phone rings, though, she practically jumps away from me. I pull it out, ready to decline the New York call, but a smile spreads across my face when I see Ma flash across my screen. Hey, Ma, I say, smiling into the phone. My son, her Irish brogue, though not as thick as it once was, is still thick enough. I missed you last Sunday. How was Vegas? Las Vegas was great. It was better than I ever could have expected. I stare at my wife when I utter those words, but she's doing everything she can to avoid looking at me. I know she hears me, though, because her body goes still. I have a big surprise for you when I see you on Sunday. You'll love it. I hope you didn't spend too much money on your old ma, she says. She starts to say something else, but she quickly ends the call when her older brother, my Uncle Finn, starts yelling her name. Once I put the phone down, Melly walks to the bedroom without a word and slams the door. I shake my head and decide to give her five minutes to come back out. In the meantime, I cook her eggs the way she prefers them, over hard. She returns, dressed in black yoga pants and a gray hoodie. So, we should get a few things straight. I arch an eyebrow at her serious tone. I put a plate of bacon and eggs in front of her and take a seat. I start eating while I wait for her to begin. I will pay you rent. Tell me how much. And you'll only need to be the doting mate when my mother is around. I can easily afford this place, and I am the doting husband. Whether your mother's around or not. And... I'll take you up on your offer to redecorate this place because it's hideous. Your taste sucks. She looks around with a pinched expression. And I'll buy my own groceries. Sure, my taste in decorations can be better, but my taste in wives, perfect. Another thing, you're treating me like a roommate. I can already feel the color creeping up my face. We're married. And by the way, I'm on birth control. Thanks for making sure before you jizzed inside of me three times last night. Like I said, we're married. I give her a dismissive shrug. Only for a year, she reminds me. At the absolute most, so don't try to trap me with a baby. Any other decrees, Mel? Yeah, your Wi-Fi is down. Fix it. She slams the laptop shut, runs out of the kitchen and into the bedroom, slamming the door behind her for the second time today. She didn't touch her breakfast, so I finish her food and my coffee before going to find her. She's lying in the middle of the bed with her face buried in a pillow. Leave me alone, she says, her voice muffled. I sit down and put a hand in the middle of her back. Her body goes rigid at my touch, but she doesn't push me away. Mel, I slowly rub her back. I said leave me alone. I can't leave you alone. I live here. Fine. She roughly shoves my hand away and gets up. I'll leave. She grabs her open suitcase and all her clothes fall to the floor. She drags the damn thing out of the room while her clothes spill out along the way. Where are you going? I follow behind her. We're in the middle of a blizzard. Great. Just another thing I've fucked up. She drops the suitcase and kicks it across the room with so much force it slams against the wall. I can't do this, Adam. I can't. You got what you wanted out of me last night. You finally got to fuck me. Three times, I might add. That should be enough for you. 
When she starts to pull the ring off, I hold both her wrists. Mel, you don't control the weather. And where are you going? You said you can't live with your mother, and we're in the middle of a snowstorm. The tears start, and that's my undoing. I can never stand a crying woman, especially not one I care about, and one who looks so defeated right now. I pull her close and wrap my arms around her. She buries her face in my chest and cries. Something inside me breaks at the sound of her sobs, but I don't let her go or offer any words of comfort. She doesn't need words right now. She needs me. I keep her wrapped in my arms and rub her back until the sobbing stops. When no more sounds come out of her, I pull back and cradle her face. Why do you say stuff like that about yourself? How can you accuse me of only wanting one night with you? I said until death do us part. And this woman standing before me is not a fuck-up. Not in a million years. Maybe you've made mistakes, Mel. But we all have. I pull her into my arms again. Give this a year. I'll be a good husband. If you want, we can move. I'll break the damn lease and we can go somewhere else. But let me be your husband. I'll be the one you can always count on without any judgment. I don't want to become your problem. This was supposed to be my year, Adam. I had it all planned. I was going to start looking for a house in the spring and hopefully move out by the end of summer. But I fucked everything up like I usually do, and now you're involved in my mess. She lets out a choked sob and buries her face in my chest again. I promise you didn't screw anything up. I want to be married to you. That gets her to sob louder. She pulls away and I look into her face. Tears are streaming down her cheeks and her eyes are red and puffy. It breaks me to see her this way. It breaks me that she can't see what I see when I look at her. You don't know what you're saying, she says between sniffles. Come on. I scoop her in my arms and walk back to the bedroom. I gently put her down and lie down next to her. She already has her body turned, giving me her back. I cover us with a comforter and wrap my arms around her waist. She turns, and I wait for her to pull away and get off the bed. But she surprises me when she rests her head on my chest. I'm sorry, she finally says. I'm usually not a blubbering mess. I caress her cheek and rub my thumbs along her bottom lip. She licks where my fingers just touched. Why don't you see yourself the way I do? I ask. She looks down, seemingly embarrassed by my probing eyes. You don't see how beautiful you are, and how smart and resilient. And everyone who knows you loves you. Your brother and his wife, your little niece, the people you work with. How they promoted you. Yet, you let whatever mistakes you've made in your past define you. Why? Whatever you've done, it doesn't matter now. All that matters is that you're here with me. A fat tear rolls out of her eyes and I reach over and kiss her. She still tastes of coffee and sugar. I let out a satisfied groan when she deepens the kiss. One of her soft hands finds its way up my t-shirt and she strokes my lower abs. I make them flex and she moans in my mouth. Her hand finds the waistband of my shorts and without any shyness, she reaches in and touches me. This time, it's me who moans, but this isn't about me. This is for my wife. I move her hand and straddle her. When I reach for the hem of her shirt, she lifts her arms and I take it off. Her breasts are bare and I kiss down to her belly button. While I explore and bite the soft skin on her stomach, I remove the rest of her clothes. She's beautiful, with perfect brown skin. Even the mole on the side of her stomach is sexy. Her pussy has hair, but it's perfectly trimmed. I was so hungry for her last night, I didn't get a chance to admire and worship her body the way she needs. I kiss her hip bone and lick my way to the apex of her thighs. Her body goes completely still while I look at her. I spread her legs apart and my heart beats faster at the sight of her glistening pussy. 
I run a finger through her wet folds, and she sighs loudly in the room. I position myself between her legs, and her scent beckons me. It's a combination of soap and musk. It's a siren's call, and it's been saying my name since I first laid eyes on her. Hell, since I first heard her voice. I've always known it would be like this between us. From the moment our eyes locked while she was watching me work out of the backyard, I knew she belonged to me. She belongs here, in my bed. Eyes on me, Mel. Her eyes are sealed shut while her chest heaves. Look at me, brown eyes. I kiss the inside of her thigh and she practically jumps off the bed. Come on. I coax again while I swirl my tongue on her smooth, creamy skin. Her eyes pop the second my tongue hits her clit. Adam. She practically swoons. One of her hands finds its way into my hair. I brace myself, waiting for her to tug on it like she did last night. But she surprises me when she caresses my scalp. Goosebumps spread throughout my body, and my dick hardens more. I slide a finger inside her wet pussy and suck her clit. I look up quickly and just like I ordered her to, her eyes are on me. With each moan or change of breath, my dick wants her more. It's just begging to slide inside her warm, hot sheath. But this is for Mel, not me. It doesn't take long for her. Her hands grasp my skull, holding my face to her pussy while she convulses on the bed. The moans stop and her breathing returns to normal. I kiss between her thighs and crawl up the bed. I lay on my back, and before I can pull her into my arms, she reaches into my shorts and grabs my dick. I pull her hand away and wrap her in my arms. That was just for you. I wanted to take care of you for a few minutes. Just relax. The Wi-Fi's out. We're in a blizzard, and you just freaked out. Close your eyes and relax. I've got you. She doesn't fight me. She turns on her side, and I slide an arm around her waist and spoon her back. She fits me just right. Just like I always knew she would. 11. Melly. Mel, he groans. I can hear the sleep in his voice. His hand lands on my head and he gently caresses my hair. Oh, shit, Mel. My tongue swirls on the top of his dick. It's big, round, and the most perfect shade of pink. Eyes on me. I repeat the same words he used on me hours ago. I woke up from our nap in the same position, my back to his front, and I felt the long, hard rod between my naked ass cheeks. Despite his shorts, there was no mistaking how much he needed relief. When my eyes lock with his, I take his long, hard dick and slide it into my waiting mouth. Adam lets out a noise, but the way he grabs and pulls my hair tells me he barely has any control left. I hold his stare as long as I can, but his dick needs all my attention. I bob my head up and down, reveling in the taste and smell of him. Like an uninhibited whore, I take his dick to the back of my throat and gag on it. He moans again and practically falls off the bed. Feeling a sudden power, I take his dick to the back of my throat again, but when I pull out, I bob slowly on his dick while I hold his shaft and pump with one hand. I slurp on the crown, licking and sucking while I stroke his shaft. His hands tighten on my hair, and he starts to talk nonsense. I get no warning before the thick, hot ropes of cum squirt out. I swallow twice to get it all down. I plop his dick out, and it rests on his thigh, flaccid but still big. He strokes my hair while I lay my head on his hip. The clock on the nightstand says it's just shy of noon. My stomach growls while I hear a vibrating phone. The gravity of my situation hits again, and I jump off the bed, run out of the bedroom, and into the bathroom. 
I lean my naked body against the door and cover my face with my hands. I push the panic attack down and take a series of breaths before walking away from the door and splashing cold water on my face. While I pat it dry with a towel, I sit on the toilet and wait for my heart rate to return to normal. I look around the bathroom, take in the ugly brown shower curtain and green floor mats, and I let out a cry of despair. Of all the men in the world, I end up with the one who has the worst taste. Well, at least he's not a pig. The place might be poorly decorated, but it's clean. I wrap the towel around my body and go back to the bedroom. I'm relieved to find it empty. The furniture in this room is the only decent thing he has other than the kitchen tables and chairs. The black wooden furniture looks to be high quality and new. My stomach growls and his phone vibrates again. Curiosity gets the better of me and I pick it up. No name shows on the screen, just a number from New York City. I toss the phone down, but while I pull my clothes from this morning back on, it vibrates again and the same number flashes. I pick up his phone and walk out of the bedroom. I find him in the kitchen, rummaging through the fridge. Did you steal it? I ask him. He stands in front of the open fridge and stares at me. He scratches his messy head of hair and furrows his brows. When I hand him the phone, he puts it in his pocket. Did I steal my phone? He gives me that crooked smile. I bought this phone last week. I think I still have the receipt if you want to see it. He pulls out the two Tupperware bowls Jason brought over last night and puts them on the counter. I meant this ring. I hold it up and it catches the light. But since you brought up your phone, someone from New York is trying to reach you. A flash of something crosses his face. If I didn't know any better, I think it was annoyance. But in all the years I've known him, I've only seen him angry a few times. The night he arrived home from Vegas and realized I was on a date, and yesterday when Jason stopped by. Who is it? I ask. I put my hands on my hips and take a step closer. If you have some crazy bitch of an ex-girlfriend, you better tell me now. He smiles then, a real genuine smile that makes him look younger and his blue eyes sparkle. I feel something in the pit of my stomach. Are you jealous, love? No need to be. I take my vows very seriously. I'm property of Melanie Flynn. He winks at me, and I roll my eyes at him. The name is still Dupree. Speaking of, I need you to start on that name change. No Wi-Fi, I remind him. So how can you afford this? I hold the ring to his face and crane my neck up to look at him. I'm not going to dignify that with a response, he tells me. Are you part of the Irish Mafia? He opens one of the Tupperware containers, smells it, and puts it in the microwave. I'm a vice principal at a junior high. You already know this. Exactly, which means there's no way in hell you can afford this. If it's real, it's more than three carats, and you live like this. I wave my hands around the apartment. Redecorate the damn place, Mel. Get rid of this shit and get new things. I don't care. I scoff, cross my arms, and say, Am I supposed to pay to decorate your place for you? I can deal with this for a year. I look around again, unsure if what I just said is true. He sighs loudly, walks to the bedroom, and returns with his wallet. He grabs my hand and drops an American Express card in it. Get whatever you want. The microwave beeps, and he pulls out the container, when he grabs two plates, I hold up my hand. I don't want that. And how is it you can afford this ring? I put a Ford in air quotes. And you don't have decent furniture. And now you just handed me an American Express. You do know you have to pay the entire balance at once, right? I lay the card down on the table. I am aware of how to pay my own damn credit card. 
You hate my furniture, so buy new shit. Do we have to fight about every damn thing? I didn't steal the ring. I bought it for you. And my apartment looks like this because I'm a guy who lived alone until yesterday. I don't care, but you do, so get whatever you want. And if you don't want this food, I'll make you something else. I get up from the table and walk to Adam. He has his back turned to me. He goes completely still when I stand close to him. I can practically see the hair standing on the back of his neck. Slowly, he turns around, and I hate the fact that he gets to look down at me. Did you just raise your voice at me? I ask, taking a small step closer. I point a finger in his face. He looks down at me, and his eyes darken. He grabs both of my hands and holds them together behind my back. He doesn't exert himself, but the simple gesture is meant to show me how easily he can overpower me. You don't want to do that, Mel. The words aren't angry, but it's a warning. No fingers in my face, love. Not ever. I'm giving you what you want, and you still want to fight me. You think this is what I want? I ask, aghast. He lets me go and grabs a plate from the cabinet above the sink. A quick look reveals none of his plates match. I close my eyes in search of patience. After plating his food, the smell reaches my nose and my stomach growls loudly. He smirks and grabs another plate, this brown one uglier than the purple one he's using. You said I do, didn't you? And you're here. Just sit down and eat for folk's sake. My stomach rumbles again, but instead of sitting down to eat the plate of food he's prepared for me, I open the fridge and look through its contents. It's bare. The only thing other than vegetables and bottled water is a pack of boneless, skinless chicken breasts. You don't have any deli meat? Nothing processed goes in this body. He has the nerve to smile at me before he points to my plate of food again. Or oh, he can order you something, but it might take a while. One quick look outside shows that the snow has not waned. Are you in debt? I ask while pulling out the chair. Reluctantly, I eat the chicken my mother made. I can help you with your finances, help you set up a budget and figure out the best time to pay your bills, we can call the creditors and arrange payment plans for you. All of my bills are paid on time, no debt. When I raise my brows in disbelief, he says, You can run my credit report when the Wi-Fi comes back if you want, Mel. Instead of sitting across from me, he sits right next to me. With no effort at all, he lifts me from my chair and places me on his lap, kissing me deeply before I can move away. The kiss is tender but rough enough to make me remember the passion we shared yesterday and today. I kiss him back just as intensely. When he pulls away, he rests his forehead on mine while he catches his breath. I didn't steal your ring. I'm not in debt. You can redecorate this place however you want. Paint the walls purple or whatever girly color you want, just as long as you come back every day. He kisses my temple, and for a moment, I forget myself and lay my head on his hard chest. For the next ten minutes, we eat our first lunch together as husband and wife. He finishes his, and when I push my plate in front of him, he finishes that, too. Twelve. Adam. By the way, who keeps calling you from that New York number? They called twice. She says it casually, but I can tell she's fishing for information, and I can't give her any. Must have been a wrong number, I tell her. She eyes me, but she doesn't pursue it, and I let out a relieved breath. She leaves my lap and grabs our dishes. While she washes them, I do what I should have done months ago when they started calling. I block both numbers, fully knowing that this is only a temporary solution, but I don't want Mel asking questions. While she cleans the kitchen, I straighten the living room, 
but with the sparse furniture it doesn't take long. I look around my home and see it for the first time. Mel's right. It's awful with the mismatched furniture and bare walls. Once she's done with the dishes, she digs around her laptop bag, pulls out a legal pad and pen, and walks around the apartment taking notes. I lie on the couch, doing my best to pay attention to the TV, but she's distracting. She scribbles on the legal pad as if it's something important. She even opens all the kitchen cabinets and drawers, all the while taking notes. When she disappears to the back of the apartment, I have the impulse to follow her and study everything she does. Every mannerism and expression of her face. I want to know it all, but I remind myself that she's my wife now, and despite the one-year limit we talked about, there's no way I'm going to let her go without one hell of a fight. Just as I relax on the couch, there's a knock on the door. A few seconds later, Alex and Addison walk in. Hi, Ada. Addie, who's always happy to see me, wraps her arms around one of my legs. I pick her up and put her on my back. Can you say Uncle Adam, Addie? I ask. Uncle Ada. How's it going? Alex whispers the words. While she looks around the place, I help her to the couch and she slowly sits down, placing a hand on her round stomach. Good. She's only freaked out twice, I tell Alex. Ada, fight, Addie says. I put her down and she holds up her tiny fists like I trained her to do. When I start to shuffle, she does the same and she mirrors my movements. When she sees an opening, she does the one-two punch combination I taught her. I dramatically fall on the floor and she starts to count. Once she gets to ten, she runs around the room, cheering in victory. Kick his butt again, Addie, Mel says, coming into the room. She runs to Alex and puts both hands on her stomach. Kick your butt. Addie says to me when I stand up. I pick her up and put her on my shoulder this time. How are things downstairs? Melly asks Alex. Fine. She's been great with Addie today. I think she's a bit hurt about the way she found out about you two. She went to her room right after dinner last night and didn't come back out. Though I pretend to be preoccupied with Addie, but I move us closer to Alex and Mel so I can hear every word. She was hurt. She's playing the victim now, is she? as if she has feelings. And we're not exactly close. I don't remember the last time we had a conversation. Even the Christmas gift she sent was an insult. I look to Alex for an explanation. Based on what she says next, I know she understood my look. Jason called her out on that last night. She said she hadn't seen you and didn't realize you lost so much weight. Right, sure. It doesn't matter because... The knock on the door interrupts whatever Mel was going to say next. With Addie still on my shoulder, I walk to the door and find Mrs. Dupree on the other side. She puts a hand to her chest as if she's surprised to see me at my own front door. She looks around me, but she doesn't ask to come in, and I don't offer. Gemma! Addie yells. May I come in, please? She finally asks. Mel, it's your mom. Do you want her to come in? Mrs. Dupree takes a step back when she hears my question. Her brows shoot up and her nostrils flare in irritation. She tries to step around me, but I block the door. This is my son's house. Her eyes narrow at me, and she scrunches her mouth like she just tasted something sour. Both the lease I signed says this is my apartment. She tries to slide by me again, but I stand there and stare down at her. Come, Gamma. Addie waves her grandma inside. Mel walks to the door, and I step aside so she can see her mother. She surprises me when she slides her hand in mine and plasters a smile on her face. Are you going to let me in, Melanie? I've barely seen you since I got here. Mel steps aside and her mother walks over the threshold. This is... She lets the words hang before she says... Cozy? She looks around the place, her nose in the air, probably judging my furniture. For Mel's sake, I wish I had something better. Alex stands up and slowly walks to Mel. I'd offer you something, but Adam's fridge is bare. Unless you want to drink tomato juice. Adam's fridge? Her mother raises one judgmental eyebrow. I know you're not too keen on the healthy stuff, Melly, but why haven't you stocked it with what you like? No time yet, mother. We just got back from Vegas two days ago, Mel says. Alex, I'll have you, Jason, and Addie over soon. 
Mrs. Dupree purses her lips at her daughter's rejection. Enough of this nonsense, Melanie. This pretend marriage all so you can get away from me because I'm such a horrible mother to you? Don't drag your brother into another one of your messes after everything he's done for you. Melanie stiffens. Everything he's done for me? She says, her voice low. Alex reaches for Mel, but Mel puts her hand up. Yes, he took you in, got you a job, and helped you get your life together after you managed to lose your job. He did all of that after the way you've treated him, and you want to pay him back like this. Like what? I ask. Mrs. Dupree looks at me, but she must not think my question is worthy of an answer, because she turns back to Mel and says, This is between me and my daughter. Stay out of it. Your daughter is my wife. I will not stay out of it, especially when you berate her. Diane, why don't we go back downstairs? Alex wrings her hands and approaches her mother-in-law. You said earlier you were tired and needed a nap. What mess is, mother? Jason and I have a great relationship now, but thank you for bringing up the past. You love that, don't you? Especially when I look bad. Melanie, that's not true. Diane raises both hands. I don't know what's wrong with us, but I'm hoping since I'm here now we can work on things. Right, Mel scoffs. Any opportunity for you to remind me what a screw-up I am? No, thank you, Mother. Mel lets go of my hand and walks away, through the living room and into the bedroom, closing the door with a loud slam. I think you need to go, I say to my unwanted guest. And for the record... Jason didn't get Mel a job. Her resume got her an interview, and she got herself the job. Her hard work earned her that promotion. Her eyebrows shoot to her forehead in surprise. She looks and asks, Melly got promoted? Alex nods, but I speak first. She did, but I'm sure you'll find a way to give Jason the credit for that, too. Call first before you come up here. She closes her eyes as if my words hurt, but when she opens them, all I see is anger. Like I said to you before, when it comes to me and my family, stay out of it. I'll see you downstairs, Alex. I have a sudden headache. Be careful walking down the stairs with Addie. She looks at me again, but only briefly before walking out. She slowly closes the door behind her. There's a lot I want to say, but Addie wraps her arms around my neck and hugs me so I swallow my words for now. Alex puts a hand on her stomach, and she closes her eyes. I don't understand, she says. I'd give anything to have my mother back, even for a day. But those two are like oil and water. Is it always like that with them, I ask, and Alex nods. Unfortunately, yes. And I can't say I blame Melly for the state of their relationship, but it's exhausting. Why don't you go home and rest? You can leave Addie here with me and Mel. Come back and get her whenever you want. I need to start clearing the snow anyway. Give me her snowsuit and I'll take her outside with me. I'll see if Mel wants to go. Alex looks up and I can tell she's considering my offer. You don't mind? I'm her Uncle Adam, I say. I help her to the door and let her hold on to my arm until we get to her apartment. I wait in the living room while she gathers some of Addie's things. She comes back with a bag, snowsuit, and boots. When she kisses her daughter goodbye, I leave to go find my wife. She's in the middle of our bed, scrolling through her phone. Auntie, Addison says. I drop her on the bed, and she climbs on top of Mel. Play, snow, she says, bouncing up and down. I toss Addie's things on the bed and sit on the end. You okay? I reach over and massage her shoulder. Thirteen. Melly. I ignore Adam's question and focus on Addison instead. She squeals when I lift her above me. She kicks her little legs and her dark curls hang from her head. Adam reaches over and runs a hand through her hair, making her laugh louder. I bundle her up before putting on my own snow pants and jacket, and we follow Adam outside. He goes right to the detached garage and returns with the snowblower, as long as he's lived here, he's cleared the snow, and I know Jason never asked. I can always count on my car being clear of any snow. 
He always takes care of the yard in the summer, and whenever Jason's father-in-law is not available, Adam will come down to our apartment and do any quick repairs. I've secretly admired him while he fixed a leaky pipe. I still remember the black T-shirt he was wearing that day and how it rode up on him while he was reaching overhead. Now I get to explore that body whenever I want, and since we're going to be married for a year, I'm going to enjoy every second of it. I just need to make sure to keep my feelings separate. I chase Addie around the front lawn while Adam gets to work. The snow hasn't let up at all, and the entire city has turned white. He'll have to come back in a few hours and clear more snow, but he's never minded before. I pick up Addie, spin her around before we both fall to the ground, our laughter barely heard above the whir of the snowblower. While Adam clears the driveway, I build a weird-looking snowman for Addison, and when she demands carrots for the nose, I tell her to follow me inside. I stay with Ada, she yells. She runs to him and wraps an arm around his leg. He stops the snowblower and approaches the snowman. It's lopsided, and the sticks we found for arms are grossly uneven. Adam yanks them out and throws them aside. Your uncle's here now, Addy. I'm going to teach you how to build a real snowman, because Aunt Mel's snowman-making skills suck. Addie jumps up and down right before she kicks the snowman, kicking it to the ground. Adam gives her a high five. Whatever, that was perfect. When they start stomping on the snowman, I stick my tongue out at them and step inside, leaving the freezing temperatures behind for a few minutes. I know for a fact Adam doesn't have any carrots in his fridge. It's filled with Brussels sprouts and broccoli. He's definitely fond of the green veggies. I dip inside the first floor apartment, right through the back door. The living room is dark, quiet, and most importantly, without my mother. Before I grab the carrots, I slowly walk to my room to get buttons for the eyes. I leave water on the hardwood floor, and my boots squeak along the way. My room looks almost the same as it did yesterday. The bed's made, but the opened closet looks almost empty. I open the top drawer to my nightstand. It's where I have my keepsakes. There's a family picture from my high school graduation. It was two weeks after Jason graduated college. We're on opposite sides with our parents in the middle. Everyone but me is smiling. It's been years, but it might as well have been yesterday. I'd fought with him that morning. I told my brother I didn't want him at my graduation, and I'm as ashamed of myself now as I was then. I blew up after breakfast, and to this day, I don't think Jason knows why I said that to him, but I do. Jealousy can make you do and say things you can't take back. I struggled through high school while Jason was valedictorian, and that morning when I was walking to the kitchen, I overheard my mother on the phone with her sister. Ten years ago. We got extra tickets, Bryn, she tells Aunt Brenda. The graduation starts at 1130, so try to be there at 11. I know how you are. Something tells me to stay out of sight and listen. I lean against the wall, careful not to make a sound. Yeah, Jason will be there. I'm so happy I get my baby home for the summer. I've missed him so much. She listens some more. By then, I decide I'm being silly for trying to eavesdrop. This is my graduation day, and the entire family is going to be there for me. But my mother's next words stop my approach. Girl, please. When I did this four years ago, I was the mother of the school valedictorian. I'm actually surprised Melly's graduating on time, but at least we can still celebrate Jason's graduation and Melly finally leaving home. Do you know he graduated with a 4.0? It's so embarrassing telling everyone that my other kid is going to some low rank state college. Can you believe it? She tells Aunt Brenda to hold on and puts the phone on speaker. Melly will be fine, Aunt Brenda says. She doesn't have to be a carbon copy of Jason. She's her own person, Di. Don't worry about my niece. 
I smile against the wall. Aunt Brenda's always got my back, but the forced smile on my face doesn't stop the tears from rolling down my cheeks. From your lips to God's ears, but we're still going to have a good time. At least I have one kid I can be proud of. Diane, don't say something you can't take back. Melanie is as much your child as Jason is. You should have tried to find something she's good at and helped her develop it instead of comparing her to Jason, Aunt Brenda admonishes. You're being unfair. What she's good at is screwing up. Do you want a list? Aunt Brenda says no, but my mother says, Well, I'll give you one anyway. She crashed the car. I had to shell out hundreds of dollars for a math tutor, even though Jason told her he'd tutor her via video. She refused, and she still barely passed math. Jason was the calculus and the organic chemistry tutor at Boston College. Did you know that? Meanwhile, my daughter is always fighting and almost got herself expelled, and the girl had so much attitude she's hard to be around. I can't say a word to her without her sassing me. Jason never did that. Why can't she be more like her brother? My Jason... Maybe you're not so great to be around either, Diane. Do you ever think of that? Do you think Melly enjoys being compared to someone else every time you open your damn mouth to talk to her? Stop comparing your kids. She's her own damn person, and Jason got in plenty of trouble. I don't remember him listening to you when you told him to leave that Natalie alone, my Aunt Barbara says. Natalie is out of the picture. I don't have to worry about her anymore but I can't stand the person Melly is sometimes. My mother ignores what Aunt Brenda said about her precious Jason. Remember, after I had Jason, I said I didn't want any more kids, but my husband wanted one more. I should have stood my ground and told him no. Like a punch in the stomach, my mouth opens, and I let out a rushed breath. I clench my stomach to absorb the blow, but I can't escape the pain. My eyes fill with tears that fall down my face, and I'm too frozen in place to wipe them away. I'm going to say this once more. Shut your damn mouth right now and don't ever utter those words again. I'm ashamed of you. I don't know how you look yourself in the mirror. Aunt Brenda's voice is laced with anger. I'll see you in a few hours. I hear my mother putting the cordless phone down, by then, the tears are flowing freely, and my vision has blurred. I've always suspected, but hearing the words come out of her mouth so easily is like a knife in the gut. I hear footsteps, and I know I should flee so she doesn't see my moment of weakness, but my feet are rooted to the spot. I couldn't move now if my life depended on it. She turns the corner and finds me still leaning against the wall. I can't bother to wipe my tears. She stops short when she sees me. She lets out a noise of surprise and rests a hand to her chest. Melanie, she says, why are you skulking around? She doesn't wait for me to answer. She walks right past me. But after taking several steps, she stops. She doesn't turn around right away. She freezes. And even with her back turned to me, I can see her raise a hand to her forehead. She runs a hand through her hair and slowly turns around. You want me to make you some breakfast? She asks, with a fake smile plastered on her face. She never smiles like that. At least not for me. I don't answer. All the words I want to say get stuck in my throat. She walks closer and stands directly in front of me. I was just talking to Aunt Brenda, she explains quickly. She steps closer, eyeing me. It's almost as if she's trying to read my mind. Something flashes in her eyes. She swallows and gives me a high, fake laugh. <laughs> How about some eggs and French toast? It's your big day, Nellie. She reaches for my cheek, but I flinch and finally find the strength to step away from her. I'm your biggest regret, aren't I, mother? If only I were brilliant like your Jason. 
If only you had stopped having kids after you had him. I say Jason's name with so much contempt, her eyes widen. It breaks your heart to have a daughter like me, but I bet it doesn't hurt as much as it does for me. To have a mother who despises her for committing the awful sin of being inferior to her son. At least that's what I thought until this morning. But maybe you just hate the fact that I exist. She takes a step back at my words. She frantically looks around the room as if someone is going to come out to help her. Melly, that's not true. Whatever you think you heard, you think I'm so stupid that I don't know what I heard? My ears work fine. You know what else works fine? My eyes. The disappointment in yours every time you look at me. It's crystal clear, but hearing the words come out of your mouth? Tears fall freely and trickle to my lips. I lick them away. Wow. I've always suspected, but now I know. Thank you for that, mother. I brush past her, but she grabs my wrist and pulls me back. My mom isn't a tall woman, but she's always been strong. I pull my wrist, but can't break her hold. It was just a silly conversation with my sister. It didn't mean anything. Except it did. It means everything. I yank my wrist hard enough to make her stumble several steps back. She calls my name, but I walk to the front door and out of the house. The sound of a door opening pulls me out of my daydream. I grab what I came for and shove them in my coat pocket. Alex, don't go into the kitchen until I mop the water I dragged in here. I step out of my old bedroom, and instead of looking into Alex's smiling face, I'm looking into the eyes of my mother. 14. Melly. I take a deep breath, but I don't turn away from her. She smiles at me, but I don't smile back. I'm going to mop the water now. Be careful if you need to go into the kitchen. I turn around and walk away. I pull the mop from the small closet behind the pantry and start to mop the water. Melanie, my mother says from behind me. I was hoping we could talk. I mopped the floor with more effort than necessary. I can't remember the last time I was alone with my mother, and even now, I feel uneven, like I'm floating above my body, but not in a good way. After her conversation with my aunt, our relationship has gone only two ways. Either we argue or I ignore her the latter being the case more so since I moved to Boston. I ignore her calls and only do the bare minimum, sending a card on her birthday or signing my name to whatever gift Jason sends for Mother's Day. For years, she doubled down, and any mistakes I made, she'd highlight, almost as if I was proving her point. It used to hurt, but now it's like a stab wound that's healed. The pain is gone, but it's scarred and numb to the touch. I can't talk right now, I say. Addie and Adam are waiting for me. She walks over and opens the blinds. I smile when I see Addie on Adam's shoulders while he runs around the yard in the falling snow. Right, your husband. Listen, whatever this is, she points at Adam. I brace myself and wait for the insult. It's obviously an act. Did you two get drunk and get married? I wouldn't put it past you to put on this act just to get away from me. I'm not buying whatever you're selling. I pause halfway through pushing the mop around on the now dry floor. There's no way Jason told her that, and I know Alex didn't. So I school my features before looking at her again. Why? Because no sober man would want to be with me? And why would I need to pretend to be married to get away from you? That makes no sense. She exhales and breaks eye contact, but she steals her spine and looks at me again. I didn't mean it like that, Melanie. She puts a hand to her forehead as if she's doing her best to calm down. Why do you twist everything I say and make it into an insult? 
I let out a snort and say, I think you know why. I walk past her, put the mop away, and walk to the door. That was a private conversation that I never meant for you to hear. I was venting to my sister. Don't you vent to Jason or Alex? People talk. They say things. It doesn't mean anything. The problem is that I did hear it, and you can't erase it. It's fine. Let's not try to be something we're not. I'm fine with who I am, and if you're not fine with me, that's not my problem. I accept that. It's not my goal in life to become someone you like. I reach for the doorknob, so ready to leave this conversation behind, but she walks fast and grabs my free hand. Other than a few awkward hugs when we're together, I don't remember the last time she touched me. I pull my hand away as if burned. I've made mistakes, Melly. I admit that. I know I've hurt you, and part of the reason why I'm here is to try and fix things between us. I let out a humorless laugh. <laughs> we both know that's not true. Jason told me why you're really here, and it has absolutely nothing to do with me. She looks away as if ashamed, and for a split second, I feel bad for her. I know what it's like to make mistakes. Before things took a turn with the house, I was planning on coming here. I want to be close to my children and grandchildren. There's really nothing for me in New Jersey. I can hear the hopefulness in her voice, but then my mind goes back to the morning of my high school graduation, and I don't know how I can ever recover from that. I don't know why she wants us to recover now. There was never an apology beyond not meaning for me to hear her private conversation, but when your worst fears are confirmed, you can't turn back time. I always suspected that was how she felt about me, but to hear her so callously say those words to her sister is a hole that can never be filled. I'm sure Jason and his family will love having you here. As for you and me, don't bother. There's nothing but silence after my statement. I don't look back. I open the door and walk out. 15. Adam. Again! Addison orders, so I do what any good uncle would do. I run around the yard with her on my shoulders while she sticks out her tongue to taste the snowflakes. I'm distracted because Melly's been inside longer than I thought she would. I run to the back steps, ready to check on her, but she comes out. She has a smile on her face, but I can tell it's fake. She pulls her hand out of her pocket and reveals a handful of buttons. Snowman! Addison yells again, and I put her down. She runs to the middle of the yard and starts to make snowballs. You okay? I ask my wife, taking a step closer to her. She nods but won't meet my eyes. Yeah, she says while trying to step around me, but I step closer to her. I hold on to her chin. I can see sadness in her eyes, but she blinks as if that would remove her sorrow. Did you see your mom in there? I ask, ready to go inside and undo whatever her mother might have said. Yeah, it's fine. It's bound to happen since she lives here now. She starts to walk away, but I hold her wrist. God, I hate that she's here. Let's move. I repeat the same words I said last night and hope she'll agree. That way, you won't have to worry about seeing her every time you step out of here. We can get a house or get another apartment. Whatever you want. Her eyes widen at my words and her mouth opens. I can practically hear her mind spinning. I shouldn't have come on so strong about getting a house so soon. I don't want to involve you in my family drama, Adam, she says. You're my wife, Mel, I remind her. I'm already involved. Temporary wife and wife, I say a little bit more forcefully. And I don't quite have enough saved for a down payment, so I don't want to spend money on a move. Besides, I want to be close by in case Alex needs me. Jason works long hours, and I promised him I would be around to look after her. Your place is about as far as I'm willing to go right now. I nod and mentally kick myself for not realizing that on my own. Of course, she'd want to be here for her brother and Alex. 
It's our place now. I respect that you want to stay close, but Mel, I'm not going to stand around and let her make you feel bad about yourself. That's not happening on my watch. She seems surprised by my words. I mean it. She opens her mouth to respond, but I feel a snowball hit the back of my leg. When I turn around, Addie throws another one at my knee. She tries to run away, but I grab her, and her screams fill the yard. While Addie watches a cartoon in the living room, I clean the kitchen after making us a quick dinner of sautéed chicken breast and vegetables. Addison ate plenty, but Melly just pushed her dinner around on her plate. Since the Wi-Fi is back on, she's been glued to her computer screen. Even now, she's oblivious to Addison singing along with a cartoon on the TV. She's so oblivious to her surroundings, she doesn't realize that I can't get enough of watching her. She has her hair in a high ponytail. Her nose is long and thin from this angle, and she absentmindedly rubs the tip, which has turned red. I curse myself for not having her favorite tea on hand. Or any tea, for that matter. Tomorrow I'll go grocery shopping, I say while she types something on her computer. She doesn't respond, so I repeat myself. She finally turns to face me, her brows furrowed. I'll buy my own groceries. You only keep healthy stuff around, and I... Whatever she was going to say is forgotten when we hear a loud knock on the door. She jumps out of her chair, practically runs to the door, and opens it. Jason walks in without being invited. Daddy! Addison runs to her father. She raises both arms, and he picks her up. Meet Snowman, she says proudly. I saw. You did a great job. Jason kisses Addie on the forehead. She kicks her legs, and he puts her down so she can run back to the living room. Thanks for watching her, he says to the room. Alex told me she's been with you guys most of the day. She was going to get her earlier, but the pregnancy is putting a lot of strain on her lower back. We had a lot of fun, didn't we, Addie? Addie is so entertained by whatever is on the TV, she doesn't bother to answer her aunt. You want some dinner, Jason? Mel asks. Thanks, but no. I picked up some Chinese on the way home. I'm going to give Addie a bath, put her to bed, and spend the rest of the night eating and watching a movie with my wife. And since I'm off tomorrow, I can sleep in come morning. Suddenly I'm jealous of Jason's relationship with his wife. I'd give anything to have Mel be that easy with me. Sit down. I have some of Addie's pajamas here. I'll give her a bath. I'm sure you're tired, too. Jason rubs a hand over his face and nods while he mutters a thank you to his sister. He sits down and Mel runs to Addison, who protests when her aunt carries her away from the television. Thanks for plowing the snow, he grumbles. I nod. I love the outdoors and any physical activity. You want something to drink? I open my fridge and curse at the lack of contents. I don't have alcohol here. Damn. Jason rubs his eyes and shakes his head. I guess you have no more use for alcohol since you've already trapped my sister. I'm fine, Flynn. He rubs his face again, and for a second I imagine slamming his head against the table to knock some sense into him. But that would only upset my wife and Alex, so I slam the fridge shut instead. I slam it so hard the fridge shakes and bounces against the wall. Jason's head snaps up at the sudden crash, and I walk to the table and stand over him. I thought doctors were supposed to be smart. There goes that theory. I lean down and say, You think I got her drunk and trapped her? I shrug. Do something about it then. What are you going to do, Dupree? Nothing. Your sister is up here. With me. He stands abruptly and gets in my face. We're like two animals in the wild, facing off. I stand there, taking great joy in looking down at him. I intentionally goad him by smirking, hoping he'll throw a punch. He shoves me and I don't budge. But that's exactly what I was hoping he'd do. I shove him against the wall, easily restraining him with both hands. Yeah, she's here, and I have you to thank for that. A mama's boy who tosses his sister aside because mommy comes crying. You do realize she's here because you practically kicked her out, right? I don't believe that but I'm so sick of his dismissive attitude. I throw it in because I know it will hurt. He tries to push me away again, but I only push him harder into the wall. You don't know shit about me and my family, so fuck you. 
I shake my head sadly at him. Is that all you got, Mama's boy? Some four-letter words? I let him go and he stumbles before he catches his balance. I eye him up and down and turn away from him. Barely restraining my temper, I walk away and grab a bottle of water from the fridge, but I'm not done with him yet. Your mother upset my wife, and I'm not going to stand by and continue to let it happen. I bet you probably like that, don't you? You, the perfect doctor son, and Mel, the daughter who can never measure up. He lets out a humorless laugh. Yeah, you don't know shit. You and your sham marriage. How desperate must you be trying to hold on to a marriage with a woman who is too drunk to remember? Don't worry about my marriage. You should worry about why your mother upsets my wife every time they're near each other. He stares at me and his mouth is a firm line. But then he looks away and lets out a deep breath. <sighs> why? Did something happen? He starts to pace around the small kitchen table. She came up here earlier and upset Mel. Told her after everything you've done for her, she thanks you by pretending to be married to me. Later, while we were outside with Addie, Mel went to get buttons for the snowman, but she was gone a long time and agitated when she came out. It's a family matter. Don't worry about it. I go and stand in front of him. I'm family now. Whether you want to admit it or not, I'm your brother. He stops pacing, looks at me, and opens his mouth to say something but then shakes his head, probably thinking better of it. He takes a seat at the table again. I don't like your tactics, Flynn, Jason says. But if you have questions, ask Melly. All I'll say is that they don't get along, and part of that is because of me. He runs a hand over his head. I take a step closer to him and say, What the fuck did you do? He abruptly stands up, and we're like two lions ready to fight to the death. He takes a step closer and I arch an eyebrow, daring him to do something. Little footsteps come running into the room and I take a big step back. Hi, Daddy. Addison runs to her dad and he scoops her up in his arms. I want Mama. Mel comes out and I wrap a possessive arm around her waist. Jason's eyes narrow, so I lean down and plant a lingering kiss on her lips. When I lift my head, she's blushing. She walks over and gives Addie a kiss goodbye. Bye, Uncle Adda. Addie waves at me on her way out the door. Play tomorrow. I'll be here, I tell her while looking directly at her father. Uncle Adam's not going anywhere. Jason slams the door behind him. As soon as they're gone, Mel walks away and opens the fridge. Do you have any wine? She asks without bothering to look at me. When I tell her that I don't, she grabs her laptop and sits on the couch. I take a seat next to her, sitting closer than necessary since I haven't touched her in hours. Not a drop of booze in here. I eat a really clean diet, not much room in it for alcohol. Except when in Vegas and you want to trap me in a marriage I don't want. I lean close and gently grasp her ponytail. She freezes. Do you really believe that? Or does that story make you feel better? I say close to her ear. She turns her head and I meet her stare. I lean closer to her and whisper, How long are you going to pretend you don't remember? I don't know what you're talking about. I let out a sigh and close my eyes. I rub the bridge of my nose in search of patience, but I find none. The only thing I feel is anger and irritation, both at my wife and her brother. <sighs> you know what, Mel? There's the door. Having had enough, I point in the direction of the front door. Her eyes widen in shock and she jumps off the couch. I'm really fucking tired of being your punching bag. Not only that, I'm sick of your idiot brother too. If you're so unhappy, the exit is right there. You're the one who asked me if you could stay here. I'm not holding you hostage. And if you want out of this marriage, fine. I don't have to beg a woman to stay married to me. I get plenty of offers. You of all people should know that. I turn on the evening news and put the volume on full blast. She grabs the remote from me and mutes the TV. You're being an asshole, she has the nerve to tell me. Someone's being an asshole, but it's not me. I've given you everything you've asked for, and you're still making me the villain. I'm done taking shit from you and Jason. 
I snatch the remote and unmute the TV, dismissing her in the process. It's a gamble. She could walk out of here and never return, but that's highly unlikely. There's a snowstorm, and I know she's not going downstairs under any circumstances. She stands off to the side of the couch and says nothing. Part of me wants to go to her, but she also needs to know that I won't be her punching bag. From my peripheral vision, I can see her pursed lips. She flares her nostrils, grabs the laptop, and sits next to me. She opens it up, points to the screen, and says, Can you please take a look, Adam? The indignation in her voice earlier is gone. She sounds calm, almost contrite. Does that mean you're staying? I ask, without looking at her while I flip through the channels. Yes. Of your own free will, she stares blankly. I need you to say it, Mal. You're not going to play the part of helpless victim. We both know that's not who you are. I don't force or manipulate you to do things. She looks away from me and sighs. <sighs> You're not forcing me to stay here, Adam. I'm sorry. There's just been a lot of change in the last few days. You're not going to take it out on me anymore. She nods and inches a little bit closer. I hold out my hand and she hands me the laptop. I pretend to look. These tabs are of things I'm considering for this place. She looks around my apartment again and I resist the urge not to laugh at her disgusted look. Okay, I told you to get what you want. The only thing I ask is that you don't touch my chair. I point to my recliner. I hand her back the laptop. Fine. Even though that thing is hideous, it's really, truly ugly, and it looks like it smells. I don't argue with her there. It's faded and the color of shit brown, but it's comfortable, and I refuse to let it go. You'll hurt its feelings, and it doesn't smell. I take offense at that. I smile, and when she doesn't so much as smirk back, a laugh escapes, and the tension from earlier disappears. You didn't even look. It's thousands of dollars worth of stuff because you need everything. I got new living room furniture, and I don't need to look at it. If you want it, get it. That's why I gave you the credit card. She puts the laptop on my lap and moves closer to me. The smell of her body spray hits, and all I want to do is stick my nose between her breasts and inhale. She points to the screen in front of us. This spreadsheet has the cost of everything. I found some good sales since neither one of us is a millionaire. I glance at the spreadsheet, barely paying attention to the amount. Okay. Okay, she says, mimicking my voice. How do you plan on paying for all of this? Um, one of two ways, I guess. I can write a check, but I'll probably pay it online. She closes the laptop shut and stands up. Fine. This is for you. I won't be taking any of it with me when I move out. I'm exhausted, so I'm going to shower. I'm happy to sleep on the couch if you prefer. I don't prefer. You will sleep in our bed. She nods and walks away, and I'm relieved that she didn't put up more of a fight. I used the snowblower for the second time about an hour ago. When I returned, I was sweaty, so I've already showered. While she's gone, I walk to the bedroom, remove all my clothes, and slide under the sheets. My mother gave these to me as a housewarming gift, and they are good quality. For the first time since I received these, I'm grateful to have them. My mom comes from a big Irish family, the youngest of nine. She came to the United States at the age of 18 on a student visa. She is from a working-class family, and due to her residency status, she had to rely on jobs that paid under the table. She met my father one summer when she was working for a rich family in Montauk. He was a friend of the family, and even though he was much older, she fell in love with him. She had me two years later, and she learned the hard way he was not interested in raising a family with her. She eventually ended things with him, but she says she never regrets having me. And my father was a lying philanderer, but he did pay for a fancy immigration lawyer who got her permanent residency status and he always took care of me financially. That's the extent of it. I can count on two hands how many times I've seen him in my life, but all of that is moot now since he died a few years ago. Mel comes into the room wearing a long cotton t-shirt. 
I turn on my side to admire her, and she does her best to avoid eye contact with me. She sits on the edge of the bed, and I watch, mesmerized, while she slowly rubs lotion on her legs. The t-shirt hikes up, and I visibly swallow at the sight of plain cotton panties. Once she's done, she turns off the light and slides into bed. Do you know what you need in here? She asks before I have a chance to reach over and touch her. What? A TV. I like to watch television in bed. I'll bring the one I have in my bedroom downstairs up here. I put an arm around her and pull her into my naked body. She gasps when she realizes I'm not wearing any clothes, but she doesn't move away. In fact, she relaxes and sighs softly. Just buy a new one, and I'll hang it on the wall. Buy whatever the hell you want. My hand slides up her t-shirt, and when my fingers graze across her stomach, she trembles. What are you doing? I don't miss the huskiness in her voice. I'm about to fuck my wife. My mouth covers hers, and no more words are exchanged between us. 16. Melly. We were stuck together for three days. School didn't open again until Friday, but I worked from home the rest of the week. We got into a rhythm. He gets out of bed way before I do to work out. By the time I get up, he's already showered. While I use his home gym, he cooks breakfast for us. I don't know what he does to the eggs, but they are always delicious. When I clean the kitchen, he will do a load of laundry. Every day, like clockwork, he does a load of laundry after breakfast. While I work, he'll read. But the first day after the storm, we went grocery shopping together. It's a mundane task I've done a million times, either by myself or with Alex, but it was different with Adam. It was like we've been doing this our entire lives. He filled the cart with all the healthy, organic stuff he eats, and I filled it with the stuff that tastes good. When I pulled out my credit card to pay, he gave his to the cashier first. I'm learning a lot of things about him. He must love to cook because whatever goes into his body is prepared by him. And other than his bland chicken breast, everything else is delicious. We do our own thing during the day, especially since I have to work, but the evenings are ours. From cuddling on the couch watching movies to hours of love making at night. That's my favorite part. I always knew it would be good. Too good. Too explosive. Leaving me devastated and broken once he realizes I'm not worth it. But since we said we'd give this a year, I'm going to enjoy it as much as possible. Even now, he's sitting on that hideous couch waiting for me to join him. I grab the ice cream and drown it in whipped cream. He pats the spot next to him, and when I sit, he grabs one of my legs and throws it across his muscular thighs. When was the last time you had ice cream? I ask, just as I take a spoonful. It's been years. He looks longingly at my bowl. I put a little on a spoon and offer it to him. He eyes it, and just when I think he's going to say no, he shrugs and puts the spoon in his mouth. Strawberry? He asks, who eats strawberry ice cream? I offer him more and he greedily eats it. You, obviously. He dims the light and puts an arm around me, pulling me closer. I lay my head on his shoulder and we take turns eating spoons of ice cream. How would you feel about meeting my mother? He asks. I've already met your mother. I saw her a few months after the time I barged in on them. It was last summer, and he brought her over while Alex's father grilled in the backyard. He quickly introduced her to us. Alex even invited them to dinner, but they had plans. I remember Adam's eyes on me that evening. It was a hot day, and I was wearing short shorts and a crop top. I've never seen a man devour me with his eyes like that. You mean the time you almost broke down my door? Or the time you had on those tiny shorts? Shut up, Adam, I say, and shove another big spoonful in his mouth. You haven't met her as my wife. She's going to want to know you. I pull away from him. 
My stomach drops and I no longer want the ice cream. I put the bowl down on the eyesore of a coffee table. I nod but don't look at him. He reaches for me, but I stand up and busy myself with bringing the uneaten ice cream to the kitchen sink. I've made it a point never to meet the parents of anyone I'm dating. That was my rule. But when I moved here, I decided I was going to do everything differently. I never met anyone I wanted to get serious with, but now, drunk wedding or not, I can't avoid this. What just happened? He's standing so close, his chest rubs against my back, and one of his hands lands on my shoulder. Nothing, just washing the bowl so you won't have to do it. He stays quiet, but he doesn't move away. He remains behind me, hands on my shoulders, while I wash the bowl. It's almost as if he's trying to absorb whatever is troubling me. Once I dry the bowl and put it in the cabinet, he turns me around and looks into my eyes. My mom will love you. That's a fact. I look away from the intense blue of his eyes. He grabs my chin, and when I look into his eyes again, I can't look away. Molly Flynn is the nicest woman in the world, and she's going to take one look at you and see the same thing I do. He leans down and gently brushes his lips against mine. Despite the lump in my throat, I ask, What do you see? I see you. I always have. He pulls away from my lips and runs a hand down my high ponytail. I can't help but smile sadly at him. But what if... I stop talking and shake my head. What if what? He asks. What if she disapproves of me? What if she wanted you to marry a nice Irish girl or something? What if she takes one look at me and decides I'm not worthy of her only son? He opens his mouth to speak, but I talk over him. And that's fine if that's what she thinks, so maybe you shouldn't tell her. This is just for one year, and a long finger is pressed against my lips. Shh. I'm not going to keep the fact that I'm married from her, and I'm not going to hide you like you're a shameful secret. This is the best thing I've ever done, and she is going to lose her mind, but in the best way. You'll see. He pulls me into his incredibly hard body and hugs me tight. My arms hang limply at my side, but I gather my wits and hug him back. He pulls away, kisses my forehead, and scoops me into his arms. That evening, we watch a movie on the couch. It's a cold January night, and the wind whips around angrily outside, causing the branches to beat against the windows. He pulls me closer, and I pull an ugly blanket over us. The movie's on, but I have no idea what's happening. My heart is beating too fast at the prospect of meeting his mother, at the consequences of what I've done on that trip to Las Vegas, a trip that was supposed to be about my friend, but ended up being the most life-altering event of my life. I don't know what will become of us when the year is over, but I do know that I will never be the same. And even as I lay in his arms, being lulled calm by the steady beat of his heart, I know that I was only fooling myself when I agreed to just one year. He's slowly rubbing his hands on my back, and I sigh softly at the sensation. If only this could last. If only he wouldn't wake up one day and realize that I'm not worth it. If only I were more someone worthy and deserving of unconditional love. My eyes become heavy, and I long to fall asleep in his arms, but I think my husband has other ideas. The couch might be ugly and old, but it's comfortable and big enough for both of us. One of his hands dips past my lower back and cups a butt cheek. I feel his dick swell underneath me, and seconds later, He's standing up and carrying me into the bedroom. Once we're both under the covers, I reach for him. His hard dick pulsates in my hand. I move closer and kiss my husband. 17. Melly.
I should have brought something, I say, as Adam pulls into the driveway of his mother's house. I'm surprised when he stops in front of the beautiful two-level home with a brick front. It's not the beauty of the house that surprises me. It's the size and the location. I'll have to double-check, but I'm pretty sure this is one of the more expensive Boston suburbs. It's much bigger than the home I grew up in. I look at Adam, but he's looking down at his vibrating phone. He seems irritated when he puts it in the glove compartment and slams it shut. I don't know much about Adam's mother, other than she's a massage therapist, raised him on her own, and lives with her oldest brother, Adam's Uncle Finn. Did your mom move into your uncle's house with him? I ask, fishing for information. It's nice. I hope he doesn't pick up on the nervous tenor of my voice. When he doesn't answer right away, I poke his thigh with my index finger. Hmm? He seems jolted by my touch. Who was that? I ask, pointing at the glove compartment. The New York number again? His lips thin out as if he just tasted something sour. Then he shakes his head and smiles at me. My mom has lived here since we came back from Ireland. We lived there for a few years when I was a kid. Uncle Finn moved in with her after moving to the U.S. about three years ago. His wife passed away suddenly, and they never had kids. He and my mom have always been very close, so she was happy to have him. I moved out because it was time, and Uncle Finn is a little nutty. You'll see. He kills the engine, and when he reaches for his car door, I put my gloved hand on his thigh, stopping him. You lived with your mom until you moved into your apartment? My eyes nearly pop out of my head by the admission. I can't help the small laugh that escapes. This country is the only one where kids are encouraged to move out at 18. Yes, I lived here with her. He shrugs as if it's no big deal. He opens the door, hops out, walks around to my side, and helps me out. His truck is huge, and he practically has to lift me out. I should have brought something. I should have baked a pie. Do you know how to bake a pie, Mel? He holds onto my arm as we maneuver over the icy driveway and walkway. It's just bad manners to show up empty-handed. I slow my steps, and so does Adam. The closer we get to the front door, the slower I walk until I eventually come to a complete stop. I look at the house and then turn my head towards Adam's truck. He drops his hand from my elbow and cups my face. What's wrong? He asks. I've never gone this far before, Adam. I bite down on my lower lip just as a cold, angry gust of wind hits, pushing my hair into my face. I curse myself for not putting on a hat. Adam's big hands brush my hair back in place, but his eyes never leave me. He doesn't need to speak, but I know what he's asking. I close my eyes and take a deep breath. I never let myself get close enough to a man where he would want me to meet his mother. And what if the words die on my tongue before I can force myself to finish the thought? Well... I'm not some man. I'm your husband, and my mom and I are very close. That's what I'm afraid of. I lower my eyes from his, and he surprises me by pulling me into his arms and shielding me from the harsh January winds. Relax. He tightens his arms around me, and despite the frigid temperature, I feel safe and warm. My ma is about the nicest woman you will ever meet. She's never met someone she didn't like. He pulls back and strokes my face again. I promise you, I would never willingly bring you around anyone who wouldn't love you. Trust me? His blue eyes are hypnotizing, and I nod. He drops my face, grabs my hand, and we walk up the steps. He doesn't knock or ring the bell. The second he opens the door, I'm greeted with the smell of home cooking and the blasting sound of Sunday football on the TV. Ma, he yells as he helps me with my coat. 
I wrapped my arms around myself, suddenly feeling self-conscious about the outfit I picked. It's plain black pants and a matching black v-neck sweater. Now I wish I didn't dress like I was going to a funeral. The entryway to the house is huge, with a long hallway leading into a formal living room. The walls are filled with pictures of Adam from baby to adult. There's even one of him at around the age of six, smiling wide with his two front teeth missing. I can't help my laugh as I trace my finger on his cute little chubby face. The next one is when he's about 13, and he has a mouthful of braces and an unruly mop of brown hair. Well, he wouldn't let her cut it, he says, surprising me by wrapping his long arms around me. As if I have no choice, I lean into his massive frame. Oh, he was going to be a long-haired drummer in a rock band, he whispers against my ear, sending chills down my body. Did you? Nope. He plants a soft kiss on my jawline. Why not? Two reasons. I suck at playing the drums, and there was a lice outbreak in my school. Ew! I pull out of his arms and turn to face him. We both burst into laughter, and some of the tension leaves my body. The sound of the TV gets louder, but I still hear someone's loud laughter. I turn in time to see Adam's mother running down the hall. She's a tall, slender woman, and as soon as Adam sees her, he lets me go. She runs into his arms, and he lifts her off her feet as she peppers his face with kisses. My wee boy, she says once he finally puts her down. As soon as her feet touch the ground, she turns to me. Unlike Adam's piercing blue eyes, Hers are a warm brown framed by strawberry blonde hair. She leaves her son's side and walks to me. Like a deer in headlights, I stand there, unable to speak. Adam puts an arm around my waist. And who do we have here? She reaches for my face, and her warm hands touch my skin. Her eyes are welcoming, and the smile on her face is like a hug from a good friend. Is this the surprise? Her smile widens when she looks from me to her son. Molly, someone yells. Molly, when is Adam getting here? I need him to explain this American football to me. I don't get it. Molly sighs, turns, and says, He's already here, and he has a pretty girl with him. If you'd put on your hearing aid, you would have heard him. I practically stumble back at the sound of her loud voice, Adam just laughs. Uh, Finn is practically deaf, but he refuses to admit it, he whispers in my ear. Molly touches my cheek again before she pulls me into a hug. Ma, this is Melanie. Melanie, this is my ma, Molly Flynn. What a pretty name. She hugs me again and squeezes me tight this time. And she's my wife. All the air leaves the room when Adam makes that announcement. I hold my breath, waiting for her to ask him if he lost his damn mind and to warn him that he's made a terrible mistake. But to my surprise, she doesn't do any of that. She puts both hands to her mouth and her brown eyes pool with unshed tears. She lets out an excited gasp and pulls us both into her arms. When she lets us go, she starts to scream. Finn, I assume, runs down the hall. He's a portly man with a round gut, and from several feet away, I can tell he's at least a couple of inches shorter than his sister. What the hell is going on? He practically screams from down the hall. Adam got married. Molly's tears are now streaming down her face. Adam got carried? Who in the hell can carry this giant around? He chuckles and hugs Adam, then turns to me and hugs me. Just like Adam did to his mother, he lifts me off the ground. And who is this pretty lady? He asks. This is Melanie, Adam's wife, Molly says. Why does Adam need a knife? Married, Molly yells at her brother. Buried? Are you crazy, Moll? He's not buried. He's right here. Molly sighs in frustration, and when I look at Adam, his shoulders are shaking from laughter. 
I can't help myself. I laugh too, and so does Molly. Married! She takes my left hand and Adam's, and she shows them to her brother. Married! He widens his eyes and puts both hands to his head. Adam! Mazel tov. Let's have a drink. He practically yells the last sentence. Am I getting a little nephew to play ball with, Adam? He puts a hand on my stomach, then shakes his head. Nope. Go put on your hearing aid. I don't plan on spending the first day with my new daughter shouting. I don't want her to think we're crazy, she screams. He shoes her away, but he runs down the hall and out of her sight. Too late on the crazy part, Adam says. Molly swats his shoulder, but she hooks her arm through mine, and we finally leave the hallway. The rest of the house is like a shrine to Adam. There are candid shots of him, his mother, and various other people. Adam looks nothing like his mother, but a lot of the people in the pictures resemble her, so I assume they are family. There's a picture of a young Adam in a tuxedo with a woman. Prom photo? I ask, lifting it. The female is small and dressed in a pale blue dress, the same color as his bow tie. She has dark brown skin, much darker than mine, and she has a wide smile on her face. My mother can't let go. He takes the picture from me and puts it down. Kids, drinks, Finn says, less loud this time. I hear the loud pop, and by the time we make it to the kitchen, he's pouring glasses of champagne. Adam, you didn't tell me you were dating anyone. How did this happen? She bypasses the glass of champagne her brother is holding out to her and hugs me again. Adam tells them an abridged version of what happened in Vegas. We got caught up in the moment, Ma. We realized our feelings and didn't want to wait anymore. We wanted to tell you face to face, and the snowstorm this week was like our honeymoon. Molly swoons at her son's words, grabs her glass of champagne, clinks it with us, and downs it in one large gulp. Finn immediately refills it. What did he say? Finn yells. He got caught in a typhoon? I thought he went to Vegas. How the hell did he get caught in a typhoon in Vegas? Adam, what the hell are you talking about? Molly rolls her eyes and I laugh. Honeymoon, I say, close to his ear. Oh, now, that's what I'm talking about. Hubba hubba. He winks at me, and Molly excuses herself. She returns about a minute later and shoves something in Finn's hands. I don't need this. My ears work fine. She sighs and says, How about some appetizers? Get the platter from the fridge. Son, oh, I'm so happy about my daughter. She hugs me again, and this time she lowers her arms and pinches my hips. She has a good figure for Barons. You're very tall. Unsure of how to respond, I look at Adam, who is putting a tray of food on the kitchen island. His mom inches closer and asks, Are you pregnant? I almost choke on my champagne at the question, but she steps back and pats my thighs this time. Ma, Adam warns. What? I want grandbabies, Adam. She turns those brown eyes to me and says, Granddaughters, to be more specific, and soon. His mom is beautiful when she smiles, with sparkling brown eyes and perfect cheekbones. Her complexion is fair, without a single blemish. She grabs a small plate and fills it with crackers, cheese, and grapes for me. Eat, darling she orders. She fills her own plate and stands next to me. I take a bite of a cracker. She smiles again, and her smile is so infectious, I find myself mimicking her. Let the girl eat Molly. She can catch a baby faster with some meat on her bones, Finn yells. I start to choke on my cracker, and Adam runs a hand over his face in embarrassment. Let me put dinner on the table. Adam, make sure she eats. She points a finger in her son's face to make her point, but she puts it down, grabs his face, and kisses it. She does the same to me and runs to the oven. She's a mashugana, that one, Finn yells. Catch a baby? I whisper to Adam. 
What the hell does that mean? That I can knock you up fast, duh, he says with a shrug. I feel bad, Adam, I whisper. Your mom thinks this is real and that we're... We're what? Married? Most married people have babies, and I am my mother's only child. He grabs a piece of my hair and wraps it around his finger. I told you she'd like you, he says with a sexy smile. Yeah, but you said she likes everyone. Don't do that, Mel. Don't dismiss yourself. For the record, that's not exactly true. She's met a lot of people she doesn't like, but she likes you because of who you are. He puts a piece of cheddar cheese to my mouth. Eat up so you can catch that baby. 18. Adam. You two will make beautiful babies. Don't you agree, Finn? My mother says. Mel is sitting between me and Ma, and poor Finn is by himself on the other side of the table. Every time Mel takes a bite of her pot roast, my mother wipes her mouth. Then she faces me and wipes mine. Rabies? Who has rabies? Finn asks. Mel lets out a loud laugh, which she tries to hide behind a series of fake coughs. Babies! My mother yells. Jesus, Ma, enough! Let's just eat. Adam! Uncle Finn yells. Don't take our Savior's name in vain. You're gonna burn an eternal damnation if you do. That, he hears, I whisper to Mel. We eat in silence. Well, as much silence as possible with Finn yelling out some nonsense every few minutes. But I don't miss the look on my mother's face, especially the way she looks from me to Mel. I know that look well. She wants something, and she is going to do her best to get it. He's my only boy, Melanie, she says sweetly. I meet her eyes and slowly shake my head at her, warning her to drop it. She smirks at me, but quickly looks away. My only child. He weighed almost 11 pounds when he was born. My vag was a wreck after I had him. Ma, I say. This is extreme even for her. Come on. Mel coughs and my mom absentmindedly rubs her back. What? I taught you about the human body when you were five. Remember your little friend from down the street? His mother didn't like it when you told him the names of the female body parts. She was such a prude. Rude, Finn yells. Adam, I'll box your damn ears if you're rude to your mother, even if I have to get on a stepladder to do it. My mom waves Finn off and turns back to Mel. We've been through everything together, me and my boy. I raised him to treat a woman with respect. It's good to you, right? Adam, you better be good to her. She reaches over and slaps me upside the head. The sudden movement catches me off guard and I drop my fork on my plate. Yes, he's very good to me, Mel says. I look over at her and wink before blowing her a kiss. She giggles. He'd better be, because that's how I raised him. Like I was saying, we've been through a lot together, and he only moved out when Finn moved in. I guess all the yelling finally got to him. He's so considerate, my Adam. It's always been my dream to see my baby get married, at a church, by our priest. As beautiful as you are, I'm sure your dad wants to walk you down the aisle. If your mom is anything like me, she'd want to see you in a beautiful wedding gown. You'd be stunning with that perfect figure. I can picture it now. Oh, boy. Mel starts to stammer, and she looks at me like a deer in headlights. She suddenly shakes her head, signaling for me to put a stop to this. But my mother planted the seed, and all I can see is my wife walking to me in a beautiful white wedding dress. A form-fitting lace gown showing off her perfect hourglass figure. So as my mother is looking at her, pleading with her eyes for the chance to see her only son get married, I don't rein her in. She grabs Melly's hands and holds them in hers. We can go wedding dress shopping. I'll help you plan, and I promise I'm not one of those overbearing mothers. I'll just be there to take orders. I prayed for a girl when I was pregnant just so I could plan my daughter's wedding. The good Lord gave me a son instead, but he still heard my prayers because I have you now. Please. She puts Melly's hands to her face, and I know my wife doesn't stand a chance. Well done, Ma. Well done. Well, uh, I'm sure Adam wouldn't want to go through the trouble and expense of a wedding when we're already married. 
Tell her, Adam. She sits back and waits for me to agree with her. I'd love to have the church's blessing on our marriage, I say to my wife. Her eyes shoot fire and I know with each breath she's plotting my death. But I could not let this opportunity pass. Ma's grip tightens on Mel's hands and her mouth hangs open. She stares at me and I stare right back, giving her my most innocent smile. The church? Mel asks, aghast. Oh, Mel, I would hate to leave this earth without seeing my baby married with my own eyes. It will give me great comfort in my last days. Mel lets out a soft gasp. Your last days? Are you sick, Molly? We're all born with an expiration date, darling. I would just hate for my date to come up and not see my baby marry his beautiful bride. I have no other children. Mel clears her throat and looks around the room. It's so quiet you could hear a pin drop. My heart thumps loudly in my chest, and I hold my breath until she speaks. Mel closes her mouth and exhales loudly. Her shoulders sag, and I know that's the exact moment she resigns herself to a church wedding. Something small, she says after a strained silence. And I'd want my sister-in-law and best friend Ananda to help us. My mother whoops in victory. She claps her hands together right before she takes Melly in a hug. Finn, we're having a wedding. Bedding? Are they spending the night? Adam. Nineteen. Adam. She doesn't say a word the entire ride home. When dinner was over, Ma grabbed Mel and pulled her out of the kitchen. Once I finished cleaning, I found them in the living room looking at wedding dresses online. My mom had an iPad, and she was taking notes. Before we left, they made plans to go to the nail salon next weekend. To make sure it happens, my mother volunteered to pick Mel up Saturday afternoon. You okay, Mel? You haven't said a word in ages? I pull my car into my spot at the back of the house and rest a hand on hers. She doesn't pull her hand away, but when she finally looks into my eyes, I can see the uncertainty and worry on her face. I lift my hand from hers and run a finger along her jawline. What are we doing, Adam? We only agreed to be together for a year, and now your mother is planning a wedding. A goddamn wedding. In a church. I can't do this. She throws her hands up, opens the door to the truck, and jumps out. With my heart in my throat, I open my own door and catch up with her before she can get too far. We've got to tell her the truth. She's a wonderful woman who doesn't deserve to be lied to. And why would we spend money on a wedding anyway? I'm saving to buy a house, and you just spent a bunch on furniture. I wrap my arm around her, and neither one of us speaks again until we get inside. We spent most of yesterday getting rid of things that Mel wants replaced, including the couch and coffee table. The only thing left in the living room is my recliner. I help her with her coat, and while she pulls off her boots, I hang everything in the closet. Hold on to the credit card to pay for the wedding. A boot drops from her hand and her head snaps up. You really want to do this? We promised my mother. She hangs her head down and her hair falls and covers her face. I run a hand through her silky mane. Don't worry about the cost, okay? I say, trying to put her at ease. I don't want you to be in debt. We don't have to do this. Let's tell her we had a fight and I left. You can blame the entire thing on me. Tell her I'm a flake. But I can't do this to you or her. She stands up and walks to the bedroom. I find her in the closet grabbing her suitcase. I close and lock the door behind me. I put an arm around her waist and lift her with one hand. She protests, but I drop her on the bed and jump in beside her. Mel, relax. I feel bad, Adam. We picked a date for our wedding. And we're supposed to have this wedding and get a divorce four months later? That's insane. We don't have to get a divorce next year, Melanie. I all but snap at her. That takes the wind out of her sails. There's no law that says we have to end things in a year or a hundred years. It was a drunken mistake, she says. I turn on my side and she does the same. Listen to me carefully when I say this. I wasn't drunk. I can tell she stopped breathing while she stares at me. Remember what you said to me that night? She opens and closes her mouth several times. 
You know I don't remember. She can't hold my stare as she utters those words. Words that I know are lies, but maybe she's just not ready to face the truth yet, so I simply nod. Well, one day you'll remember how we ended up at the wedding chapel. Let me ask you something else. But before I do, promise you'll tell me the truth. She nods. Do you want a wedding? Is it something you've thought about ever? I hold on to her chin, not willing to let her look away from me. She bites her bottom lip and that simple gesture is enough to make me want to forget this conversation and make love to her instead. It's not something I thought about as a young girl or teenager, to be honest, Adam. But when I stood up for Jason as the best person for his wedding, I had some moments and wondered what it would be like to find the one. But I put those thoughts away. I'm just a disaster. I was a challenge to you, and soon you'll realize I'm not worth it. I pull her closer, and she throws a leg over me and lays her head on my chest. I stroke her back and lean down to kiss her forehead. Let's give this a chance. And I don't know who lied to you and told you that you're a disaster. You want to know what you are? She doesn't say anything. I can tell she's waiting for me to tell her. She lifts her head from my shoulder and looks into my eyes. You're my wife. My beautiful, sexy, smart wife. The one who has driven me crazy since I first laid eyes on her. But that's not all that you are. You're the same girl who came here and started over. You made a new life. You're resilient and beautiful and strong. I don't care what your mother says about Jason being the one doing for you. He's a good brother, but you're a good sister, too. You've given a lot of yourself to his family. That's what I see when I look at you. Tears well in her eyes, and a fat one slides down her cheek. I kiss it away and pull her on top of me. Thanks for saying that, she says. It's the truth. I kiss her forehead and she covers us with a soft blanket. And you have a really good pussy. And your mouth on my dick is... She laughs and elbows me in the ribs. Adam! She yells and elongates the vowels in my name, just like my Uncle Finn. That gets a laugh out of me. We'll need to sit down and come up with a budget for this wedding. I'm not taking money from my family for it, but I can take some money from my emergency savings, so you won't have to pay for this yourself. We can talk about it tomorrow. I sigh in relief and make a mental note to send my mother some thank you flowers for the unexpected gift she just gave me. Okay, Mel. We'll do a spreadsheet or whatever you want, but I can't afford it. I have a question for you, she says. Lay it on me. Is your uncle Jewish? Did he convert? I let out a loud laugh and roll my eyes. <laughs> Finnegan Patrick Flynn is as Catholic as the Pope. He's also a few cards short of a full deck. And why does he yell your name every few seconds? Adam! Adam! She yells, doing a pretty good job of mimicking his voice. Adam! Now you see why I finally moved out. After a good laugh at Uncle Finn's expense, my wife falls asleep in my arms. Unlike our first night together, she's sleeping peacefully. I kiss her lips and admire her face as she lies on my pillow. Her long eyelashes cast a shadow on her cheeks, and I resist the urge to wake her up and make love to her. But the vibrating phone in my pocket distracts me from my plans. Assuming it's my mother, I grab the phone and rush out of the bedroom, but it's not her. I curse in frustration. This is new. They've never called at this time before. I usually get a break from the calls on Sundays, but I guess not today. The vibrations stop only to start again a few seconds later. I hit decline, but it starts to vibrate again almost immediately. The urge to slam the phone against the wall is strong, but I can't give them that satisfaction. What? I whisper shout so I don't wake Mel. The first call was about six minutes ago and I told her then not to call again. Then he started calling and leaving messages. I've never spoken to him. The line is quiet after I answer, and I'm seconds away from either ending the call or breaking my phone. He answers, the voice says. He sounds smug, 
And even though it's been almost five years since I heard the voice of my father, he sounds just like him. That immediately puts me in a bad mood. And you can't take a fucking hint, I hiss. I push myself off the wall and walk to the bathroom and close the door behind me to ensure complete privacy. You're right about that. We didn't know about you. If we had, I stop him before he can finish that sentence. Well, I've always known about you. I know all that I need to know. I told your sister I don't want anything from you. I'm not coming after your fortune, if that's what you're worried about. There's a long pause, and I can picture his smug face now. He's probably seething at my tone, but I don't care. She's your sister, too, and her name is Elizabeth. All she wants is to get to know you. For some reason, the entitled tone of his voice irritates me, as if it's their right to bulldoze their way into my life. It's always been about what they want and screw everyone else. What about what the fuck I want? Do you people ever think of anyone but yourselves? I've already told your sister I'm not interested in getting to know her. And for the record, I don't want anything to do with you either. You're all the fucking same. He's silent, but since I'm only going to have this conversation once, I refuse to hang up like I did the first time I took a call from one of them. I wait for his tirade of entitlement, and I hope I get one because I'm suddenly itching for a fight. Are you done? he asks, his tone even. I think the better question is, are you done? We're just getting started, Adam. The hint of amusement in his voice fuels my anger. It's like throwing a match on a puddle of gasoline. I've already told you where I stand, but because you seem to be learning impaired, let me say it again. This time I don't miss the laugh coming from him, but I take a deep breath and continue. I don't care who you are. I don't want anything to do with you, your sister, or anyone else in your family. I don't want anything. And since I'm pretty sure you dug around in my life, let me tell you that I didn't even want the money that lying, cheating piece of shit left for me. I would have donated it all to charity if my mother hadn't begged me not to. I don't have, nor have I ever had, any interest in being a part of your family. You people are, we're your family, he finishes for me. He drops his voice and says, I'm your brother. Elizabeth is your sister. I have a son, and that makes him your nephew. I'm getting married in a few months. I want you to come to my wedding. You're forgetting something. I don't want any of that. Don't I get a choice? Only if you make the right one. I pull the phone away from my ear, suddenly enraged at this controlling asshole and his very existence. I'm not interested. I try to sound dismissive, but the few times I allowed myself to research him, I fell down a rabbit hole of family pictures and articles. From pictures of our father and his legitimate family to recent ones of my so-called brother, his fiancé and son. You can come here, he continues as if he didn't hear what I just said. I can send the jet for you and your wife. He pauses, but I don't bother to ask how he knows I've gotten married. I always suspected that they're watching me. Even before I got that phone call all those months ago, I had a feeling that someone was following me, but I could never prove it. No, you're not about to summon me as if you're royalty and I'm your subject. And don't you ever talk about my wife again. Or I can come to you. I'm not issuing any invitations. He laughs again. I thought you said you knew me. You're just like him, I hiss. I'm not sure if that's true but I figure I'd go for a low blow. In some ways I am, and so are you, it seems. I bristle at his words. Don't ever compare me to him, and don't call me again. This is your chance to control the situation, Adam. You can pick when and where. The ball's on this guy. I already told you I'm not interested. Fine. I expel a relieved breath, but my relief is short-lived. You just forfeited control. I'll come to you. And the bastard ends the call. I wish he'd come now so I could pound his face with my fist. I shove the phone back in my pocket and yank the door open with a little bit too much force. I practically collide with Mel. Are you okay? She lays a hand on my chest and the tension starts to ebb. I've been looking all over for you. 
Who are you talking to? She pokes her head inside the bathroom as if she's going to find another person. I step out and close the door behind me. No one important. Just one of the teachers at school calling in sick already. I put my arm around her and tuck her to my side. I was just coming back to bed, but since you're up, let's discuss our wedding. I surprise her when I pull away and pick her up bridal style. 20. Melly. It's not until midday that the manager's meeting ends and I return to my office. It's been almost three years since I started in the risk management department at Massachusetts General Hospital. This is where my brother completed his residency and where he now works as an attending physician. This is where he met Alex, who works in the same department as me. The only difference now is I'm a manager. When the position opened, I had no plans to apply for it until Alex encouraged me to do so. I did it as a joke, never expecting to pass the first interview, but I did. Three interviews later, I was offered the position of claims manager. The job comes with a lot more responsibilities, but also a hefty raise and extra vacation time. Look at this, O. Ananda whisper shouts when I walk by her cubicle. Everyone chuckles. Why am I a hoe? I ask. Because you're walking like you just rode a horse. And don't get me started on you getting married and leaving Vegas before telling anyone. And then you hid all last week, Ananda says. I look at Alex and she giggles at me. Let's go to lunch. I'm starving, I say to shut her up. Alex and Ananda get their coats, and I run to my small office in the back. Ananda applied for the manager's job, too, and I worried things would get awkward once I got the job, especially since she's worked here longer. But like the true friend she is, she was happy for me. She went so far as to throw me a surprise party to celebrate my promotion. Once we're bundled, the two of us each take one of Alex's arms and walk to Beantown Cafe. Tina has a table in the back ready for us, and as soon as someone takes our order, she slides into the booth next to Alex. How's my baby? She rubs Alex's protruding belly. Kicking, Alex says. There's definitely a soccer player in there. And how's our new bride? Tina's smile widens, and she shares a look with her sister. Do you need me to put on my lawyer hat? This time, Alex and Ananda share a look, and I don't miss Ananda's smug smile. Um, not yet. Since my mom's around, we decided to stay married for a year to throw her off the scent. I don't need her thinking I screwed up again. I take a long sip of my ice water, hoping and praying they change the subject once I'm done drinking. Girl, bye, Ananda says. A year, my big ass. If you haven't filed papers by now and you're going to play house for a year, you ain't getting no damn divorce. I know Adam sure as hell isn't going to give you one without a fight, and you can't even walk straight. Alex tries to mask her laugh with a cough, but can't. I cut my eyes to her, and she refuses to meet my stare. I can feel myself blush. Ananda is right about the walking part. I got so turned on after creating a spreadsheet listing all possible expenses for the wedding. When I was done, I slammed the laptop shut and climbed on top of Adam. He offered zero resistance and I rode him through two orgasms until he flipped me over and I ended up on my back. He threw one of my legs over my head and penetrated me so deep I lost all thought. Another orgasm later, he erupted inside of me. The second he climbed off my body, I fell asleep and woke up from my deep slumber this morning wrapped in his arms. I see from that blush on your face that Ananda is right. Tina says. The three of them exchange looks again. Why do you three keep looking at each other like that? I ask. Because you're fooling yourself again like you always do when it comes to your husband, Ananda says. You should have seen them in Vegas. He was like a possessive crazy boyfriend. 
If a man even so much as looked at her, he stood to his full height until they walked away. Then Melly had a few drinks and started flirting with him, saying, I elbow Ananda in the ribs, hard enough to cut off her words. She starts to cough, but I catch her eye and give her the death glare. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, Ananda says. She chuckles and does the motion of zipping her lips. How was meeting his mom and uncle, Alex says. Ananda arches her eyebrows, crosses her arms, and waits for me to speak. She's amazing, really sweet and funny, and Uncle Finn is a riot. I tell them about Adam's mom and Uncle Finn's refusal to wear his hearing aids, even though he needs them desperately. I slide in the fact about the wedding and the entire table goes quiet. My three table mates all stare at each other, then at me without saying a word. After what seems like an eternity of silence, they start to talk at once. You're having a wedding? Tina asks. A summer wedding? His mom has the guilt thing down. She pulled the he's my only child card. They stare at each other again after my statement. Luckily, the waitress brings our food, and I take a big bite of my turkey club. After the first bite, I realize how famished I am, and I take another bite and shovel several fries in my mouth. Does this mean you're going wedding dress shopping? Alex asks. Her eyebrows are practically to her hairline. I don't miss Ananda's snicker or Tina's shocked look. After putting more fries in my mouth, all I can do is nod. Everyone waits. They all watch me, and when I reach for more fries, Ananda pushes my plate away. Resigned, I take another sip of water. I nod slowly and say, With his mom, and you guys too. The table goes deathly quiet again, and when Tina catches my eyes and smirks, I look away and clear my throat. I grab my plate and fill my mouth with more of my sandwich. Divorce my ass, Ananda says. And before you start lying to us and yourself, just remember these facts. You're already married, planning a wedding, and going shopping with your mother-in-law. Just get pregnant tonight and call it a day because we all know you're fucking him by now. Have two of his giant babies and live happily ever after. Instead of reaching for my water, I look around the table while I think of a believable response to what Ananda just said. Well, we are married, Ananda, and do you have to be so crass all the time? I grab my water and finish it letting the slurping sound fill the small space. So, I say, as I do everything to avoid looking at my friends, everyone free the Saturday after next? Molly texted me. Who the hell is Molly? Ananda asks, interrupting me. Adam's mom. Anyway, she made an appointment at a bridal shop, and I want you guys to come. What about your mother? Alex asks. I make a face and let out a groan. No, I want this to be a positive experience. I don't want to talk about Diane Dupree, okay? And I'll tell Jason about the wedding myself, Alex. I reach over the table and tap her belly. I wouldn't even know where to start, Alex says. So, you've been texting with your mother-in-law, huh? Yeah, she's been texting all morning sent me a bunch of baby pictures of Adam. My phone buzzes in my purse, and I reach for it. Sure enough, it's a text from Molly confirming our Manny petties for Saturday. I text her back and slide the phone back in my purse. When I look up, everyone is looking at me. Who's that? Ananda asks. Molly, we're getting manicures on Saturday. Everyone throws their hands up in the air, Tina throws her head back and laughs. You were right, Alex. I owe you drinks once you pop this baby out, Tina says. A large crowd walks in, and she leaves us to go greet the new customers. Melly, don't waste our time with that bullshit divorce talk again. We'll be planning your baby shower before you know it. You are in so deep. I think Adam's the one who's been in deep, 
Alex says, which causes Ananda to snort so loud, food flies out of her mouth. I can feel a flush creep up my neck, but I ignore my friends and return to my food. Is this going to be in a Catholic church? Ananda asks. When I nod yes, she says, does this mean you're converting? I don't have to. I looked it up. As long as we get permission from the bishop, I can marry in a Catholic church without converting. Don't forget we still have Alex's baby shower to finish planning, so don't go spending all your free time researching the Catholic church and hanging out with your new mommy, Ananda says. I give her the finger with one hand while I hold my turkey club with another. The lunch conversation returns to normal, and I tune out my friends while I think about how I keep digging a deeper hole for myself, first with the drunken marriage and now an actual church wedding. So when is the wedding happening? As long as it's a few months after I pop out this baby, I am not going to look like a whale in my bridesmaid dress, Alex says. I stare at her, and then I turn to Ananda. They aren't only the first two friends I made when I moved here, but they are the best friends I've ever had in my life. True friends who I can confide in and who have my back no matter what. I was a bridesmaid for them both. If I'm having a wedding, there is no way I won't have the two most important women in my life not be a part of it. We're thinking August, about a month before school starts, so we can have time for our honeymoon. They both chuckle. So where are you two going on this honeymoon? Alex asks. She looks at Ananda, and they both do a bad job of trying to hide their amusement. I slurp the rest of my water, but I feel their eyes on me while they wait for my answer. We haven't decided yet, I tell them. But you must have some ideas, Ananda, the pushy bitch, says. You know you can't keep shit from us, so you might as well confess now. We are considering Paris. They look at each other and burst into uncontrollable laughter. The most romantic city in the world, Ananda says between chuckles. I know, I know, I say to my two best friends. When this first happened, I saw a way out, but now I can't. Each time I try to get out, I just get pulled in deeper and deeper. My friends stare at each other, and it's as if they are having a silent conversation, and I know it's about me. Stop doing that. Just say what you want to say, I tell them. Just how deep does he go? Alex asks again with a loud giggle. I sigh and roll my eyes to the ceiling. You're like a 12-year-old boy, I tell her. That's how this one ended up pregnant. You're so damn filthy, Ananda says to Alex. Anyway, Melanie, you're married, fucking, and living together while you plan a wedding. You're besties with his mama, so much so that you've been texting each other all day. Why don't you stop the bullshit about divorcing him in a year and give it an honest try? You married the man for a reason, right? I don't understand why you'd never give him a chance to begin with. It's always been obvious he's crazy about you, and he's fine as fuck. And I don't buy that load of crap about finding a man your parents would like. I know you, and I know you don't give a shit about what anybody else thinks, especially your mother. Alex's fork stops halfway to her mouth while she waits for me to answer. Out of the three of us, Ananda is the most outspoken. You never have to guess what she's thinking or how she feels because she will tell you. Alex is more subtle. She's gentler and will eventually lead you to the right conclusion. I told you guys, I always wanted a black boyfriend. I know they're going to call me out on my bullshit. It makes life easier, I say in my defense. Yeah, if we were living in 1940. Funny how you say that, but end up married to the Irish guy, Ananda reminds me. I was drunk. Girl, stop with that shit. I was there. You had some drinks, but you weren't drunk. And honestly, who cares about his color? 
We want love. And it shouldn't matter if our person is black, white, orange, or green. As long as he's a good person and fine, he's definitely got to be fine. Then he must have drugged me. My response is a little bit too loud for the restaurant. An older lady from the next table looks at us, her brows marred in disapproval. Melly, come on. Alex reaches over and touches my hand. Nobody drugged your ass. Stop lying, Ananda yells at the table. And you are too hard-headed to do anything you don't want to do. Whatever, I huff. Are you both going to be my bridesmaids or what? They both start to clap at the table right before Ananda takes me in a suffocating hug. It's after six by the time I make it home. I stayed late to catch up on work from last week. We're allowed to work remotely, but the storm caught me by surprise, and I had some matters I had to resolve before coming home tonight. I close the front door to the house, just as a strong gust of wind hits. It's well below freezing today, and the short walk from the train station has chilled me to the bone. As soon as I close the door behind me, the door to the first floor apartment opens and my mother's head pokes out. I give her a tight-lipped smile and try to walk up the stairs, but she steps in front of me. I stop short to avoid bumping into her. Addison comes running out and wraps her arms around one of my mother's legs. Hi, Auntie. She waves her little pudgy hands at me. I lean down and kiss the top of her soft curls. Where Ada? As if he heard his name, the door to the second floor opens and Adam's heavy footsteps hit the stairs. It's like a herd of elephants, and I don't miss the jolt of excitement coursing through my body at the thought of seeing him. He left so early this morning. He slid out of bed right at five to head to the gym before work. He gave me a kiss on the forehead minutes later, and I haven't seen him since. When he reaches the bottom step, he grabs my face and kisses me. It's almost as if he's oblivious to our audience, and after not seeing him for over 12 hours, I'm eager to kiss him back. My bag lands on the floor, and I wrap my arms around his neck and open my mouth. He presses my body into his, and I curse at wearing my bulky winter coat. Ada! I hear Addie's voice before I feel her little body by my legs. She wraps an arm around mine and one around Adam's leg. Pick up. She starts to jump, and Adam breaks the kiss, picks her up, and puts her on his shoulder. It's Uncle Adam, he reminds her. Uncle Ada. She pulls on his hair, and he makes a face. A laugh escapes, and my mother finally clears her throat. Jason opens the door and steps out when he sees us. You guys coming in for dinner? Mom cooked all this food. He gestures towards his apartment and waves us in. I hadn't gotten a chance to tell them yet. I made your favorite, Melanie. We haven't had a chance to spend any time together since I arrived. I stare at Jason and he holds my stare. He subtly shrugs and mouths, sorry. I'm not sure what the hell he's sorry for, though. Um, thanks, but I promised Adam I'd cook him dinner tonight. I offer him my hand, and he intertwines our fingers. His skin is warm, and I suddenly realize how much I've missed him today. It was the first day we were away from each other in almost a week, and I didn't realize how much I've gotten used to being around my new husband. Since when do you cook, Melanie? Is your specialty still Pop-Tarts? She laughs, and I bristle. Whenever I spend time with Ananda and her family, her mom constantly makes fun of her. It's their thing, and Ananda gives as good as she gets, but it's always in fun. It works for Ananda and her mother, but not for me and mine. As if he can sense I'm about to erupt, Jason chimes in. Melly cooks dinner for us all the time. He walks out and puts an arm around me. She was a lifesaver during Alex's first trimester. Come on inside. 
Alex is hungry, and she gets sick if she eats too late. Come on, Flynn. He grabs Addison from Adam's shoulders and gestures for us to follow him inside. Adam, my mother says, I would like for us to get to know each other. Alex told me you're a bit of a health nut, so I made lots of vegetables. Adam doesn't offer my mother a smile, but he stares into my eyes. Your call, Mel. We can go inside, or we can go upstairs. He moves closer and puts an arm around me. Melly, Adam, come on. I'm starving, and there's enough food here to feed an army, Alex yells. I nod at Adam, and he takes my hand before ushering us inside. By the time he helps me with my coat, my mother has walked back into the kitchen. Addison runs back and punches Adam in the leg. That's his cue to face her so they can start their boxing shuffle. Get him, Addie. Knock him out, Jason says. Addie hits Adam right below the knee, and he goes down. She jumps on top of him and kisses his cheek before she jumps off and counts to ten. Twenty-one. Adam. I finally lift myself off the ground only to find Jason smirking at me. He rolls his eyes and leans against the wall with his arms crossed. He walks over, offers me his hand, and helps me to my feet. Everything okay upstairs? He asks, pointing a finger at the ceiling. Things are great, I tell him. And they are. Better than I could have hoped for in such a short time. The bumpiest day was the first day we were stuck together, but Melly's adjusted quickly. We formed a routine. I cook our meals, and she's busied herself making the apartment fit for human life. I'm still learning her habits, like how she makes the bed in the morning. I've never cared about that. I don't know if she's aware, but the food on her plate never touches. She keeps everything spaced apart. Her favorite flavor of ice cream is strawberry, and she takes off her shoes and socks the minute she steps inside. She changes her nail polish every couple of days and her fingers and toes always match. Her favorite television shows are legal dramas, and she's a cheapskate who keeps track of every penny she spends. That was the most surprising thing about my bride. That and her attempts to make me fiscally responsible. It's always a struggle to keep a serious face whenever she updates one of her spreadsheets. She also has three different savings accounts, including an emergency and secret account, which isn't so secret, since she mentions it whenever she feels the need to lecture me about my spending. Let's eat, Alex says. Jason, stop frowning at Adam. The dining room table is set, and I admit the food does smell good. My stomach growls loudly. I haven't eaten since lunch, and I worked out this morning and after school. There's roasted chicken, rice, and several green vegetables. I made sweet potatoes, too. Mrs. Dupree says. She runs to the kitchen and returns with a platter of baked sweet potatoes. Jason and Alex sit while I help Addie into her high chair. I finish in enough time to pull Mel's chair out for her. When we sit, her hand lands on my lap. It's as if she's holding on to me for comfort. Everyone is quiet while we serve ourselves. Alex has a fake smile plastered on her face. Jason frowns at me, and Addie shoves fistfuls of food in her mouth. Mel pushes her food around her plate, so I lean in and kiss her temple. She smiles, relaxes, and starts to eat. When I look up, Jason is still scowling at me, but Alex's plastic smile is replaced with a genuine one. So, Melanie, her mother begins, how's work treating you? Is everything going well with the promotion? Mel's fork stops halfway to her mouth. She looks around the room as if to confirm her mother is speaking to her. It's going well, thanks. It's as if she's speaking to a stranger, and that saddens me. When I became the vice principal at my school, my mother not only bragged about me to all her friends and siblings, but she spent the entire night before the first day of school baking brownies and cookies for all the teachers. Mrs. Dupree looks a little deflated by the dismissive answer but she puts a smile on her face and continues. And how did you two become a couple? You guys weren't together when I visited six months ago, and now you're married. What's your point, Mother? Melly asks. 
I can sense the tension in Jason's body. He's so rigid he could snap. My point is, my daughter got married and I didn't know she was dating anyone. That's my point, Melanie. She lays her fork down on her plate and looks at Melanie, demanding an answer. When was the last time I called you and volunteered anything about my life? Why would this be any different? Jason's fork hits his plate and he puts his head in his hands. Well, you know, Diane, Alex says, it was just one of those things. Everyone saw the chemistry between Melly and Adam since day one. They were always inevitable. Have you told your father? Mrs. Dupree ignores Alex. He's on a cruise ship with his girlfriend. I'll tell him when he comes home in a few days. The room goes deathly quiet at the mention of the girlfriend. And Adam. She puts those calculating eyes back on me. Have you told your parents about this unexpected? She waves her hand around until she finds the right word. Union? We told my mother yesterday, and she's thrilled. She loves Mel. Oh, yes. She's been texting Melly all day, Alex says with a high-pitched laugh. Show everyone that naked baby picture of Adam she texted you, Melly. Please don't, Jason says. Oh. If I didn't know any better, I'd think Mrs. Dupree was hurt at the prospect of Mel and my mother getting close. It would have been nice if I was given the same courtesy as Adam's mother, but here we are. Mom, Jason says, they eloped. I'm sure Flynn's mother was as surprised as you were. Yeah, same. But with a tiny exception of being happy for us, Melly throws out. You know what it's like to be happy for your child, right, mother? Oh, wait. That rule only applies to one of your children. I squeeze Mel's thigh, but she's so tense her shoulders are practically to her ears. That's not true. Her mother's words are whispered, but I hear the tortured pain. That's never been true. Melanie stands and I stand too. I heard it with my own ears, so you don't get to walk that back. Let's just leave, Mel, I say to her. I'd love to hear more, but not in front of Addie. No one is leaving, Jason says, standing up abruptly. Flynn, you want to be a part of this family? Sit down. Melly, come on. Please, stay. Not if she's going to continue to upset my wife, I say to Jason. I'm only trying to have a conversation. I'm not trying to upset you, Melanie. I'm not trying to upset anyone. Mrs. Dupree shakes her head. She looks up and her eyes have pooled with tears. I just want to talk. Talk, Auntie, Addison says. Mel looks at me, nods, and we sit back down. The only person still eating now is Addie, who's chewing on a drumstick. Melly, are you going to the office tomorrow? Alex asks. I'm officially working remote until the baby comes. Mel exhales loudly through her nose and nods at Alex. She picks up her fork, and I do the same. I'm going in for the first half of the day. I'm interviewing two people tomorrow, but we have a furniture delivery, so I'll be home for that. Warmth spreads through me when she refers to the apartment upstairs as home. Most of the furniture is gone. Mel even had the place painted a few days ago. Oh, that sounds exciting, her mother says with false enthusiasm. And you'll be choosing who to hire. I am the hiring manager, Mel says. And what about you, Adam? You're a teacher, right? I worked in the public schools back in New Jersey. I was a librarian. I'm a vice principal, Mrs. Dupree, but I taught math before that. Tell me about your parents. It's always been just me and my ma, I tell her. She's wonderful, but a bit nutty. Right, Mel? Not to me. I kind of love her, Mel says. But I can't help the feeling in my chest about my wife loving my mother. And she was okay with this? She asks, gesturing to me and Mel. He's already answered that, Mel says. Right, but I meant the entire... She pretends to search for the word. She looks to Jason for help, but he shakes his head at her. The interracial aspect. Your mother is fine with that. Why wouldn't she be? I put my hand on Mel's shoulder and gently massage the stress away. It's just that some people object to that kind of thing, right? The only thing my mother cares about is that I'm happy. 
What kind of mother would object to their child finding love and getting married? I stare right into her eyes, daring her to say anything else. And what happened to your father? Diane asks, quickly changing the subject about my mother. The entire table goes silent while they wait for my response. He's dead, is all I say. I didn't know that, Mel says. I thought you guys were only estranged. She rubs my thigh underneath the table, puts her chin on my shoulder and whispers, I'm sorry. You didn't know your husband's father is dead? The accusatory tone in Diane's voice isn't lost on anyone. She tosses her fork on her plate as if she's disgusted. So, Adam, Alex says quickly, I have a favor to ask you. Will you help me get back in shape after the baby is born? Just knock on my door when you're ready to get started. I'll design a workout routine for you, I tell her. She smiles at me and Jason mouths, thank you. I'm not sure if it's because I have agreed to help his wife or if it's because I ignored his mother's last bitchy comment. You look gorgeous in your bridesmaid dress, Mel says after taking a deep breath. You can hear a pin drop after that statement. Jason looks at me and arches his eyebrow. Oh, who's getting married? A friend from work, her mother asks. No, mother, I am. Well, we're already married, but we are having a small wedding in August. Jason, I want you to be my best person. Even though I rocked that tuxedo when I was best person at your wedding, I won't make you wear a dress for mine. That would be fun to see, I snicker. You can borrow one of mine, Alex says, laughing loudly. Jason opens his mouth to speak, but his mother talks first. You're having an actual wedding? She drops her fork again, and it clangs loudly against her plate. This farce has gone far enough, don't you think, Melanie? Nobody here buys this marriage of convenience. So convenient that you only announced it when I come to town. You're acting out like a child. Didn't I pay enough attention to you when you were growing up? Why do you have to do this? Mom, enough, Jason warns. My marriage is not about you, mother. Melanie throws her napkin on her plate. Addie must think it's a game because she tosses hers on the floor. Yes, I believe it is. Her mother juts out her chin at her statement. For the record, you paid plenty of attention to me as a child, all of which was negative. Do you think I enjoyed being belittled or made to feel like an afterthought or unwanted? I never. You did. But whatever. I spent years being angry and hurtful towards Jason because of the way you treated us. You treated him like a prince. But I was the stupid, red-headed stepchild. Always. That's your perception of me. So fine. I know who I am. And I don't live my life for your approval. I left New Jersey to get away from you. Yet here you are, Melly yells while gesturing towards her mother with both hands. Yes, I married Adam. Is it so crazy that a man would want to marry me? And yes, we're having a wedding. That is all you need to know. Your presence is not required. She leaves the table and I get up and follow, but not before giving her mother a scathing look. You guys, please don't leave, Alex says, but Melly is already yanking the door open. I run behind her as she takes the steps two at a time. She opens the door and throws her purse on the floor. There's no couch anymore, so she runs to the bedroom and I follow behind her. She starts to pace, and when she turns to face me, I stand in front of her and open my arms. She walks right in, and I tighten my arms around her. She puts her face in my chest and lets out a muffled scream. I rub her back and tell her everything is going to be okay. I'm sorry you had to go through that, I tell her. Has it always been like that between the two of you? Since I was about 13. We were never very close. She's always preferred Jason. Things really went bad between us when I didn't score high enough to get into the same high school as him. It was really competitive and... You don't ever have to explain that, Mel. It's okay, I say, finally understanding the reason for the rift between my wife and her mother. Melly committed the horrible sin of not being as academically gifted as her brother, and her mother has never forgiven her for it. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. We wouldn't have gotten as far into the meal as we did if you hadn't been there. She was on her best behavior. I'm over it, Adam. Why did she have to come here? 
to the one place I ran to get away from her. And why does she have to tear down everything that I do? Yeah, our relationship is unconventional, but she doesn't know that. She just has to dig and dig until she finds something to beat me over the head with. The thing is, if Jason had flown to Vegas and gotten married, there would be no third degree. But I can't so much as sneeze without her accusing me of doing it on purpose to get attention. As if I would ever want any kind of attention from her. Her of all people. Are you fucking kidding me? She pushes out of my arms and walks out of the bedroom. She paces around the empty apartment before she walks to the kitchen and kicks the cabinet underneath the sink. I grab her hand and bring her to the table, where I place her on my lap with my arm wrapped tightly around her. Hurting your foot won't help anything. Nothing will, she says. I can feel the strain in her voice. The anger's gone now, but the sadness and resignation are much, much worse. I need a shower. She tries to jump off my lap but my arm is wrapped too tight around her. There's a loud knock on the door and it bursts open before either of us can say, come in. 22. Melly. Jason walks into the house, his eyes darting back and forth until he finds us sitting in the kitchen. He stands there, hands on his hips. I hold my breath and wait for him to take our mother's side, just like he used to before we mended our relationship. Looking back, I don't blame him for that. I was as hostile to him as I was to her. Flynn, I need to talk to my sister. I didn't miss his dismissive tone, and that irritates me. He stays, I tell him. Adam kisses my shoulder, and I relax against him. If this is what I think it is, I'll need someone on my side for a change. I'm sorry for that ambush. We had words. She wanted to come up here, but I told her to back off. I'm sorry for the whole situation, Melly. I had no idea she was on the verge of losing the house or I would have helped. I didn't know she was coming here until she showed up, and I feel like I failed you because you had to leave your home. He grabs a chair and sits. His broad shoulders look smaller today. I reach over and touch his hand. I don't blame you for any of this. I don't. It's not his fault our mother puts him on a pedestal and treats me like a second-class citizen. It's taken me years to come to that realization, and I don't want to go back. Don't even put that in your head. She needs you, and you're a good son. He seems relieved by my words and lets out a breath as he runs a hand over his head. Don't worry. She'll only be here a few months at the most. Then her apartment will be ready. Jake says his dad's personal assistant is retiring in April, and if mom's a good fit, she can have the job. In the meantime, she's going to watch Addison. I nod at him and tell myself that I can deal with this situation for another three or four months. Sounds good, Jace, I say, hoping to put his mind at ease. Adam's arms tighten around me, and I lay my head on his shoulder. The tension from earlier starts to dissipate. I'm not sure if it's because of the talk I just had with Jason or if it's because of Adam's comforting embrace. Then he kisses my temple and everything is right. Jason watches and I bristle while I wait for him to say something to Adam, but he doesn't. He stands and looks around the place. What the hell happened to Flynn's ugly couch? It wasn't that bad, Adam says. Yes, it was. Jason and I say it once. And you painted, he notices while he admires the freshly painted beige walls. This place is getting a complete makeover, I tell him. We'll have you, Alex, and Addie over for dinner this weekend. We'll have your mom and uncle too, Adam. He squeezes me tighter and kisses my temple again. And Ananda and Dennis. We'll have a little party. I jump from Adam's lap, run to the bedroom, and return with my laptop. I don't have time to kick myself for thinking of throwing a party after all the money I spent on new furniture, but the idea of sharing our home with our friends excites me. Are we doing another spreadsheet? Adam asks. He pats his lap and I sit down, excited about the weekend. I'm the one who did Jason's housewarming party for him, and I tricked Alex into coming. Remember that, Jace? 
Jason offers me a fist bump, and I hit it with mine. I'll leave you guys alone. Let me know if you need help when the new furniture gets here. He says goodbye and walks out. We sit there in silence until Adam bites the top of my ear, and I let out a surprised yelp. Give it to me, Mel. His husky voice whispers in my ear. It goes right through my belly and straight down to my pussy. It throbs when he bites my ear again. I let out a moan this time. You want it, huh? I'm not usually one for flirting. I say what I mean and get to the point, but when you're sitting on the lap of a sexy beast who can't get enough of you, it's hard not to. Yeah, spread it. Give me that spreadsheet. He laughs in my ear, and I laugh along with him. I try to punch his chest, but he moves out of the way and ducks. My superior boxing moves. I jump off his lap and attempt to punch him again, but he stands up and starts to shuffle. I mirror his movements and lean in for a jab. He moves a fraction, and I miss. A piece of his hair falls across his forehead, and it's about the sexiest thing I've ever seen. I jab again. He moves, and I miss. I lean in for a right hook to the body, and he ducks. He lunges and wraps his arms around me. My back is to his broad chest, and his arms are wrapped around me like a vice, not leaving an inch of space between our bodies. I feel his hard dick on my ass, and to tease him, I stick my butt out further. He moans in my ear, and when I lean back, he licks the side of my neck. The throbbing between my legs doubles. I don't know when it happens, but we start to sway, right there in the middle of the empty living room, we're in perfect rhythm, his muscled chest and hard cock pressed behind me, and my ass rests on his dick as if that's its home. A hand slides down my body and cups my pussy over my gray dress pants. I moan wantonly and grind into him. Warm lips press on the side of my neck while a hand undoes the top button to my pants. He slides inside my silk panties and glides between my lips, I can feel the slickness between my legs. His fingers slip lower, and two find their way inside. He fucks me with his fingers, but all too soon he withdraws. I groan in protest, but he ignores me. That hand glides up my body, up my neck, and to my mouth. See how good you taste, he whispers, so close to my ear that I get goosebumps. I open my mouth to take in a breath of air, and he puts his fingers that were inside of me in my mouth. Suck, Mel. He fucks my mouth with his fingers. Good, he asks. He sucks the base of my neck so hard, I know there will be a mark there tomorrow. So good, I whimper. We're still swaying, but his free arm is no longer wrapped around me. He's too busy unbuttoning my blouse. In no time at all, it's completely open, and I'm shrugging it off. His shirt is pulled over his head and tossed to the floor while I rid myself of my shoes and pants. He takes off my bra, and I pull down my panties. When we're naked and standing in front of each other, I jump into his arms and wrap my legs around him. He catches me without so much as a flinch. He sprints to the bedroom and tosses me on the bed. Before I can get comfortable, he grabs one of my legs and pulls me to the edge of the bed, spreading me apart, leaving me completely exposed and at his mercy. His knuckles rub against my clit, and I whisper, Adam. He spreads my legs further apart and lays his big body on top of mine. Say it again, he commands. Say your husband's name. He grinds into me and I can feel his heavy, thick cock between my legs. It's so close. If I can just adjust my body a bit, he could slip right in, but he presses me to the bed. Say your husband's name, love, he whispers again. I almost combust at the endearment. I touch his chest and run my hands over the scarred skin. Say it. Adam. I lower my voice and say his name. Kiss me, Adam. His blue eyes darken, and he crashes his mouth to mine. 
He's hungry, kissing me so hard and deep that I know he'll bruise my lips. Strong hands hold on to my hips while he continues to grind. Without breaking the kiss, he flips us over. Oh, I say, shocked by the sudden movement. Ride me. He slaps my ass and sits against the headboard. He lifts me. It's so effortless. He aligns his dick with my slit, and I'm so wet that I slide down his throbbing manhood. He thrusts hard, piercing me and filling me to the hilt. I grind down, and he goes up. I lean down and kiss his neck. He groans so loudly it fills the room. I bite his earlobe, and he shudders. Goosebumps spread over his body, and I bite the taut skin on his collarbone. We fuck so hard, the headboard slams against the wall, but neither one of us cares. I can't get enough of him, and when he reaches over and takes one of my stiff nipples into his hot mouth, I throw my head back and call his name again. He sucks and pulls my nipple before turning his attention to the next one. The entire time, he never lets go of my hips. With this position, you'd think I'd be the one in control, but that couldn't be further from the truth. He's controlling all of my moves, how deep he goes, and how much pleasure he gives me. He owns my body, and for the moment, I let him have all of me. He holds me tight as I grind and ride him until the feeling of euphoria overtakes me, and I come loudly on his cock. He's not far behind. He grunts and pumps a few more times before he slams his eyes shut and moans my name. I collapse on top of him. He's still in a sitting position, and I lay my head on the side of his sweaty neck. I roll off and lie naked on top of the bedspread. He comes close to me and pulls me to his side. I wrap a leg around him, and I know my dripping pussy is leaking on his skin, but neither one of us cares. He reaches over and tweaks one of my nipples, and I bite my lip at the sensation. You're so beautiful. I blush. It's been years since I've had a boyfriend, and even then, I don't remember anyone ever calling me beautiful before. You don't have to say those things. We're already married. Well, I think maybe you need to hear it. I try to pull away, but he holds me to him. As much as I love his body and how strong he is, I hate how he can easily subdue me. There aren't many people who can. Don't, I warn. Don't what? Don't feel bad or sorry for me about my relationship with my mother. I learned a long time ago to accept it for what it is. His fingertips glide along my nipples again, calming me. I wait for him to lie and say he doesn't feel bad or sorry. Underneath the anger I felt radiating from him, I saw the look in his eyes. It's the same one Alex gives me whenever she's around me and my mother. But neither Alex nor Adam would ever understand. Adam's mother adores him, and I know Alex's mother did too before she passed away. Has it been like that all your life? He asks. Pretty much, at least as long as I can remember, but things really went south with us on the day of my high school graduation. Jason had graduated college that year, and I overheard her talking to my aunt. In a nutshell, she was proud of Jason for graduating top of his class and getting into medical school, whereas I barely made it out of high school. At least that's what she said, but that wasn't true. I just didn't get into any of the colleges she was hoping for. She told my aunt that at least she had one kid she could be proud of. I don't see pity in his eyes, but they become angry. A muscle in his jaw ticks, but he pulls me closer, and I lay my head on his chest. The sound of his heart calms me, and I tell Adam everything I overheard that morning. I've never told anyone that before. I whisper afterwards. Not Jason, not my dad, not anyone. How do you tell anyone that you heard your mother say she regrets having you? I always thought it would hurt too much to speak those words. But telling you is freeing, Adam. I'm glad you're telling me, love, he whispers. So 
I take a deep breath and tell him more. Our relationship never recovered. I went to college, but it took me five years to finish. I hardly went home. I would stay with my aunt. The part I regret the most is that I took my hurt and anger out on Jason. I picked a fight with him that day and told him I hated him. I can still see the hurt in his eyes. He's been nothing but good to me, always, even when I was horrible to him. My eyes fill with tears at the thought of wasting all those years being angry towards him. He's a smart guy, sort of. I playfully punch him, and he laughs. Even if he doesn't know the specifics, I'm sure he knows your mother played a part in everything that happened. He couldn't have been too mad because he asked you to come live with him. That was only after I was in trouble again. I lost my job and found myself in some legal trouble. Jason hired a lawyer who got the charges dismissed. My mother pounced when that happened. It's like it proved her point about me always being a screw-up and a troublemaker. She brought it up her first night here. He kisses my forehead and says, We all do dumb things when we're young, Mel. We do dumb things when we're older, too. We're all human. What's important is that we learn from them. I've made my share of mistakes, he says. Tell me one of them. I lay a hand on his flat belly. He lifts it and intertwines our fingers. He kisses the back of my hand and rests our joined hands on his chest. I was an angry teenager. My father was never around. I have no memory of my parents together as a couple. I can count on two hands how many times I've seen him in my life. I didn't understand why I was so angry until I became an adult. Back then, I didn't know how to channel it, so I got into fights. I kicked a lot of ass. My mother didn't know what to do or how to handle me. I started skipping school and was on a very dark path. She knew I liked to fight, so she took me down to this gym and paid for boxing lessons. I loved it. She didn't intend for it to go as far as it did, but I was good. She begged me to stop when I got older, but I wouldn't. It became kind of a therapy for me. It wasn't until I broke my elbow and strained my rotator cuff that things changed. She cried and stayed at my bedside the entire time. I was told it was best for me not to pursue fighting as a career, and seeing how upset my mother was, I decided to give it up. But the anger came back. I was 19 by then, and I was out one night and someone started mouthing off. I tried to ignore it at first, but they said the wrong thing, and I beat them to a pulp. I got arrested. He pressed charges. I sit up in surprise at the story. The Adam I've always known annoyed me, but he would never hurt a fly. The way he is with Addison is proof of his gentle nature. In the years since he's lived here, I've noticed how much of a giver he is, He's the guy who cleans the yard in the fall, shovels snow in the winter, and never asks for anything back. I have a hard time picturing you hurting anybody, I tell him. I'm not proud of it, but I was a 19-year-old kid with daddy issues who didn't know he had issues. So what happened? My father sent a lawyer and made everything disappear, he says simply. What happened between him and your mother? I ask. I guess he wasn't relationship material. Like I said, I don't remember them ever being together. I think maybe a kid might have been too much for a selfish prick like him. My heart hurts for him at the admission. The most he could do was support me financially, but out of sight, out of mind, I guess. Well, not only was he an asshole, but he was stupid, too. He missed out on having an amazing son. He smiles shyly at me, and I run a hand through his hair. If he wasn't already dead, I'd find him and beat his ass. He rolls his eyes but pulls me closer. I'll have to teach you some of the basics before you try and kick anybody's ass. The few times you did see him, how was he? Was he happy to see you? He shrugs and says, 
I think he was excited to see my mom more than me. She'd agreed to let him visit because he would say he wanted to see me, but it was his way of seeing her. He took me out for ice cream once, I think. But what about your relationship with your dad? You don't leave when he visits. I look into his eyes, and he smiles at me. Whenever your mom would visit, you'd leave after a day. But that's not the case with your dad. He's okay. We've gotten better. He never made me feel bad when I was growing up, but he admitted that he could have done more as a father and that he could have told mom to fuck off. His words, I say to him. So me and my dad are good. Have you told him about us yet? I'm going to tell him tomorrow. He's not judgmental like my mom, so he'll be fine. 23. Adam. Mel talks some more about her dad and asks me more about mine, but I manage to change the subject before she can delve further about my father. He's not someone I ever talk about, and the people who are close to me know never to bring him up. I avoid thinking about him at all costs, but these daily phone calls keep him in my thoughts. Lately, every time I look in the mirror, I think of him and wish I inherited my looks from my mom's side. But I didn't. From my dark hair to the blue eyes to my height, there's no denying that I'm his son. The one he didn't want and hid. The one he never bothered to get to know. I shake my head and do my best to clear it of things I can't change. I decide to focus on my wife instead because our relationship is something I'm hoping to change. That bullshit I told her about giving our marriage a year was just that. Bullshit. There's no way I'm letting her go after a year. Not even after a thousand years. What do you think? She shoves the laptop in my face. It won't be too expensive. Just some food, drinks, and a few friends. That amount, she says, pointing her index finger at the bottom of the screen, is just an estimate, but I'm pretty sure I can keep it close. And I won't use the credit card. I can pay for this. From the emergency or secret savings? I do my best to hide my smile but fail. Neither, she huffs. I would never dip into my savings for a party, she says, aghast at the very thought. And you shouldn't either. Please tell me. I slam the laptop shut and put it on the nightstand, cutting off whatever she was going to say. I lay flat on my back and pull her on top of my hardening dick. You have the credit card. Use it. I mean it. I promise I'm not going to be in financial ruin if you buy stuff. She opens her mouth to argue with me, but I kiss her until she's breathless. Just kiss your husband, Mrs. Flynn. I kiss her again, and all thoughts about money must leave her mind because she kisses me back. I skipped my afternoon session at the gym and rushed home as soon as school let out. Tomorrow might be a late day. I need to finalize the spring sports and need to figure out what I'm going to coach, but all of that can wait because I promised Mel I'd come home to help with the new furniture. When I open the front door to the house, I can hear voices and movement upstairs. Just as I take the stairs, I hear laughter. Hers mixed with a male. I barge through the door, but I don't see my wife. What I do find is a tall black man standing in the middle of my living room. He's so engrossed in what he's looking at that he doesn't see me. I walk closer and follow his line of vision. I drop my bag on the floor with a loud thud, but he still hasn't noticed me. Mel has the fridge door open, and she's bending down. She's in black yoga pants and an orange sweatshirt, but the shirt rides up, revealing the smooth skin of her lower back. When she straightens, she comes back with two bottles of water and a smile on her face. That's when I hear a door down the hall open, and another man comes out. This one is short, with a belly the shape of a basketball. Here you go, Mel says, handing each of them a bottle of water. She sees me and smiles, but I don't smile back. I walk over and kiss her so deep, so indecent, I know she'll be blushing when I pull away. And I'm right. Color creeps up her neck and she swats my chest. What do you think? She waves around the apartment, and for the first time I notice the new furniture. You two all sat here? I lock eyes with the tall one, and he smirks at me. I leave Mel's side and step to him ready to beat him through the floor. 
You check out my wife's ass one more time and you and I will have problems. The kind of problem where you'll need a gurney to get out of here, I whisper, and he wisely steps back. All set, he says. Just sign right here and we'll get out of your hair. He hands Mel an iPad and she signs. I stare at them until they practically run out of the front door. Her top might be a sweatshirt, but it's a crop top. It shows off her tapered waist and her smooth skin. She has matching high-top sneakers, and when my eyes travel back up her body, her hair is in a high ponytail. She smiles and spins around the room. Her ass jiggles and my pants tighten. Does not look great? She hooks her arms through mine, and we walk to the couch. It's a large sectional, and the end has a seat that leans back like a lazy boy. It's gray, and when I run my hand over it, it's smooth. There's a tall plant in the corner. There are plants everywhere. Come on, she takes my hand and we walk to the kitchen. She opens a cabinet and pulls out a plate. They all match, even the mugs and glasses. The plate is white and is decorated with a green leaf in the middle. There's a vase of fresh flowers on the kitchen table. She grabs it and puts it to my nose and I inhale. Nice, but not as nice as when I have my face between your legs. I hold her elbow and sniff her neck. She shakes her head at me and takes my hand in hers. I got some artwork for the walls. I hope you like them. This rug looked nice online, but now I'm not so sure. I look at the walls and the floor. They both look fine to me. It's beautiful, Mel, I reassure her. She takes me to the bathroom next. The rugs are different, as is the shower curtain. The colors are definitely more feminine. No way I would buy a shower curtain with pink flowers, but whatever. It does give me a certain feeling of possessiveness to see her things all over my bathroom sink. Right in the middle is a wicker basket full of nothing but nail polish. Every color of the rainbow, all with strange names like mint candy apple, high maintenance, and moochie moochie. Whatever the fuck moochie moochie means. And I got new bedding for the bedroom. I follow her into our room and again, a bunch of girly shit, but I don't care. There's a vase of pink roses on the dresser, a floral comforter, and matching sheets and pillowcases. I can't wait to fuck you on that bed tonight, I whisper in her ear. She puts a hand on my chest and moans loudly. I grab her ass and squeeze. You're going to have to wait. I hope you don't mind, but I invited Alex and Jason for dinner, so I have to start cooking. Oh, and you see all the plants we have? Yeah, I say, smiling at the fact that she said we. Even the two in the windowless bathroom. I tease. Well, I have the opposite of a green thumb, but I love plants. So you're responsible for keeping them alive. What? Me? Mel, I don't know anything about plants. You saw how I lived before you moved in. I leave the bedroom and she follows me. There are plants all along the hallway. There are three in the kitchen alone. They all have instructions. She plants both hands on my chest and says, Please... I sigh, roll my eyes, and nod. Yes, she exclaims and hugs me. I lean down and kiss her lips. Anything for you, even this damn rainforest we call a home. She wraps an arm around mine, and we walk back to the living room. What do you think about Lola? she asks. Who the hell is Lola? That's what I named your ugly chair. I was going to have her reupholstered, but decided not to since I promised not to touch it. And did you know that reupholstering costs almost as much as getting a new chair? Got this blanket instead. She leaves my side, runs to the coat closet, and comes back holding something pink. I groan when I see it. She runs a piece across my cheek, and I admit it's soft. She drapes it over my chair and gestures to it. First off, that chair is a man's chair. It should have a manly name like Gus or Chuck, not Lola. And you couldn't find a more masculine blanket. She smiles smugly at me and sits in my chair. Whoa, no one sits on Lola but me. I grab her feet and pull her off. She does her best to hold on to the chair, but I'm too strong. As soon as I have her on the floor, I jump over her and take my place in my favorite chair. I drape the blanket over me and sigh. I'll never admit it to her, but the blanket is comfortable and long enough for my body. She stands, and I grab her hand and pull her into my lap. Everything is beautiful, Mel. Everything but this girly blanket. 
She surprises me when she kisses my cheek. The blanket stays, Flynn. Okay, Flynn, I say back to her. All too soon, she jumps off my lap. I have to make dinner. Do you want a snack? She starts to walk away, but I grab her wrist. You'd bring me a snack? Sure, why wouldn't I? Relax a little until dinner since you wake up so early. I drop her wrist and she leaves. She comes back a few minutes later with a tray. There's Greek yogurt, fruit, and a few slices of salami and cheese. She gives it to me, hands me the remote, and leaves. I inhale it in under two minutes and wish she had brought more. I lean back on Lola, spread my blanket over my body, and relax to the sounds of my wife cooking in our kitchen. I look around the place again, amazed at how a fresh coat of paint, new furniture, and a few plants can give the apartment new life. Mel, I invited a few colleagues over on Saturday, I yell. Sounds great. I talked to my dad and he's coming, she says back. I grab the remote and put on ESPN. The only thing missing is a dog, but maybe that's something we can talk about later. I close my eyes for a few minutes. It's two hours later when she wakes me up from my slumber. She takes my empty snack tray and orders me to shower before our guests come over. Twenty minutes later, I'm freshly showered and dressed. Mel changed into blue jeans and a light blue sweater. Just as I reach for plates to set the table, there's a knock on the door. I fling the door open and Addie runs straight to Mel. Jason and Alex follow behind her, and before I can close the door, her mother walks in. There are awkward glances exchanged between Jason and Mel. He approaches her in the kitchen, and they have a quiet conversation. Alex follows them, giving me a fake smile along the way. I didn't ask Mel if she invited her mother to dinner. I just assumed she didn't. The place looks nice, Diane says to me. A big improvement since I was here the last time, but I guess it was a bachelor pad before you and Melanie got married. I stare at her, unsure of how to respond. For once, there's nothing snarky in what she said, and when I look deeper into her eyes, I can sense her nervousness. Yeah, she worked her magic. I don't smile at her because that would be a betrayal to Mel, but I can't find it in me to kick her out either. At least not yet. Mel looks at me and I wait for her to give me the sign to show her mother the door, but Addie comes and wraps her arms around one of my legs, and I pick her up. Adam? Mel says. Why don't you show Alex and Jason the place? She doesn't mention her mother, but when I tell Alex and Jason to follow me, Diane does too. I put Addison on my shoulder and give them the quick tour of the apartment. Lots of plants in here, Alex says, which I'm responsible for, I was told. 24. Melly. My mood is too upbeat to deal with my mother crashing our impromptu dinner party. She was supposed to stay downstairs and watch Addison while the four of us have dinner. I never expected her to show up, and, judging from the strained look on Alex's face, she either didn't know or couldn't talk her out of it. But it doesn't matter. Today's been a great day. I interviewed three strong candidates for the position at work, and the apartment turned out better than I could have hoped for. I can't help the smile on my face while I pull a roast out of the oven— when I lift the lid off my Dutch oven, a cloud of smoke hits me in the face, and the delicious aroma of the roast makes my stomach grumble. Luckily, it doesn't come apart when I put it on a new serving platter. As I reach the cabinets to grab the dishes, I feel someone walking behind me. I grab four plates, but when I notice my mother standing there, the smile slips from my face. Not wanting a fight or a confrontation, I walk away and place the dishes on the new placemats. Can I do anything to help? Her voice is tentative and doesn't hold the usual tinge of judgment or disappointment. I got it, but thanks. I walk around her and get glasses. Since Alex can't drink, I don't bother with the new wine glasses. Adam's not much of a drinker, and I know Jason's on call tonight. It smells good. This time she offers a smile, which I don't return. Were you expecting Pop-Tarts? I immediately regret my words. I shake my head and say, Whatever this is, Mother, I don't have the time for it right now. I've had a really good day, and I don't need you to trample on my self-esteem tonight, okay? 
I thought you were going to watch the baby. She takes a step closer and reaches for my hand, but I flinch as if she burned me. She sighs sadly at my rejection, and for a split second, I feel bad, but I shove that feeling down. It was never my intention to. She doesn't get a chance to finish her statement. Everyone returns to the kitchen. Alex is laughing at something Adam said, and Jason is shaking his head. You ready to go downstairs with Grandma Addie? Jason takes Addie from Adam's shoulders and tosses her in the air. Her giggles fill the room, and I can't help but laugh, too. Adam walks over, throws an arm across my shoulder, and kisses my cheek. What can I do to help? And that smells great, love, he whispers in my ear. I stay, Addie yells. She wraps her arms around Jason, and I know there's no way he can send her away. I don't want him to. Everyone stays, I concede. Sit down, I tell my guests. Adam and I will bring the food. I grab two extra placemats and plates. We rinse the dishes side by side. It's a total team effort. I rinse and he puts them in the dishwasher. Every so often, he'll lean over and kiss my temple for no reason at all. He did that all throughout dinner, too. And each time I'd catch Alex's eye and she'd smile at me. Dinner was great because I did not allow my mother to ruin it. For the most part, she stayed quiet and helped with Addie. Alex and Jason did most of the talking. I went on with the meal as if she wasn't there. In fact, I avoided looking at her and focused on the people I invited. Dinner was good, right? I finally say. Adam bumps his shoulder with mine. It was great. You throw a mean dinner party, Mrs. Flynn. We'll have to invite your mom and uncle for dinner one day, maybe in a couple of weeks, since they'll be here for the party this weekend. My mom would love that. You think Uncle Flynn will wear his hearing aid? Not a chance in hell. We both laugh, and once the dishes are done, I wipe down the counter and start the dishwasher. Adam goes to the bedroom, and I take a quick shower. By the time I return, he's under the covers. Just like the previous nights, I can tell he's naked. I pull the sash of my robe and slide underneath the sheets. Adam pulls me close. His hand goes up my T-shirt, and he cups my bare pussy. Twenty-five. Melly. Adam's mom shows up half an hour early for our nail appointment. Her jaw nearly falls to the ground when she walks in and sees how the place has transformed. It's only been a few days, but I love our little apartment more each second. Adam's taking his plant duties seriously. He even rearranged some to ensure they are getting the correct amount of light needed. He went so far as to order fertilizer sticks online. I'm so glad my son has you, Molly says to me. She pushes a piece of hair behind my ear and pinches my cheek. A giggle escapes at the unexpected gesture. She's very touchy, which I'm not used to from a mother figure. She must have hugged us at least three times already. You finally live in a grown-up place, and all you had to do was get married. She playfully slaps Adam upside the head, and he pretends to be hurt. So, there's nothing you need to do while we're gone, I tell my husband. I picked up the alcohol yesterday, and the food won't be delivered until four. I reach up, and he leans down to kiss my lips. Yes, dear. I'll go get a workout in while you two are gone. He helps me with my coat and opens the door for me and his mother. We walk down the stairs, and when we get to Jason's door, it opens, and my mother steps out. Melanie. She pretends to be surprised to see me. I imagine she's been standing behind the door waiting for us to come down. I'm kicking myself for not going out the back. Mother? She stares at us. My mother raises both eyebrows when she notices Molly's arm hooked through mine. She crosses her arms and waits. This is my mother-in-law, Molly Flynn. Malls, I say, using the nickname I've given her. This is my mother. Diane Dupree. Molly hugs my mother. Mom doesn't pull away, but she remains stiff. Oh, I see the resemblance, Molly says. I'm looking forward to the party tonight and meeting some of Mel's family. 
And I can't wait for all of us to go wedding dress shopping. My mother clears her throat and nods. She looks at me, probably waiting for an invitation to the bridal boutique, but I don't offer one. I know she's heard about the housewarming, but I didn't invite her to that either. There's a part of me that feels a twinge of guilt, but there's the part who's worked so hard on not focusing on the damage my mother's done to me, the part that wants me to be at peace. And where are you two headed now? My mother's eyes never leave our joined arms. Just some girl time. I finally have a daughter. Molly puts her head on my shoulder. Manny's and Petty's, you should join us. I visibly cringe at the sudden invitation. My mother looks at me, and I can tell she's holding her breath. She's probably waiting for me to invite her, but I can't think of a single time where we did anything like that together, not even when I was a preteen. The sad thing is, I don't remember ever wanting to do this with her, and that includes today. Maybe another time, I say quickly. You're not dressed, and we don't want to be late. I still have a lot to do to get ready for the party. My mother casts her eyes down, but she looks back up, puts a smile on her face, and says, Of course. I'll see you upstairs later. She looks me directly in the eyes then, almost daring me to tell her she's not invited. The apartment will be full of people. I don't give a hoot if she's there or not. So I nod and pull Molly towards the door. The ride to the salon isn't a long one, and I sink into the leather seats of Molly's Nissan Rogue while she chats. Her voice is cheery, and I find myself liking her Irish brogue. The salon is practically empty, which is not unexpected on a very cold January day. We're served quickly, and both of us decide on French manicures and pedicures. When we're done, we pick up lunch from my favorite Greek place and take it home. Thankfully, my mother is not waiting for us when we get back. While I grab plates, Molly walks around again. She smiles when she runs a hand over the blanket draped across Lola. While we eat, she tells me stories about young Adam and the years they spent in Ireland. My mother was sick, but he went back to help take care of her, she says. Were you too close? She wipes her mouth and tosses the napkin on the table. Hardly, darling. I could barely wait to get away from her. As soon as I could, I put an entire ocean between us. She was controlling with a mean streak. She wanted me to be a nun. She rolls her eyes at that declaration, and I laugh at the irritated look on her face. A nun? Wow. Yes, and I'm her youngest child, and none of my sisters wanted it, so I was her last chance. She was sorely disappointed, but I had my own life to live. Then I had a baby out of wedlock, and she was not happy about that. At least until I took Adam to meet her when he was about one. It's funny how grandparents can treat their grandkids so much better than they did their own children. She fell in love with Adam the second she saw him. She doted on him, and he worshipped her. She was completely different with him than she was with me. I reach over and put a hand on top of hers. I was so in love with Adam's father but he didn't feel the same toward me. I guess his feelings were more carnal, and once I realized that, I left. I wanted so much more in a relationship than he could ever have given me. Leaving him was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I did it. To his credit, he took care of Adam financially, but he was never interested in him. He stopped coming around when he realized he wouldn't be getting in my pants anymore. She opened her mouth to say something else, but she stops suddenly and gives her head a small shake. It's almost as if she wants to say more, but can't. You were young, Malls, and you aren't the first woman to love a man and not have those feelings returned. But the fact that you walked away shows how strong you are. You knew you deserved better, and he was a fool. Her eyes pool with tears, and she nods. It took me years to come to that realization. I felt an incredible amount of guilt about not giving Adam a traditional family. He's so full of love, and he deserves the best of everything. I tried to be a good mother to him, but I couldn't be his father, you know? He was such a good boy, so I was lucky. Other than that boxing nonsense where he got himself hurt, he's been a mother's dream. She smiles wistfully. 
you didn't seem surprised or upset that we got married suddenly. No. She waves a hand as if the very idea of being upset at Adam is ridiculous. I trust my son, and I saw the way he looked at you the two times I saw you. I always told myself that I would love the woman he ended up with. I didn't want to be anything like my mother, a judgmental shrew who found no joy in anything. I asked him about it. Remember that time you barged in and left? He winked at me and said, Just wait, Ma. I'm just so wonderful for a mill, and you're going to give me grandbabies. I blush at the thought. The notion that our marriage is temporary comes to mind, but I shove it away, refusing to think about that now. Not right away, Molly, I warn her, but that only makes her smile wider. As long as you're not telling me never, and I want us to have girly time. When I was pregnant with Adam, I prayed every night he would be a girl. I bought a pink dress. Don't tell him, but I put him in at once. I might have a picture somewhere. She winks at me, and we both burst into laughter while I think of my very masculine husband in a pink dress. We finish our food, and while I clear the table and wash the dishes, Molly reaches into her purse and pulls something out. When I'm wiping down the counter, she approaches. I didn't get a chance to do this when you and Adam were over at the house, but I want you to have this. She opens a square jewelry box and pulls out a gold chain with a cross. It's the same one Adam wears, and I've noticed that Molly has one too. I gave Adam his when he was going through his rebellious teenage phase. I told him it would protect him, and since you're my daughter now, I want you to have one. I fan my face to dry my sudden tears. Molly stands behind me and puts the chain around my neck. I'm not religious, I say, so choked I can barely speak. You don't have to be, darling. This isn't about religion. This is because you're my daughter now, and I want our Savior's protection around my kids. I walk away and look at the mirror hanging on the wall behind the living room. It was one of the things that was delivered with the furniture. I run my hand over it, and this time I can't stop the tears from falling. Thank you, Molly. This means so much to me. My words come out hoarse, and I clear my throat twice. She smiles and opens her arms. She's a slender woman, but she holds me tight. Adam walks in while we're in the middle of our hug. He smiles when he sees us, shrugs off his coat, and wraps us in his arms. You're sweaty and gross. He doesn't care, because he grabs my face and kisses me deeply right in front of his mother. When he finally ends the kiss, he doesn't move away or drop his hands. He peppers my lips with feather-soft kisses. Go shower, I say between kisses. You have to help me set up for the party. He finally steps away from me, but he kisses his mother's cheek before running to our bedroom. Why don't you stick around until the party, Molly? I can fix us some drinks. She smiles and walks to the coat closet. I'd love to, but I have to get Finn. He's not only deaf, but he's blind as a bat at night. 26. Melly. The talking is drowned by the loud whirring of the blender. Jason yells something, and a few ladies circle around him, holding their margarita glasses so he can pour. The blender and margarita glasses are another thing I got two days ago, courtesy of Amazon and their next-day delivery. I catch Adam's eye from across the room, and he winks at me. I wink back, and when I look up, Ananda is giving me a smug look. Lion ass. Even from across the room, I can read her lips. She leaves her husband's side, walks over to me, and fingers the small gold chain around my neck. My new jewelry is on full display tonight, since I decided to wear a red v-neck sweater to go with my short black denim skirt. My outfit is complete with black ankle boots. This is new, Ananda says. The shrewd look in her eyes tells me she knows exactly where the necklace came from. I decide to ignore her and sip my margarita, but she waves Alex over. Have you seen your sister-in-law's new jewelry, Alexandra? Ananda says. Ugh, you know I hate being called that. And yes, 
it's sparkling from across the room. Alex reaches over and runs a finger along the cross. I'm feeling pious just being near you, Melly. Whatever, I say, waving them off. Maybe I've had too many drinks, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but that looks just like the one Adam wears, and it would also appear that his mother has one, too. Mmm, I wonder what the connection could be. They both tap their temple with a finger before they look at each other and burst into laughter. Fine, his mother gave it to me. Are you bitches happy now? They laugh harder. Was it before or after you got matching Manny Patties? After, ho, I say to Ananda, throwing her favorite word back at her. I look around the room and spot my mother in a deep conversation with Molly, and I narrow my eyes. Alex, go get your mother-in-law. And why isn't she downstairs watching Addie? I didn't invite her. Addie has a sitter, and I think Jason tried to talk her out of it. My mother is smiling at whatever Molly is saying. I look away, suddenly not caring that she's here. Her issues with me have always stayed within the immediate family. Whatever, I'm going to enjoy my party. Just as the words leave my mouth, Adam comes over and takes my hand. Come meet some of my colleagues, love, he whispers in my ear right before he kisses my temple. Oh, Adam, Ananda gives me a sly look once she has Adam's attention. Melly told us you two are considering Paris for your honeymoon. Considering? Well, I thought you had your heart set on Paris, love. Well, you've already booked us a hotel. I do, I tell them quickly. Ananda doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. I turn to my friend and narrow my eyes at her. Sorry, love, Ananda says. I must have misunderstood. She cackles and twists her lips. Then she smirks as if she just proved a point. Alex's cheeks pinken and she sips her water. Adam pulls me away and introduces me to a couple of teachers at his school, along with the office administrator. We chat for a while, but then my father walks in holding hands with a tall and very beautiful woman. Jason and I both get our height from our father. In fact, Dad is about an inch taller than Jason, and his date's shoulders practically reach his. Her hair is short, but perfectly styled. She's holding on to his hand while she nervously looks around. It's my smelly Melly, Dad says as he approaches. Just like my brother, he's extremely loud. He drops his date's hand, pulls me away from Adam, and lifts me off my feet. Hey, Dad! By the time he spins me around and puts me down, I'm breathless. Look at you, looking so pretty. Where's my new son-in-law? He puts a hand over his eyes and makes a show of looking around the room. I grab Adam's hand, intertwine our fingers, and raise our joined hands in front of my dad. I even point at our wedding bands with my free hand. Dad, this is Adam Flynn, my husband. Adam, this is my dad, William Dupree. Get the hell out of here, my dad teases. He playfully punches my shoulder as he starts to sing Ebony and Ivory. I feel the color creep up my neck in embarrassment, but all Adam does is laugh at my dad's lame joke. Come here, son. Dad hugs him, and when he pulls away, he introduces us to his date. This is Jennifer. Jennifer, meet my daughter, Melanie. She's a boss lady at her job now. For the past two years, my dad makes it a point to tell me how proud he is of me in every conversation. I smile and shake Jennifer's hand. She has a deep dimple in each cheek, and her brown eyes look extremely kind. Jason and Alex approach and are introduced to her as well. We're only here until tomorrow afternoon, so I want to take all of you out to breakfast in the morning. I want to spend time with my granddaughter, too, he says. Then he lowers his voice and whispers, Your mother ain't invited, right before he lets out a loud laugh. In fact, I'm surprised she's up here, but I guess she needs to sink her talons in Jason every chance she gets. Dad, come on, Jason says. Sorry, I'm sure she's here to spread her goodness and light like always. He does an exaggerated eye roll. I want to spend some time with Adam and Alex. Make sure you two are treating them right.
He points at me and Jason and offers Alex his arm. I want you to get to know Jennifer, he whispers in my ear. Let's go get a drink, Jennifer, I tell her. I'd love to, and this is a beautiful apartment. I hook my arm through hers as Jason follows us to the kitchen. You should have seen it before I moved in. Jason makes us fresh margaritas while I chat with Jennifer. She's only 42, but has a 20-year-old daughter who goes to Boston University. She's a hairdresser by trade, but she owns three beauty salons in New Jersey. Your father tells me you're having a wedding? He's really excited about walking you down the aisle. No pressure, but I'd love to do your hair for your big day. If you already have someone else, I'd love it, I tell her before she can finish her thought. She lets out a relieved breath. I look past her shoulders and catch my mom looking at us. Let me show you some pictures of the last few weddings I did. I can do makeup, too. She pulls out her phone and starts to swipe. Twenty-seven. Adam. Adam! Uncle Finn yells while he walks across the room. What is this? A funeral? I thought you invited me here for a party. You need some music. Alex puts a hand to her chest at my uncle's loud voice, and my mother shakes her head from across the room. It's fine, Uncle Finn, I say. Wine? I can't mix wine with a whiskey I've been drinking. I'm Irish, Adam. I don't do wimpy drinks like wine. Melly giggles, and I wrap my arm tighter around her. Oh, and Adam, before I leave, I want you to help with that dating profile we talked about. I'm sick of being single. I can help you, Uncle Finn. Ananda volunteers. Kelp! What kelp? She's my sugar to that one, he says, jerking his thumb in her direction. She said she'll help. I yell loud enough so he can hear. I hope he takes her up on it, because I don't want to bother. Thank you, lovely. I'm going to take your offer. Adam, he says. Like always, he says my name louder than necessary. He's been putting me off for months. I think he likes having Uncle Finn at his beck and call. No more, Adam. I'm getting a lady friend, so you'll have to learn to share. He turns back to Ananda and asks, Do you dance? Because these hips don't lie. He starts to gyrate in the middle of the living room. She nods slowly. Eyes wide, almost as if she's afraid of what Uncle Finn is going to do next. He pulls out his phone and walks away. Ananda exhales, but seconds later, loud salsa music fills the room. Uncle Finn walks back, takes Ananda's hand, and leads her to the middle of the living room, and spins her around. I pray that Ananda can keep up with him. He's like a savant when it comes to dancing. Whoa! Mel's jaw almost hits the floor at the sight of Uncle Finn dancing around the apartment. Luckily for Ananda, she can keep up. Yeah. Uncle Finn dances away from Ananda, holding rhythm the entire time. He grabs Jennifer's hand and pulls her away from William. Two ladies at once! Uncle Finn yells, and everyone laughs. I wrap my arm around Mel and pull her back into my chest. How about you, love? You feel like dancing with your husband? I put my hands on her hips and move them to the beat of the music. She pushes her hips from side to side, and each time she moves, her ample ass hits my dick. If you're anything like Uncle Finn, I don't know if I can keep up. I lean down and kiss the top of her ear. She shudders and tries to pull away, but I nip her earlobe. I know for a fact you can keep up. The music changes and a song with a slower tempo comes in. I spin her around, pull her body flush with mine, and we move our hips to the sound of the music. Adam! 
Uncle Finn yells from two feet away. It's about the hundredth time he's yelled my name tonight. My friend here set up a dating profile for me. She says I'm a silver fox. Everyone laughs at my uncle and I shake my head. Just like Kevin Costner, Ananda practically yells in his ear. She's my sugar at that one, and Kevin Costner wishes. I ignore my uncle and look across the room. My mom is laughing with Mel while her mom looks on. I can't read her expression, but Jason walks over there, and a smile lights up her face. I turn away and put out more chips for our guests. They ate the tacos we got for dinner, and I ended up ordering pizza. So far, no one has left, and the simple housewarming has turned into a party. Melly seems happy, William says, walking up to me. I almost fell over when she called and told me she got married. Yeah, it was sudden, is all I can say. My wife is across the room talking to my mom and Jennifer, gesturing wildly with her hands. She's oblivious to the stares coming from Diane. How do you like your mother-in-law? William asks. I don't. Almost as if she knows she's the subject of our conversation, she walks over to us. Jason sees and follows quickly behind her. William, she says, her lips pursed. You look well. Maybe a little ridiculous chasing around that young woman. I'd appreciate it if you would not besmirch my name to Adam. I hold in my snort, as if she hasn't besmirched her own name. I'm sure you did that all by yourself, sweetheart. And you also look well. Nice hairdo. Too bad it doesn't hide your horns. By the way, how's the house? He pops a chip in his mouth, but that does nothing to hide his satisfied smile. It widens when Diane takes a defensive step back. I see you're as big of a jerk as ever. And I see that you're as miserable as ever. Can we not do this now? Jason asks. I lean against the table, cross my arms, and watch the dynamics of the family I married into. All your father has to do is behave, and we won't. All your mother has to do is leave. Why are you here anyway, Diane? I know you've always had your hooks deep in Jason, but Melly can't stand you on your best day. I eat a disgusting chip and wait for Diane's response. Jason runs a hand over his face and sighs loudly. You'll say anything to hurt me. I'd have to care about you to hurt you, Diane. Just leave Melly alone. She was already dealt a bad hand in the mother department. She's in a good place now, so don't come over here and shit all over it. I don't need you to tell me how to be a parent. When it comes to our daughter, you do. I don't think Adam will put up with your bullshit. Diane's head pops up at the mention of my name. She purses her lips and turns her attention back to William. Look at you, William. Father of the year. It must be great to swoop in and be a father now. Where the hell were you when I was raising our two children? I was there, working two jobs. Never said I was the father of the year. I made plenty of mistakes, so go ahead and judge me. I own my mistakes, Diane. Do you? The last comment from William seems to have left her speechless. She opens her mouth to speak, but nothing comes out. She closes her mouth, spins on her heels, and walks to the opposite side of the room. I wish she'd leave but being far away from me works too. William looks, winks, and says, You're welcome. Do you have to say all of that to her, Dad? Jason asks. She's had a rough time lately. That's just karma giving her a kick in her judgmental rear end. Enough about her. Come make me another one of those drinks. Come on, Adam. I think you and I will get along great. While Jason makes a fresh batch of frozen margaritas, I lean against the kitchen counter and stare at Mel. She's oblivious to my stare and points at something on Uncle Finn's phone. Then she looks up and our eyes lock. She blushes, but she blows me a kiss and looks away. The phone in my pocket vibrates and I say a silent curse before reluctantly pulling my eyes away from my wife in that short skirt. They've started reaching out again. He's been leaving texts this time. Unknown number. I'll be in Boston next month. I want to meet. The fucking audacity of these people. Me. No. Since everyone I care about is here, I shut off my phone and put it in my pocket. You okay? Mel asks, sliding beside me. You looked at your phone and frowned. Spam, is all I say. 
Junk texts. I unsubscribed. My voice sounds high to my own ears, but she seems to buy my lie. She nods and reaches around me for a slice of pizza. Our party's a hit, she says. Our first of many. It's many hours later when our last guests leave. It was fun to see the usually put-together Dr. Jason Dupree get drunk off the martinis Mel made. I had to help him down the stairs, and it made me happy to see his wife irritated with him. He couldn't even take off his shoes when I practically carried him into his bedroom. After making sure he was in bed, I left him to his angry spouse. Mel finishes wiping down the counter and I take the trash bags outside. When I return, it's back to our clean and pristine apartment. The place looks and smells great. Even though we didn't ask for gifts, our guests brought everything from kitchen gadgets to scented candles. So, love, I say, putting my hands on either side of her, boxing her in. I've been watching your luscious ass in this tiny skirt all night. I slide my hand down her back and cup her butt. Now that everyone's gone, I think it's time you pay up for all the teasing you did. Because I know her ears are sensitive, I put her earlobe between my teeth. She moans and arches her back into me. Tell me, Mel, how did I end up with the sexiest wife in the history of the world? Hmm? I drop her earlobe and lick the side of her neck. While she moans at the sensation, I reach underneath the short skirt and grab her panty-covered pussy with my large palm. This is mine. From now until eternity. Fuck walking away in a year. Fuck walking away at all. I rub her clit over her panties. She whines and grinds on my dick, and she throws her head back and puts a palm on my cheek. I know what she wants, but I'm not ready to give it to her yet. Adam, she says so softly I can barely hear. Adam what? I whisper in her ear. I drop my hand from her pussy and she moans in protest. But before she can get a word out, I spin her around to face me. Adam what, Mel? What do you want? She smiles coyly and puts a hand on my chest biting her bottom lip as soon as her hand makes contact. She spent so much time watching me exercise in the backyard, and her eyes have always been drawn to my chest. I noticed her watching me the very first day. You make me feel beautiful. She drops her gaze, but I grab her chin and force her eyes back on me. That's because you are. And wanted. No one's ever wanted me like this. That's because you were only meant for me, love. No one else can make you feel the way I do. Do you know why? Her brown eyes lock with mine and no words come out of her mouth. All she can do is shake her head. Because you don't belong to them. You belong to me. I run my hands down her sides, caressing her curves along the way. She grabs my hands and leads me to the living room. She points to Lola and when I sit, she dims the lights. Music is still playing from earlier, and Ed Sheeran's Shape of You comes on. I've always been self-conscious about everything, until you came along and started looking at me as if you could see my soul. I glide my hand along her bare leg, but she steps back and starts to sway to the music. I sit up straight, entranced as she swings her hips. Just like the woman in the video, she starts to box, and my dick stands at attention. I sit back, unable to blink or breathe as I watch the most beautiful sight. She turns and gives me a nice view of her ass. The ass I've been obsessed with since I first saw it. She bends at the waist and looks at me through her legs. She runs her tongue over her bottom lip and slowly stands up. While the song continues to play, she rolls down her silk panties and throws them at me. I catch them with one hand put them to my nose before I put them in my pocket. I have no plans on giving them back any time soon. The skirt comes off next, leaving her naked from the waist down. Her body is firm and shaped like an hourglass. My hands ache to touch her, but this is her show, and I'm her audience. She walks over, spreads her legs, showing her perfectly trimmed pussy. I see the tip of her pink little clit, and my tongue yearns for it. 
You put that pussy in my face. Things can only end one way, love, I say. When she pulls the sweater over her head and removes her bra, I can't take it anymore. I stand, remove my shirt and t-shirt, and like a predatory animal I approach and lift her off the ground. She wraps her legs around me, her hot, wet pussy coating my stomach. I look up into her eyes and for the first time, she doesn't look away. She looks as if she's trying to read my mind. Fingers slide in my hair. There's a soft sigh before warm lips touch mine. I don't know how, but I managed to get us into the bedroom without hitting a wall. I lay her on her back and feast on her body. First her lips, then I give her breasts my full attention. Her nipples are sensitive. I remember that from our night in my hotel room in Vegas. That's as far as I allowed things to get despite my hard dick and my unquenching need to have her. But I didn't want her to have any regrets the next morning. While I suck on a nipple, she reaches for my belt. Knowing exactly what she wants, my shoes and jeans come off, both thrown into some dark corner of the bedroom. I bend her legs and dive into her pussy. She tastes like warm honey, and I can't get enough. But I stop before she comes on my mouth. Adam, she complains. I slide on top of her body and slide my dick into her in one hard thrust. Fuck, Adam, she says. No fucking. Tonight's for loving. I give it to her slow, filling her body as much as her mind. Eyes on me. Her eyes fly open. She sighs when our eyes lock. My thrusts are slow, reaching the deepest parts of her body and soul. You're so beautiful. So damn beautiful. I kiss the side of her mouth. I thrust into her again and she comes apart underneath me, calling my name. Hearing my wife call out my name while she comes on my dick pushes me over the edge and I release inside of her. I stay inside until I soften and slip out. She cuddles to my side and I pull her closer, putting a hand on her stomach, wishing that our lovemaking could create a life. But I know she's on birth control, and no amount of wishing will grant me that gift. At least not yet. That was amazing, she whispers. You're amazing, I say, kissing her temple.